Good morning, everyone. My name is Edilberto Sanchez. I am the chair of the workshop program committee. And it's a great pleasure for me to give you a very warm welcome to this fourth edition of the Fusion High Performance Computing Workshop. I will host uh, the welcome session on behalf of the entire program committee. First, I would like to thank the other members of the program committee for shown here for the excellent job creating an exciting workshop program and for chairing the session. We want to thank all the institutions that collaborate in the organization of this event, which appear in the right of this slide. And of course, Many thanks to the local organizers for making this possible. They are taking care of all the details in the backstage to ensure that uh, everything goes smooth. Thank you very much. This event was initially promoted by the Spanish Supercomputing Network and conceived as a local event. The first edition took place in 2020 and due to the pandemic, was celebrated online. Also, initially conceived as a local event, the online format allowed for participants for, of all over the world to take part. It was recognized the importance of the topic of high-performance computing on fusion, and the interest of this event has increased over time, as you can see in the left panel. The number of uh, participants registered has increased uh, from year to year. I'm happy to welcome you to the to this fourth edition of the event. In this edition, we have around two, three hundred participants registered from forty-four countries around the world. It's a pleasure to welcome such a variety of participants. Thank you all for joining. Let me give you a glance of the event format. Over the two days of the workshop, we will have three types of contributions. We have five keynote talks, 10 invited talks, and 16 contributed talks. Keynote talks are 35 minutes long, invited talks are 25 minutes long, and contributed are 15 minutes. After all talks, we have uh, time for questions and answers. The full program can be found online at hpcfusion.bsc.es. The, <coughs> the talks are grouped into sessions with a common topic, uh, and uh, we have some breaks between session, uh, we have uh, first uh, a break at the, around 11 uh, of 20 minutes uh, in the morning. And we have then a longer break for lunch uh, around 12, uh, half past 12, or for one and a half hour long then. And uh, then we have another break around uh, 15, uh, of 20 minutes. Please note that we have some parallel sessions and that all contributed talks are in parallel sessions while the invited and the keynote talks are all plenary. During the parallel session, we will have two virtual rooms called main room and room two. And uh, you may need to switch room depending on the session you want to follow but uh, it will be quite easy. Short before starting the parallel session, a button uh, join a break, breakout room will appear in the bottom right of your Zoom window that allow you to switch room. If you want to switch room, press the button and a new window will appear. If you want to join the session room two, you have to push the join button. After joining the session, you can switch uh, to the other room whenever you want. 
when the parallel session is over, you will be automatically sent back to the main room. We ask everyone to keep your camera and microphone off during all the presentations, unless, unless you are the one person actually giving the presentation, of course. This is to keep the recording focused on just the active speaker. You can ask questions after talks using the microphone. If you raise your hand using the Zoom function, and you can also use the chat for questions or for connecting with other workshop participants. Session chair will select from raised hands to invite you to unmute uh, your phone, your microphone. If the question session finishes, you may use private messages in the chat to, to the speaker to continue the conversation without disturbing everyone during the next talk. You can try it now. Use the chat to introduce yourself to everyone. Tell us where you are connected from. Try private direct message to one of your friends. Try using reaction and raising your hand. The right hand function can be found inside the reaction menu. Your hand will stay raised until you click, you click again to lower your hand or until your organizing team lowers your hand your hand for you. Check your Zoom settings for whether to show chat preview. If you don't want to see the pop-up messages, you can disable them in the chat menu. Try it now and, and through the, the welcome session. At the end of the welcome session, make sure that your hand is lowered and you keep public chat messages focusing, focused on the ongoing presentation. The workshop will be recorded and the videos will be posted online afterwards. If you have any questions or comments during the event, you can send an email to hpcfusion at uh, bsc.es. As in previous edition of the event, last year, this year we, the early career presenters will have an expert review of their presentation. Two experts, will access the early career presentation and, feedback, and a feedback will be provided based on our rubric. On the right, I'm showing the example of the kind of information that will be accessed in the rubric. This way, we want to support the professional development of early career scientists. Should you have any questions, send an email to hpcfusion at bsc.es. Based on the results of the assessment of early career presentations, the three contributions with a higher score will be recognized as outstand outstanding presentations. The authors of the selected presentations will be awarded with a copy of the popular Dan Brown novel, uh, Origin, and a pair of fantastic uh, airbags. Uh, maybe you wonder why this book uh, it is just because the story of this novel takes place in part in Barcelona and features the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. The winners will be announced after the workshop. Finally, at the end of the event, we will vote for the most popular talk among invited and contributed talks. And the presenter or presenters of the most popular talks will be also recognized with a certificate of the sovereign committee. Everyone attending the meeting will be able to vote and the voting will be carried out using the full functionality of Zoom. The winner, the winner will be announced just after the voting during the closing session. With this, we come to the end of the welcome session Go ahead now and check that your Zoom hand is lower and that you are using the public chat to everyone only related to the speaker's presentation. Private chat messages are still okay. If you have any question for workshop organizers, send an email to hpcfusion at bsc.es. Thank you once again for joining. We will now move to the first session of the workshop and sharing this first session, 
I'm introducing the speakers will be my colleague, uh, Mervy Mancini from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Good morning, Mervy. Are you ready to take over? Good morning, Eddie. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. everyone. Uh, welcome to this workshop and to this inaugural session of the workshop. My name is Mary Mansinen, and I'm the Fusion Group Leader and ICREA Research Professor here at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And we have taken care of the local organization of the event, and I have participated in the program committee as well. And looking forward to all these exciting talks today and tomorrow. Um, it is my pleasure really to chair this uh, inaugural session, which is going to be very multidisciplinary. We will hear three talks, uh, uh, one keynote talk and two invited talks. And they cover high performance computing, of course, and uh, inertial confinement and fast ions in fusion research. As Eddie mentioned, after each talk, there is time for questions and answers. You can ask questions by raising your hand or using the chat. So um, let's start. Um, the first speaker um, is Jill Foreste uh, from EPFL Switzerland. Um, are you there, Jill? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so we are a little bit ahead of the schedule. So um, let's try to put your slides up first and then perhaps we start the uh, talk at 15 past exactly. So if, if you have patience until then, of I course. Think it would be great. Let's try your slides first. Yeah, I, I can see them perfectly on the full screen mode. So, um, yeah, I think my, my watch says 13 past now. So two more minutes, if you all agree. Yes, and I used the opportunity to re remind uh, the speakers of, uh, of the time allocated for your talks. So it will be Jill's um, 45 minutes, um, which includes 35 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes for the questions and answers. And there are two, two speakers with invited talks will have 25 minutes for the presentation and five minutes for questions and answers. Let's let's try to keep the time so that we can have a nice break before the next session. And I will try to give your well warning five minutes before before the end of the presentation time, so that you can plan a little bit better the rest of the speech. Okay, now it seems to be 9.15, so just when you are ready, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Gilles Foreste. I'm the, uh, uh, the director of the uh, uh, Advanced Computing Hub at, uh, uh, at EPFL. And uh, uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, 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 in this workshop today. Uh, so the topic of my talk will be uh, uh, how um, uh, Eurofusion uh, advanced computing hubs uh, leverage high performance computing to accelerate uh, research and engineering in, in nuclear fusion. I uh, will give um, 
uh, uh, first a global overview of uh, uh, of Eurofusion and the uh, and the, the, the HPC hubs uh, and how we actually uh, uh, work with the uh, um, uh, with the researchers inside the Eurofusion uh, consortium, and then uh, in a second uh, time. I will uh, uh, show you uh, uh, two examples of uh, of codes that we uh, we actually develop here. Um, okay, uh, so I suppose it's going to come uh, as a shock to uh, no one when I say that uh, uh, fusion reactors are extremely difficult to uh, to build, um, and uh, in order to help uh, building those reactors. Uh, fast and, uh, and reliable numerical simulations are uh, uh, essential uh, because they provide uh, tools uh, to help uh, design those reactors in a, in a much more uh, efficient way than uh, uh, empirical designs. Okay. However, um, those simulations are extremely demanding in terms of uh, uh, computational power because uh, they solve and they couple uh, very, very different uh, physical fields. Um, so almost all of them uh, are joined together. So electromagnetics, fluid dynamics, uh, walls. Um, so you have a list here. Um, and uh, so, well, this leads to, uh, 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 so this translates directly into uh, uh, what was called uh, 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 a, a few years ago, uh, HPC motifs or, or dwarfs or, or uh, patterns uh, into the same uh, code or coupling uh, a very complex uh, uh, code. Um, uh, while so each uh, component is fairly well uh, understood in, in general, but coupling coupling all of them together is is a very very hard problem. So if you look at the uh, so the motifs on the uh, the right of this uh, uh, this slide, um, you can see that a fusion is is ticking uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, standard HPC uh, 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 motifs, uh, which leads to uh, a very uh, a very so we need to have uh, uh, very powerful supercomputers in order to uh, uh, solve uh, fusion problems. Um, the, the the main issue with coupling uh, those codes is that uh, they so each phenomenon, physical phenomenon, as a, uh, in general, they have very different uh, time and uh, and space uh, uh, scale. So we need very large supercomputers to uh, solve them. So let's see how big we uh, we actually need. Uh, so this is the uh, the fusion timeline as it. It is uh, currently foreseen, and uh, this paves the way to uh, uh, commercial fusion. So we are in the phase of uh, uh, building. So we are in the pre-ITER phase right now. Uh, ITER is being built in the south of France, in Cadarache. And uh, uh, GT60, uh, uh, I think I read somewhere that it, it's rec very recently uh, uh, produced its very first plasma. So we are in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and we still have a long way to go before uh, we get them all. Uh, in order to understand the uh, uh, increase of the computational power that uh, uh, simulations will need to uh, 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 leverage in order to uh, uh, to be successful, I have inserted the uh, uh, simulations on the left. You have a, a TCV. TCV is the uh, Tokamak configuration variable that is operated here at, at EPFL. And this is a simulation that was performed uh, a few years ago on, on TCV, and it required uh, 100 uh, teraflops to, uh, to complete over several days. Now, if we, uh, um, uh, so if we uh, extrapolate uh, the increase of size uh, for GT60, uh, ITER, and DEMO, um, it, it is, so the, the, the amount of uh, computing power that is going to be needed to uh, simulate those reactors are ranging from uh, 10 petaflops to one exaflop uh, uh, for demo. So those are orders of magnitude. Uh, obviously, please don't cut me on that. They, just to give an idea of uh, the uh, computational resource uh, uh, that we need. So now let's uh, let's see if supercomputers are uh, uh, capable of devel delivering uh, such uh, an amount of uh, of uh, computational power. 
Um, so this is the uh, uh, this is the latest top 500 uh, 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 list. Actually, it's the top 10. So the 10 fastest supercomputers uh, in the world. Uh, this list was released, uh, I think, two weeks ago uh, during uh, uh, supercomputer. Uh, supercomputing, sorry. Um, and uh, so you can see the top 10 uh, supercomputers. Uh, so the, the, the 10 supercomputer can deliver around 100, uh, uh, 100 petaflops. And the fastest one, uh, which is the only uh, uh, exascale su uh, supercomputer for now, uh, Frontier can deliver 1.2 exaflops. So we are uh, uh, very much in line with uh, uh, the numbers that I, I got, at least in terms of uh, computational uh, power. Uh, the problem is that, well, the problem. Uh, so in, if, you, if we have a look at the uh, uh, architecture um, that, is, uh, that is used in order to uh, build those supercomputers, uh, GPUs are completely dominating uh, uh, the list. And nine out of 10 of the, uh, uh, of the top 10 uh, are using GPUs. Okay, So GPUs are driving uh, exascale. Whether you like it or not, it, it, it's, that's how it goes. There is one exception to the rule, uh, which is the uh, uh, Japanese supercomputer Fugaku that's using only CPU, so an ARM uh, uh, CPU. Uh, that's really, really impressive. So that's uh, uh, 400 uh, petaflops. That's really uh, impressive. And if you look into uh, even more details, uh, you, you will see that there's not one clear type of combination between CPU and GPUs that's dominating the, uh, uh, the top 10. Uh, there's a, a quite a lot of heterogeneity in the configuration. So for example, uh, the Aurora system that was uh, recently uh, installed in the US is using uh, Intel CPU and Intel GPU. Fugaku, as I mentioned, is using ARM. Lumi is using AMD uh, CPU and AMD GPU. And Leonardo in, uh, in Italy is using Intel and, uh, and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, okay, so there's a little bit of a jungle when it comes to uh, uh, choosing your uh, um, uh, your target, uh, and this complicates the uh, the resource allocation request since uh, they actually, when you submit a, a proposal, it takes a long time to get an answer, and it could be uh, it could be refused. So this means that you will have to probably change your target uh, in terms of uh, uh, hardware. Okay, so. Um, Supercomputers are up to date, or they can deliver the amount of, uh, uh, of power that we uh, uh, that we need uh, for simulating uh, um, uh, fusion reactors. Now let's see if um, a simulation. So the codes are ready. Um, before I I go into the details, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, Eurofusion and the, and the hubs. Um, so Eurofusion is a, is a consortium of a, a National Fusion Research Institute, uh, bringing together almost 5,000 researchers, uh, staff, and students uh, 20, in 28 member institutes, uh, three associate partners, and 162 affiliated uh, entities in Europe. It was founded in uh, 2014, and the headquarters are at IPP. And uh, Eurofusion is aiming at uh, delivering uh, fusion energy. Inside this uh, uh, consortium, there's uh, what's called uh, ETASC. Uh, ETASC uh, stands for uh, Eurofusion Theory and Advanced Simulations, a simulation coordination between uh, 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 14 uh, uh, TSVVs uh, uh, projects. So TSVV means uh, theory, simulation, validation, and verification. So that's research and uh, five uh, advanced computing hubs. Uh, in those hubs, so there are three types of hubs. There is uh, one uh, at VTT uh, that's doing uh, data management, uh, one in Poland uh, that is doing uh, code integration, and there are three high performance computing hubs, one in Barcelona at BSC, uh, one at IPP uh, uh, um, and, and one at TPFL. Uh, those 
HPC hubs are uh, an extension of uh, uh, what was called the, the high level support team uh, that was led by uh, Roman Aski from, uh, from IPP. Uh, and it's designed to uh, uh, develop efficient uh, and reliable tools and modernize and industrialize research codes. Uh, of course, in order to, uh, as I mentioned before, to gain insight uh, and prediction of uh, fu uh, fusion experiments like ITER, GT60, uh, and DEMO. Uh, so in particular, uh, so as I mentioned, TSVV is, uh, um, uh, is designed to uh, perform uh, research and channel science and engineering uh, into scientific codes. Um, and SEH are designed to modernize and industrialize uh, those research codes in order to uh, leverage uh, um, the supercomputers. Uh, TSVV and SEH develop uh, a rigorous approach of research uh, and a very high standard of quality for simulations uh, uh, using the uh, uh, what is called the uh, Eurofusion standard fu uh, uh, fusion simulation software and tools, and you have a list here of uh, of the requirements. Uh, so this brings those requirements are here to uh, bring those research codes and and to the to the highest uh, level of uh, uh, of quality, in order to be able to uh, uh, be used in, in a very very large community. So how does it work in uh, in practice? Uh, is the process is is fairly simple. Uh, so the TSVVs uh, send requests to the uh, scientific board uh, in order to get support from a specific uh, advanced computing hub uh, on a specific task with uh, uh, the um, amount of, of resources that is expected uh, in order to uh, uh, deliver the uh, uh, the results. Uh, the board collects all requests and send them to uh, the requested uh, uh, hub, uh, where each request is looked into, and uh, and we uh, uh, so the the hubs provide uh, uh, recommendations with respect to the amount of resource uh, that they can provide for each task. Um, one important thing: um, tasks uh, uh, can be transferred between uh, hubs. Uh, this is very, very important because um, so the hubs are completely oversubscribed. So we get, in general, uh, two times more uh, requests than we uh, can actually provide in terms of, uh, of uh, manpower. So it's, it's absolutely critical uh, to find synergies between the, the hubs. A good example, so for uh, um, a sparse linear algebra and uh, and and yeah so solvers, um, a lot of codes in uh, uh, in the TSVVs uh, use the the, uh, the so sparse linear uh, uh, solvers. So the experience that we get in in one code will be useful for all the codes that use this uh, this library. So we try to find synergies between the uh, between the hubs. Uh, okay, so when we have a grid with the TSVVs, uh, we uh, actually um, we start a very tight collaboration uh, uh, between the uh, the hubs and the TSVVs and the, and the researchers uh, in order to uh, perform the uh, requested uh, uh, tasks. Uh, so then the, this is a standard procedure in terms of optimization. So we look, uh, we take the code, and the first thing we do is that we. Uh, um, we do a performance assessment. We find the hotspots. We find where the uh, the code is performing uh, slow. Uh, then, uh, if the code is too big, and it's most of the time it, 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 uh, that's the case, uh, we um, uh, we try to uh, create a mini app or uh, something that will a, a much smaller code uh, that will. Um, uh, be used in order to uh, uh, do perform the optimization or the porting to GPUs or whatever. Um, it is a little extra work, but it really pays off uh, uh, in the long run because it really, really accelerates the, uh, the optimization process. Uh, when the optimization is done, we plug it back to the to the main code, 
And uh, when the, so the, uh, the researchers agree that uh, uh, everything is all right and, and the verification has been uh, uh, performed, uh, we, we move to the next uh, hotspot. That's it. Uh, an important point, uh, which I put at the, the bottom of the slide, in the hubs, we have uh, also a very tight collaboration with uh, vendors. It's very important too, uh, because the uh, uh, the vendors have knowledge about their uh, their hardware, obviously that we don't, and we will probably never have, and they are really uh, so. They first of all, they are really interested in uh, in helping us. Uh, we get a lot of very good support from uh, from the uh, the vendors. Uh, and they, uh, they really provide amazing tools in order to, uh, to be uh, successful. Okay, uh, now let me dive into the, uh, um, into the codes. Uh, so here you have a list of the, uh, the, the codes, the, the nine codes that we uh, uh, take care of uh, in, uh, the, um, in our uh, hub uh, at EPFL. Um, so uh, you have you have yeah nine codes. They are coming from very different um, uh, they're, they're very different research groups in uh, uh, in Europe. Um, so in general, uh, the type of code that we get is is a CPU only code uh, written in C, C plus plus, and Fortran. So that's no surprise. Uh, so mostly Fortran, mostly Fortran. Uh, and they, they use MPI or OpenMP uh, and or OpenMP. So it's a mix of, of, of both. And they are under active development uh, by physicists, mathematicians, etc. Uh, so the, the requests, uh, when we get a request, the, 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 it usually goes like this. Um, please don't modify the code too much or, or not at all, which is impossible, but uh, well, okay. So uh, the least modifications possible. Uh, obviously, get maximum performance uh, and and move to GPUs uh, uh, in general. And uh, as I mentioned before, in order to be able to uh, access a, a wide variety of supercomputers, uh, maximum portability. Okay, so. More specifically, how do we move to uh, uh, to GPUs in uh, in general? Uh, there are three main approaches. The first one is library encapsulation. So this is, by library, I mean uh, Petsy, Cocos, FFTW, Blast, Lapak, something that you really don't want to uh, record yourself because they are really amazing tools available from the, uh, from the vendors uh, in general. They are very easy to use, and uh, you get very good out of the box uh, uh, performance. But it doesn't; uh, it's it's not necessarily applicable to all the codes. Some codes can leverage those libraries; some don't. And uh, it, it's not completely out of the box performance. There needs to be some rewrite. So, for example. Uh, uh, coming with the uh, um, the data structure uh, that is requested for the uh, those libraries might mean that you need to uh, uh, rework your data structure, which means that you will do a, a, a lot of rewrites. The second possibility is to use uh, so low level uh, um, high performance uh, languages like uh, CUDA, ROCHEM, Cycle, and you will get the absolute best performance out of this. So investing in this will get you absolute best performance. The problem is that it's absolutely not portable. Uh, and uh, it's harder to maintain because if you want to be able to run on multiple targets, you will have multiple backends. Then there is uh, what we tend to do now in general is the uh, Pragma directives. Uh, so mainly open MP offload and, and open ACC. Uh, they are portable, really, uh, uh, so relatively, let's say, uh, uh, easy to use. Uh, and there's some re uh, code rewrites and possible uh, algorithmic modifications in order to, uh, to make them work. So now if we map uh, those three approaches to uh, the different codes that we have, um, uh, in our hub, uh, you will see that. So some, so first of all, 
majority of codes uh, prefer to use Pragma directives. But there's a mix, actually. Um, you, you can mix the, the three approaches in the, in the code. Uh, actually, GBS is, is using all three of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the approaches. I should have put a green uh, on the B, for example, uh, because we are moving the CUDA, uh, some, the, uh, some of the CUDA parts that we, uh, uh, that we use to, uh, uh, to open ACC and open MPO flows. So there's a really a mix of, uh, of all the approaches that, uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, okay. I will now um, give you two examples of, uh, of, uh, of what we are doing. The first one will be uh, about GBS, and the second one will be uh, about Ascot 5. OK, so GBS. Um, GBS is a code that is developed uh, uh, by Paolo Ricci, uh, Paolo Ricci's group at EPFL. Uh, it's used to uh, study plasma turbulence in, uh, in the tokamak boundary. Um, in terms of uh, uh, discretization, uh, it uses uh, a fourth order uh, scheme in both uh, time and space. And uh, HPC wise, uh, it's written in, uh, in Fortran IT uh, with MPI. And uh, so there is now CUDA uh, for NVIDIA GPU uh, in order to uh, uh, compute the, uh, the right hand side or the, uh, the plasma. And it has dependencies on MPI, HGA5, PETC, and, and CUDA. Uh, the main bottlenecks are uh, the, uh, the right-hand side uh, computation, which is performed through a stencil operation, and the Poisson Ampere uh, uh, solver, so sparse linear algebra. Um, OK. So on the right, you, so this is the, uh, the, the one of the first uh, uh, optimization uh, uh, procedure that we uh, uh, we used on uh, uh, on PETC. Uh, on the right, you have the performance of the code uh, that when we uh, first got it. So that's in blue actually. Um, so that's the scaling of uh, of GBS when we first uh, got our hands on it. So it was absolutely not scaling at all. Uh, mainly uh, because it was using uh, UMF pack in order to solve the uh, 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 the system, the sparse system. Uh, so the, a direct method uh, based on uh, multifrontal LV factorization, and it is not all used that this this doesn't scale very well. Um, it's it's a computation of the uh, of the inverse of the matrix. Uh, so then we, so the first step, the first thing that we did is that we removed the UMF pack and we inserted PESTI. And out of the box, we got uh, a 65 time uh, uh, increase in performance uh, when using uh, 32 nodes. So out of the box, 65 time when moving from UMF pack to, uh, uh, to PESTI. Um, second step was to uh, uh, insert the uh, uh, GPU implementation. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the, so the first step was to uh, um, uh, implement the right-hand side uh, uh, with CUDA. Uh, the main reason for that is that the, the, the target was the, uh, the system at, uh, at CSES. And uh, so it's using NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, and for the solver, we inserted PETC and, uh, uh, and uh, MGX. For GPUs, so compile with the GPU uh, target. Um, the outcome of this is that now, um, so I will show you performance, uh, uh, GPU performance that we have now. The outcome is that, so with all this uh, uh, optimization procedure, we currently have uh, half a billion core hours on multiple systems, uh, Lumi, uh, uh, well, multiple systems from uh, uh, EuroHPC. Um, and we have 5 million GPU hours allocations also, so at CSES and another, and Leonardo. Uh, uh, yes, on multiple tier zero HPC systems in, uh, in Europe. Uh, about the GPU implementation, so this is a comparison between uh, uh, Lumi C, so the CPU version, and uh, uh, Leonardo, uh, which has uh, uh, Skylake, uh, no, Ice Lake, uh, one socket of Ice Lake and four A100 uh, uh, per node. So it's a one to one node comparison. Uh, so you you see that, uh, you can see that uh, the code is between two or three times faster than Lumici. So it's one node, one node, two sockets of, uh, 
of uh, Lumici compared to one node, so four A100 uh, of Leonardo. The performance is okay. So it's ported to GPUs, it's working fine. We can leverage uh, Leonardo. The performance is not as big as uh, we could uh, expect. The main reason for that is that Petsy, so Petsy GPU doesn't have all the features implemented. Uh, so compared to the CPU version. So we are waiting for the, uh, the those features to be available on, on GPU so that we can use them to accelerate the, the convergence. Okay, so that was the first example. Uh, the second one is uh, ASCOT5. Uh, so I won't talk too much about this code uh, besides the fact that, so there will be a presentation uh, 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 very soon about uh, ASCOT5 and uh, yeah, they will, uh, so they are the developer, uh, the developers of the code. They will uh, uh, answer, uh, uh, so they will present the code much better than I do. What I can say is that is, is a very, very nice code. It's really impressive how the uh, the code was uh, was implemented. Very high quality. Uh, so it's use, so it's a C code. It's using it's using um, uh, OpenMP and uh, uh, MPI, and it's also it's also uh, highly vectorized uh, using SIMD. Uh, the the reason for that is originally it was developed for kernel or many core. So. In order to to be able to, uh, um, for those who know uh, KNL, in order to uh, be able to uh, uh, run on KNL, you need to have a very high quality code, very highly uh, optimized. So the KNL doesn't exist uh, uh, anymore, unfortunately. But uh, this, uh, this the implementation and the optimization uh, that they did for this uh, target really pays off, even now. So it's, it's really important to have a very high quality code. I'll show you why. Uh, so very good performance on, on CPU out of the box. Um, so you see the levels of parallelism. Uh, so it's a particle tracking code. And each uh, uh, particle uh, um, uh, is independent to, the, uh, uh, to, uh, to another. Uh, and, and the code is computing uh, time evolution of, of those particles. So you have the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the optimization process uh, at the bottom, how it's mapping to the hardware. Um, when we move to GPUs, um, so we kept the MPI, uh, uh, obviously, in order to be able to communicate between the nodes. But then we inserted uh, two levels of parallelism uh, using OpenMP offload. So that was the first step. Um, the markers, uh, so the particles of marker uh, Q is distributed over uh, OpenMP teams. And each marker then is distributed over MPI, uh, so OpenMP team threads. So the, the, uh, the threads. Uh, this, this is how it maps. Uh, so at the, uh, at the left, you have the, uh, um, uh, you have the, uh, the code. So a small representation of, of the main loop. And now it maps to the uh, OpenMP execution model. So the, we we put the uh, we put the team so the, all the particles in the teams and then uh, uh, the second and the uh, the third level. Uh, so OpenMP parallel for SIMD collapsed uh, is uh, is is uh, attached to um, the two last level of uh, of the execution model. Okay, in particular the SIMD one. Which is supposed to be mapping to the uh, to the warps uh, or the or the wavefronts. Um, in terms of performance, so that was the uh, the result of um, of this first uh, uh, implementation, and uh, this is a comparison of all the uh, so different uh, uh, platforms, uh, um, hardware and and compilers. Um, so what you can see is that. OpenMP is really a hit or miss. Either it gives reasonably good performance. So for example, on, on Marconi 100, uh, OpenMP offload is performing relatively well in the sense that the performance is similar to uh, a, a, a CPU node. Yes, you have five minutes. Thank you. I'm almost done. Um, so it maps to uh, the performance is is comparable to a CPU node. 
it's not great, but it's 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 acceptable. The problem is that if we use GCC 11 uh, on uh, an X86 uh, node with a V100, performance is really awful. We don't really know why there's such a disparity in performance with OpenMP offload. So the maturity of the, the, of the compilers is probably the problem. So what we decided to do is to insert the OpenACC uh, 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 pragmas uh, in the code, and we got uh, uh, we got much better performance on GCC. So the it's comparable to what we got with OpenMP offload on 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 Marconi 100. Okay. So the take-home message is that. OpenACC seems much more mature, but OpenMP offload is is actually working, so it can work. So the idea is sound behind uh, OpenMP offload. Uh, so uh, first uh, step uh, that we did was to uh, uh, move uh, to OpenACC or at least be able to either use OpenMP offload or OpenACC uh, depending on the target because. The problem of OpenACC is that it's very mature, but it's not supported by uh, uh, everybody. So for example, on Marconi 100, uh, with uh, Excel compilers, there was no support of OpenACC. And in order to do that, we uh, created uh, pragmas. So at the, at the right, you have the definition of, uh, of those pragmas. And they, they, uh, depending on the uh, the flag that you use for in GCC, so either minus uh, F OpenACC or minus F OpenMP, uh, the, those pragmas will create the right um, uh, uh, the right pragmas in order to leverage either OpenMP offload or OpenACC. It's, it's doable because OpenMP offload and OpenACC Open are very similar in terms of, uh, of keywords and um, it's very, very similar. Okay, and the second step, so when moving to OpenACC, we got good performance, but performance was comparable to CPU. Now the, the, uh, uh, the reason for uh, uh, why uh, GCC and uh, OpenMP offload is not really working uh, well, is probably because uh, the kernels that are uh, um, uh, that are created with OpenMP offload uh, are very very big because they, they the the full kernel that is used on the uh, for the CPU the, the 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 kernel is way too large to be able to run on on the GPU. So I had to look at the assembly code. Uh, for the GPU, and uh, each kernel was using one one thousand five hundred threads. Uh, register, sorry, per thread. That's too, way too much. Um, so we decided to uh, instead of parallelizing uh, over the uh, the particle, so each particle would go through a series of events until it dies or um, at the end of the simulation is uh, is reached. Uh, so each particle is independent, but all the, uh, the events are, uh, are not independent, they follow each other. So we decided to uh, change that and go uh, uh, to what is called event-based. So instead of uh, parallelizing over the particles, we parallelize over the events. So this allows us to um, uh, break the uh, this big kernel into smaller chunks, and, and they are those Smaller kernels are much more suited for uh, for GPUs. So there's a little bit of algorithmic uh, modification uh, in this process. The code is fairly uh, similar, but there's modification in the, the algorithm. Uh, so this is the uh, um, uh, the performance that we got uh, with this uh, uh, benchmark that was provided by uh, the Ascot Five uh, uh, team. Uh, the, it's a comparison between uh, JET, so our Ice Lake uh, um, cluster that we have at, uh, at EPFL. Um, so it has a, a platinum Ice Lake, uh, a really, really fast uh, uh, CPU. Uh, Leonardo, uh, with two, uh, so four eight one hundred per uh, per node. And uh, so very recently, we were given, granted access by NVIDIA uh, to the, uh, the, their new uh, Grace Hopper super chip. Uh, it's an engineering sample. Uh, and we got access to uh, 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 so, uh, an early access program. 
Uh, so all th those results are courtesy of, uh, of NVIDIA and, uh, and thank you very much NVIDIA for that. That was really interesting. Uh, and you can see that, uh, so comparing uh, on the left for 1 million markers, uh, um, so comparing Jed and Leonardo, uh, you can see that Leonardo, so one GPU, here I compare one GPU to one node, so one A100 to one node of Jed, and you can see that uh, one A100 is roughly three times faster than one node of Ice Lake on our machine. Now on the right, you have a 10 million marker uh, uh, benchmark. Uh, sorry, I didn't put the uh, scaling because the uh, um, actually the 10 million marker benchmark didn't fit on a one A100. But uh, so starting from two, there's a direct comparison. Also I had access to only four H100 uh, for this benchmark. Um, so you can see that um, uh, also performance is, is really excellent. Uh, and this is using uh, uh, OpenACC, I forgot to mention. Uh, performance is really excellent. Uh, one H100 is uh, six times uh, faster than uh, uh, than one node of, uh, of uh, Ice Lake. Okay, so this is as close as you get to performance portability because we used exactly the same code between the CPU, Leonardo, a100 and a great super chip with uh, ARM and, uh, and H100. Okay, uh, conclu in conclusion, um, so Eurofusion has created a framework to improve uh, high performance, uh, uh, high, high performance scientific software uh, and to uh, industrialize them so that they can leverage uh, um, uh, supercomputers. Uh, in order to help build the fusion reactor, so TSVV, as I mentioned, and it's a, it's it's a couple, TSVVs and and SAH, uh, and very important point in order to uh, make the fusion program uh, efficiently uh, efficient, it is very important that we find synergies between the uh, the code uh, and the expert in the different uh, uh, advanced computing hubs. Uh, there are three ways to port, uh, uh, so port codes to a GPU, so pick your favorite one. We do prefer to use uh, OpenMP offload and OpenACC because they are, we, we think it's a good balance between portability and, and use of, uh, 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 well, ease, ease of use. Um, and uh, so whatever your choice, there will be some rewrite and you will need to, to modify the code. That's it for me, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time for questions and answers, and we have some questions already in the chat. Um, please remember also that you can ask questions by raising your hand, and I try to try to manage here everything. Uh, let's, let's see whether there are any, any people who want to ask the question. Using microphone, not yet. So let's go to the first first question in the chat. Is it right to assume that the benchmark speed up also considered the also considered the various hardware configuration of the specific system? For example, pinning of the processes to specific numa domain domains, as well as connectivity between CPU sockets to GPUs. Um, yes, so we try to pin and 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 not do uh, 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 so in in terms of pinning, we try to uh, pin the uh, the codes uh, to the sockets that are attached to uh, to the GPU, so the corresponding GPU. So yes, we do um, we do try to uh, 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 to do that. Um, so various hardware and configuration of uh, uh, specific systems, yes. So those, so yes. I'm not sure I understood completely your question, but yeah, we do we do pinning and everything. Okay. And then the next question is, in ASCOT code, is there communication among nodes? How is it done? not to damage the performance of GPUs if the data is needed to continue execution in GPU kernels? Uh, 
I, I, I don't think there's a lot of communications between the, uh, uh, the nodes. Uh, so this is the, the uh, so for each, so each particle, so the computation for each particle is embarrassingly parallel, let's say. So no, sorry, it's perfectly parallel. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of, uh, besides synchronization and, and reduction at the end, I don't think there's a lot of, uh, of communications. You can ask this question to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the speaker uh, uh, in the next um, uh, presentation. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, next question is: Do you have any examples of GPU porting using standard language parallelism? For example, the new NVIDIA compilers or one API can automatically port to GPUs the do concurrent loops in modern Fortran. Do you yes. have any thoughts or experience on this? So we have little experience. So I'm assuming that you are referring to the fact that uh, those parallel loops are being inserted in the, in the ISO of the Fortran uh, uh, language. Uh, we are looking into this. Uh, uh, actually, I have no objective opinion about that because I haven't tested it myself. I, in general, I tend to be uh, cautious uh, when the uh, the standards of a, a language are being modified. Uh, because this has implications in memory layouts and how things are done in the background and you don't always have control uh, over that. And it's so it's even worse than the uh, directive based uh, uh, approach for that. We will look into this. If it works, we will use it definitely. But it's our priority right now is, is really uh, uh, OpenMP offload and, and OpenACC. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, now I don't see any other question in the chat, but I have some myself. Perhaps I missed something. You showed first a table where you had different supercomputers listed in terms of performance. And I saw there Leonardo and Lumi with the similar position. And perhaps I missed the, the comparison that you did with the GPS, GPS code uh, that showed that Lumi was performing Worse oh, yeah. than Leonardo, so perhaps the comparison wasn't completely fair. No, or... this is the uh, this is uh, so this version of Lumi is Lumi G, mm. so it's the GPU version, and we use Lumi C, which okay. is the CPU version. I don't think it's aggregated. I think this is the uh, uh, this is the Lumi G. Uh, yeah, it has uh, yeah AMD Instinct. So this is Lumi G, so the GPU version. We use Lumi C. The, uh, the the code is not completely ported to uh, uh, AMD GPU. Okay, yeah, that clarifies. Uh, we expected <laughs> so the Lumi performing very well, but we uh, well the comparison with the Lumi GPU perhaps is something that could be added in yes. the comparison. And then we have a little bit time as well. Are there any other questions? No, I don't see. No, so then I have, perhaps this is a too wide question for one minute answer, but uh, I'm just wondering um, myself, you, you discussed three approaches for this GPU porting. So very quickly, I mean, how do you decide in the end, using your experience, using the preference of the users or what do you do? Yeah, so we, that, that, yeah, so yes, exactly. We use everything we can to determine what is the best way to. Uh, so either the uh, the TSVVs have a very good idea of what they want to do, mm -hmm. and in general, uh, uh, so OpenMP offload is very popular because it's supported by everybody. Maybe not in a uh, maybe in a very different uh, uh, way in terms of maturity, but OpenMP offload is really uh, 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 very popular. Um, really depends on on what is expected so what what is expected yes in terms of uh, of global performance in the end okay thank that, you so much it. Gilles. um it thank was you really very much. interesting and let's move now to the next speaker it's my pleasure to 
uh, introduced Paul Gibbon from Focused Energy in Germany. So Paul, whenever you are ready, please try to share your uh, presentation. Okay, I just put it up. Can you hear me? Yes, we see the presentation and we can hear you very well. So okay, okay. very good. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'd like to first thank the um, organizers for this chance to present our approach to um, to fusion and some of the work we've been doing with um, <clears throat> uh, with supercomputers um, to to de-risk some of the very very tough scientific challenges that that we have. And by way of introduction, I'd first like to uh, mention this um, important event, which which took place uh, almost a year ago now, today, um, last last December, <clears throat> where ignition was achieved for the first time on the National Ignition Facility in in Livermore, and. Um, the way they defined it, um, I think this is the Department of Energy, uh, their definition, they um, decided this was the, the, the fusion energy produced um, was more than the laser energy put in. Okay, so this is um, so-called scientific break-even. Uh, so you're getting, you're getting more, you're getting a gain of, a gain of one, <clears throat> more yield uh, in energy than you put in from the lasers. Um, of course, this is um, a long way from uh, commercial uh, viability, but on the other hand, it, it it kind of demonstrated for the first time that this this was possible. It was possible to get fusion reactions going to such an extent that you were you're actually getting a net energy gain out. And so, <clears throat> so now basically, um, the the fusion has turned turned from or at least laser fusion has turned from an uh, uh, from a scientific problem into an engineering one. And, and the question is now <clears throat> not so much um, uh, how, how do we um, <clears throat> improve this, this um, you know, scientific result. Uh, in fact, I think uh, um, the, the last um, <clears throat> information that I have is that they've, they've repeated this feat uh, a further three times. So there's another uh, three shots or a total of four shots on, on NIF. Where they've got a gain greater than one, so that's that's basically the, you know, it's almost a routine <clears throat> event now, if you can if you can call it routine four times a year. But in any case, um, the question is really now how to how to get uh, move from that um, proof of principle stage to a more <clears throat> commercially viable proposition. Um, and in the in the case of inertial fusion energy, we will need um, at least. Uh, a gain of 100 to be um, comfortable here, and we have to do this at at 10 hertz. And there is a simple um, back of envelope um, <clears throat> calculation you can do to um, <clears throat> to show this. Um, this is really if you if you just draw this as a um, <clears throat> uh, depict this as a circular um, <clears throat> process. So you you're um, producing fusion energy convert it to thermal energy, produce electricity, you take a fraction of that electricity back to uh, run the lasers. And this is really the, the kind of Achilles heel in, in inertial fusion. The lasers are extremely inefficient. Um, I think the Livermore lasers is a few percent. So in terms of you know producing energy, they're, they're a long, long way off of that. The, the NIF was never designed to produce electricity. It was designed as a, as a proof of principle um, scientific <clears throat> goal. <laughs> Um, and yet the uh, laser technology has advanced quite a lot since then. So there is a good prospect that even with, say, we can get this laser efficiency up to about 10 percent, then, you know, with the gain of 100, um, we uh, if you just go through this, this circuit here, you get uh, sort of three quarters of a gigawatt um, at 10 hertz. <clears throat> so that's um, that's kind of the, the, the goal for the, you know, commercializing uh, laser fusion <clears throat> the question is um, how how do you do this well the first thing you need is a um, is a startup company and uh, this is what happened actually um, more than two years ago now this was uh, focus energy was created or founded um, just before that first um, NIF uh, breakthrough shot in August 2021. 
So a little bit of serendipity there because we've got obviously a lot of um, <clears throat> headwind. Um, <clears throat> oh, oh, we've got a lot of support from or uh, pu uh, free publicity through that event um, <clears throat> in order to uh, pursue our, our own aims. And so what's our concept? What's our idea for for, for turning this uh, um, this this laser fusion idea into into reality, well, what what we have <clears throat> proposed, in fact, this is not a new idea. This is something that um, one of our founders um, invented about twenty years ago. The so-called proton fast ignition uh, concept, and the idea here is to is to split the the um, the, the process, the implosion process uh, into two parts. So first, uh, you, you compress the fuel with a long pulse laser. And uh, to do that, you, you utilize something, so, uh, something which is like a, a, a rocket effect. So you heat, um, you heat a, an outer shell, which contains the, <clears throat> um, uh, the fuel in just inside it. Um, this shell ablates, ablates off. Uh, producing a kind of uh, reaction, uh, action and reaction effect, so a rocket effect, and this this um, produces the compression. Okay, uh, and then once the fuel is compressed, um, it's still cold, and so what you have to do is is heat it up. So you have to heat the the DT fuel um, to ignition temperature, and you do that with a second short pulse laser. So a high intensity short pulse laser is then fired into a protective cone uh, through a, this protective cone onto a a proton uh, bearing uh, shell uh, or foil. And, and this then accelerates uh, a proton beam into the fuel and, and he heats it and ignites it. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, <clears throat> and if you, if you uh, carry this through, you, you, um, you can do um, uh, the, the further calculations and, and design work and then you can come up with a sort of a uh, concept for uh, here. This is just to display how the how the laser, uh, the two sets of lasers would be arranged um, for this for this concept. You see the the long pulse lasers here on top. These are these are the compression beams, and then the short pulse would would come up from one uh, from one side here up from the bottom, um, and then be focused into this into this cone. So um, so this would not yet be a, a power plant, but this would be a sort of intermediate step. And the idea here would be to, uh, to de-risk or to, to um, demonstrate um, the you know, certain improvements in laser technology, which we know um, have already happened and just basically need to be scaled up um, <clears throat> to this, um, uh, to a fusion power plant uh, level. And then the whole thing operated at, at 10 hertz. So the idea of this um, intermediate step would be to de-risk um, or to, to, to try out a lot of the, the physics of compression and, the, and ignition um, in an integrated fashion. Right, so the, the, at the heart of the matter is the, is the target. And this is really the key to, um, uh, to really demonstrating the whole, <clears throat> the whole process or to, to um, getting the whole thing to work. And so this, this blue capsule here contains the uh, DT fuel, uh, basically in this this outer outer layer here. And remember, this is this will be compressed to a very very small spot, a few microns in, in diameter. Um, and so we have um, for that part, um, we have certain uh, compression requirements, and the, these lead to requirements on the on the lasers that we need. So we need. Um, roughly two megajoules of laser energy in total. This is the compression and the ignition part combined. <clears throat> and then essentially the um, at the compression, what we need is something like 300 grams per cubic centimeter. And uh, if you imagine this, remember water's one, one gram per centimeter cubed. Uh, this would be three times liquid density. Okay, this is uh, a common, <clears throat> common notation. And then um, uh, on the other side, once we've got this compression, we have to um, <clears throat> we have to ignite the fuel, and this sets requirements for the ignition laser. 
um, <clears throat> um, also the, 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 the proton beam, which is um, sent into the fuel. And <clears throat> here there's, there's a kind of handy um, mnemonic, this sort of 20, 20, 20 uh, rule, it says 20 kilojoules of proton energy, uh, 20 micron radius, and roughly or less than 20 picosecond uh, duration. And this, this basically sets the limits or sets the requirements for the, for the ignition laser. Okay, and so in order to get this to work, we basically ought to, to get it to work efficiently enough, we have to um, essentially maximize the uh, conversion efficiency from the ig ignition laser into the proton beam. That's quite tough. We need 10% here, um, at least, uh, preferably more if we can, but that's, that's a, a kind of a minimum. Um, <clears throat> and then we have, to, we have to focus this beam, and that's, that's also quite tough. And what I'm going to um, show you today is some work <clears throat> uh, which we've been doing um, in order to uh, test out some of these uh, concepts, uh, especially on the ignition side. So I'm going to basically st start, um, again, I'll, I'll show you these six phases. I'm going to show you some work done in, in stages three, four, five, and six. Okay, so this is roughly our, our um, uh, the, 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 what comprises our our project on on uh, within Euro Euro HPC. <clears throat> so um, I was I was uh, it was nice to see in the the previous talk from Gilles that um, yes fusion is a multi scale problem and I can confirm that as well for for the laser fusion side. So we have um, at least um, uh, you know, length scales, nanometers to millimeters, um, if you want, and, and time scales, femtoseconds to nanoscale. So we've got six decades at least in, in each in each of these length and time uh, domains. And so this is a, a, a an exascale problem. Um, and we use for that, we use a um, a large uh, software stack. We have a, a, a large number of codes, which are um, um, also available to us. Um, as a private company, um, in, the, in a sort of open open source sense or open R and D sense, we can we have access to the codes that we need, most of them, um, and we also have access to uh, resources, which is very important. And I'm delighted to say that we were uh, granted some um, access through the EuroHPC uh, industry track. Um, to carry out uh, some of this work. And uh, I, have, I very much hope we can continue this. Um, so we're about um, halfway through this project now. So um, some of what I'm going to show you is, is part of this work. Okay, so let me turn to the <clears throat> um, some of these uh, physics aspects. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, as I said, we have, um, uh, we have the, the compression Part um, which we are uh, studying with um, the code Flash. Flash is actually an astrophysics code originally, but it's it's very versatile and um, it it is particularly good at at um, dealing with um, material interfaces. And this is what we need in this case because we have this. Um, although we have a, a we have a kind of quasi symmetric um, compression, we also have this awkward. Um, uh, cone uh, inserted into the into the shell, which creates um, you know, a very uh, clear uh, material interface, and there's a lot of room here for for generating, uh, for example, Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities along this along this inter interface. And this is something that that uh, we need a that not many um, uh, radiation hydrodynamics codes can cope with, but Flash can do this because of its um, alg uh, special um, algorithm or set of algorithms which, which are available. Then <clears throat> on the other side, on the ignition side, um, we first have to um, uh, calculate this um, or compute this, this interaction here at the uh, proton bearing um, uh, foil layer. And so we do this by, um, with the help of a the epoch code. This is a particle and cell code, um, which can model both the um, the lasers, the uh, electromagnetic um, 
plasma interaction explicitly, and also the uh, the transfer of, of electrons to electron energy to proton beam energy are on the other side of this foil. So this is quite um, it, it's it's it, it is fairly versatile in <clears throat> it permits uh, quite quite flexible um, target design. This is this is why we we like it. Um, we, we not only have to calculate the, the efficiency, but also the proton beam focusing. And for this, we um, this has been demonstrated before. If you if you use a curved surface um, using this um, so-called uh, target normal sheath acceleration mechanism for the uh, proton beam, uh, um, which uh, the protons are, are emitted from a from the rear side of this uh, foil. They can be focused simply by um, bending the foil into a certain uh, geometry, and that, that's what we we exploit. Finally, uh, once we have the proton beam um, to kind of reach the, the the tip of this cone, we need to um, model its transport uh, into the compressed DT fuel, and then calculate the uh, ignition process. So that's basically the. Um, the four parts of, of, of our project. And as I mentioned, we're using two codes mainly for, for these for these pieces. Uh, first, the EPOC code, which is a particle and cell code. Um, very popular community code, very big community, uh, lots of support. And, um, and also the flash code, um, shall I say, also a very, very large community. <clears throat> and so, you know, it, it, these are well-established, well-established benchmarks. And so, we can be fairly confident that um, you know they're going to um, <clears throat> deliver valid uh, results. So uh, what we did first of all here is we tested these. Uh, we tested the scaling on as we uh, uh, were asked to on on the machines that we were going to use in the the actual um, uh, geometry that we are we are interested in. And so this. Uh, I think the uh, for, in the epoch case we tested both the the uh, sort of isolated hemispherical foil and also the cone geometry, and in the, the case of flash also this this um, um, <clears throat> integrated uh, uh, cone plus um, fuel capsule um, configuration. Okay, so some examples here. So first of all, with with flash, um, so we are uh, here. There's an example of this of this compression process, or close to the um, to the end of the um, the compression. And and what you see here is um, actually it goes through the <clears throat> the point of peak compression. Peak compression. I have to run back a little bit. It's around about here. Um, <clears throat> Okay, when it reaches about 200 grams per per cc, this is not quite optimal, but it's um, it illustrates the <clears throat> the process quite nicely. Yeah. Um, some remarks about um, the use of flash here. This is quite uh, this is technically quite complicated, and a lot of things have been um, solved here by um, by Alfonso, who's the the main uh, the kind of uh, PI of this part of the problem. Um, and so uh, there is, for example, it's necessary to do um, kind of manual grid remapping to remove uh, numerical rate instabilities um, caused by the laser ray tracing algorithm. Um, you have to fix the equation of state. Um, to get rid of negative pressures, uh, you have to do a lot of smoothing, and so on and so forth. So there are many technical issues, but um, he has uh, mastered uh, these sufficiently that that you can actually now do at least a, a sort of proof of principle integrated um, <clears throat> uh, compression. So um, on the ignition side, so this is the second part. We are using. Um, <clears throat> The uh, epoch code, as I mentioned, to model conversion efficiency. A lot of um, factors here. There's a large parameter space to cover, and um, 
we have started doing this with with surrogate models first of all, which we then um, confirm with um, <clears throat> uh, two dimensional uh, modeling. So one point I want to mention here is that this can make a huge difference, right? So even the uh, changing the material um, uh, of the proton bearing layer, uh, we can we can get um, say modest uh, improvements in conversion efficiency, which translate um, to uh, to large savings in the ignition uh, igniter laser and um, uh, energy requirements. Okay, and, and since the the main cost is uh, is the laser, this this results in large savings. Well, five minutes. Okay. So then um, we can continue this. Um, so I mentioned we have to focus the beam as well, and um, we have uh, been working hard on um, diagnostic probes to uh, to characterize the proton beam. And uh, this we hope to test, uh, do some field testing with in an actual experiment in at Colorado State University next spring. Um, then, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, we also have a protective cone, um, which it turns out makes a big difference. And uh, one of the differences um, here I want to stress is the uh, magnetic field which is generated inside this, this cone layer. This is work done by um, Javier Onrubiez, which has started some years ago. He pointed out that, yes, we have these large magnetic fields, uh, kilo Tesla fields, <clears throat> which for um, mildly relativistic protons um, uh, causes a, a divergence in this beam. This is, this is bad news. Um, the question here, because this is uh, really downscale, this is a sort of um, scale model, we, we actually need um, cone dimensions about 10 times this. So does this happen um, uh, for large, much larger scales? And um, the answer is yes and no. So <laughs> we get, <clears throat> we still get kilo Tesla fields, um, but um, as I, uh, show here, apart from the, the very rich interaction physics and the um, <clears throat> on the uh, laser uh, interaction side, we see um, here uh, also very strong return currents. Um, I've now clicked on the wrong part. So we also have a, a reversal of this magnetic field, which, which um, leads to a, a pinching rather than a a divergence. Ultimately, you will have a divergence here, but this is something kind of interesting. It's new. We need to understand it, and maybe we can even exploit it. So uh, coming back to full circle, what are the um, requirements? Well, once we, as I said, once we have this proton beam with uh, the right characteristics, we can go ahead and <clears throat> do an ignition calculation. And I mentioned that the um, divergence of this proton beam is, is an issue. And that's because it increases the ignition energy requirement. So a slight divergence would mean that the, the proton beam misses the core of the, the compressed fuel and um, results in a, an increased um, ignition threshold. So to Summarize, I can I can perhaps just skip this. Um, uh, we have, um, thanks to this uh, project that we were awarded, we have um, been able to um, study some open uh, physics questions of proton fast ignition. Um, we've already um, uh, started identifying um, <clears throat> uh, ways to increase or improve the uh, proton beam conversion efficiency and to uh, mitigate um, <clears throat> effects which um, which prevent us from focusing the beam down to a, a suitable radius, and and this allows us then to to really study um, <clears throat> the sensitivity of the ignition threshold to to the beam properties and ultimately the the laser and target uh, parameters. So um, I think in future we will certainly need to. Uh, continue this kind of work on, on large supercomputers. I think we're 
if we really scale this this up, um, especially in three D, we will need um, something like uh, something in the tune of uh, hundreds of millions of core hours. <clears throat> and very importantly, we will rely quite heavily on subscale or high repetition rate experimental um, experiments to uh, really validate these these models. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for this interesting talk. Um, now it's time for questions. Um, so you can use your raise, uh, raising hand button or then chat for these questions. And we have uh, already first question here in the chat, which is, can you give some hints about the ignition targets production process? Are they very expensive? Right. Well, that's yeah. That's a, that's a very good question because, um, of course, if you're going to shoot these at ten hertz, then you will need something like a million targets per day. <clears throat> so if you if you do, just do the math, that's that's kind of what comes out. And so, of course, that's one of the that's a that's a, a you know manufacturing issue. And indeed, we um, we at Focus Energy we have a, a large, uh, very very good uh, uh, large uh, target team. Which is working hard on this on this question, and we're working to to automate this this process to yeah to basically produce mass produce these uh, these types of target yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, now I don't see anything in the chat, so let's let's uh, have one question of my own. Um, so we heard in the first talk about this coordinated. Uh, e tasks of Eurofusion covering mainly the magnetic confinement fusion. So, can you comment on the how how is the modeling effort in inertial confinement fusion organized overall? You mentioned some project, but perhaps some more words. I mean, and what what could be needed more to push push um, push it further? in a rapid way. Yeah, that's that's a, a very good point. Um, of course, we are um, there, there is no formal program to to support inertial fusion in in Europe. Um, this uh, I mean, there are um, uh, there are initiatives um, going on just now to to kind of reboot this um, um, <clears throat> this activity. I mean, there was there was some uh, a program about ten years ago, the the so-called Hyper Project, um, which was uh, put on ice, um, and and this is now that there are now attempts to revive this. Um, th this would be on the experimental side. On the modeling side, um, basically we are utilizing um, codes that are already out there and which are being used for non-fusion applications, right? So so particle cell is is a very generic code. There are at least uh, five or six codes out there which we could. Um, happily, happily use. We we have chosen one particular one because it's it contains the physics at the moment. It contains the the most complete uh, physics that we need. Um, it's not the most performant code. Um, we know that there are others. There's you know Smiley, um, uh, Warpex, um, uh, perhaps half a dozen others which which are uh, perhaps better adapted for GPU or you know multiple uh, sort of memory hi hierarchies and and so on. Um, but yes, um, it would be, uh, of course, uh, good to have a, um, a a team at a supercomputing center which which would support us. Uh, this is this was actually my previous job, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of missing that a little bit um, in our case. But uh, yeah, I, I think in the future we can we can probably work to to, to correct this. Sounds exciting. Um, there's one question here in the chat. Is the ignition target opening radius optimal or adapted to the compressed fuel sphere target? Target. How did you tackle that diffraction oh. problem? Very specific question. I okay, I guess it, it, it. He refers to the the opening angle of the cone. So, which I I guess yeah. So I've so we choose a, a sort of generic um, thirty degree half angle, which is kind of what people have used before in in, in previous experiments. Uh, there are very few experiments, I have to say, which have been done in, with this this type of target. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, but yes, it's it's actually a question that's not not fully answered. Um, you could you could argue, oh, we we need a, a wider angle, or so the advantage of a of a of a, a small angle is that you um, or say the, the let's put it the other way, if you make the angle too big, then you um, the the symmetry gets worse, so that the you have less room for the compression lasers. You don't want to hit the the cone with the compression lasers, so the the um, compression symmetry is degraded, and you won't get um, to to high enough densities. And on the other hand, if you make it too small, then you don't have enough room for the ignition laser. So there's a little bit of a yeah a compromise there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, now we need to move to the next speaker. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Taina Kurkisuonio from Alta University and Antti Snicker from VTT, both uh, um, institutes in Finland, to give the next talk. So I understand, Taina, you will start. You are still muted. Uh, can you unmute? Muted. Yes. Now, no. can you can you hear me now? Yes. And okay. Then, very good. It's not in full full screen mode yet. Oh, it's not uh, for us. It shows as full screen. Let let us try to. Post that. Yeah. Now it is perfect. So okay. whenever you are ready, I know. Yes. So hello, everyone. I'm Taina Kurkisuonio from Aalto University. And together with uh, Antti Snicker, I will give this uh, presentation with the title, How to keep up with fast ions in the increasingly complex fusion devices. Uh, it was actually Mervi who asked us to give this presentation as a duo. And uh, it nicely reflects the current situation with the Ascot Group, uh, we have namely just carried out a generation shift so that I'm now the official grandmother of the Ascot Group and Auntie is in charge of uh, running the show. So as the official grandmother, uh, I will set the scene and then Auntie will hit you with the hard facts. What I will do, I will first define what the fast ions are in the fusion world. And then I try to very briefly go through how in analyzing fast ion behavior, we have had to move from pen and paper to uh, to even supercomputers and GPUs and maybe beyond. So fast ions, uh, we all know that the fusion plasma has to be very hot, uh, over 10 keVs, and so all the particles are in a sense fast. However, to keep it hot, we need to have particles with even higher energies so that they collisionally can transfer their excess energy to the fuel plasma to compensate for the inevitable losses. And it is these particles that are called fast ions. In today's devices, fast ions are generated externally, but once we get the fusion reactor, then the fusion reactions themselves will uh, provide these highly energetic ions and uh, the fusion plasma conditions will be self-sustained. Uh, today, the fast ions are generated either by uh, ion cyclotron resonance heating, which produces minority ions into MeV range, or by neutral beams, NBI. If we are happy with about 100 keV uh, particles, then we can accelerate positive ions. But if we want to go to, say, 1 MeV, which is the target for the beam injectors in ether, then we need to accelerate negative. Uh, ions. When we have uh, fusion reactions running, then we get the alphas, we get protons, tritons, and uh, three helium, all in MeV range from the fusion reactions. In today's devices, we already have these, even though the plasma is pure deuterium. The DD reactions can produce both three helium and tritons. And when these are present in the plasma, there are also a small number of DT reactions and fusions between deuterium and the three helium. Both of these latter reactions produce alpha particles. So these fast particles or fast ions are now then in a toroidal magnetic cage. Uh, as a first assumption, one assumed that uh, a toroidal de device, tokamak here, 
would be axisymmetric. The nice thing about that is that then the confinement is mathematically guaranteed. Nerter's theorem says that any symmetry is associated with a constant of motion. And with axisymmetry, this constant of motion is called the toroidal canonical momentum. And this toroidal canonical momentum ensures that the particle drift orbits that are illustrated in the toroidal plate of uh, Jet Tokamak, uh, they close upon themselves and do not wander off radially. So the only transport mechanism is provided by uh, Coulomb collisions. Uh, simulating fast ions in such an axisymmetric device is very easy and fast. The benefit, it, benefits include that the toroidal magnetic geometry can be expressed analytically. So there is no need for interpolations and there is no numerical divergence. Furthermore, one can use field aligned coordinates to follow the particles. This allow, allows very long time steps and so integrating into equations of motions is very fast. The first versions of ASCOT, we call them now 1.0 and 2.0, use this approach and this is perfectly okay for the zero zeroth order effects due to Coulomb collisions, such as does our particle stay inside the separatrix and how much power from the beams or ICRH heated ions is deposited in the plasma. But real tokamaks have different needs. The axisymmetry is broken. The, the very fundamental mechanism, the mechanisms breaking it is the number, finite number of uh, toroidal field coils that uh, create then a toroidal ripple. The picture on the left illustrates uh, two adjacent TF coils, and you can see that the toroidal field is not uniform between them. Therefore, a particle sees sort of a local magnetic bottle, and if you go particle, your ion is uh, very deeply trapped, having low parallel velocity, it will then very quickly drift out of the plasma due to the vertical gradient B drift. Uh, there are very few such particles, but even regular banana orbits illustrated on the right are no longer guaranteed to close in the polaroidal plane, and then they can start wandering even in the absence of collisions. However, we can mitigate this problem we can adopt so-called ferritic inserts. So these, uh, here is our, sorry, particle that is leaving the plasma. But if we uh, insert ferromagnetic steel blocks at the location of the coils, the ripple can be minimized as illustrating these uh, field lines in the picture. And then when you do this at each coils, the particle is free to move. But that is not all. I went too fast with the with my hand. But there are other unpleasant uh, things affecting the field strength. For instance, in ITER, there are test blanket modules, so-called TBMs, to test tritium breeding. And these are massive blocks of ferritic, containing ferritic steel, very close to the plasma at three different toroidal locations. And when you put them there, they will suck in some of the magnetic flux and bend the field lines. So there are quite a few things jeopardizing the axisymmetry. One that I don't have any nice picture is external coils, such as ELM control coils, that can even lead to stochastization of the edge magnetic field. So how does the total magnetic field look like in the end? Here is an example. This shows the toroidal field strength as a function of toroidal angle at the outer mid-plane separatrix in either 9 mega scenario. If we really have an axisymmetric device, the magnetic field strength should look like this. But when we include the fact that there are these 18 toroidal field coils, we get the toroidal ripple in excess of 1%. Inserting the ferritic inserts red significantly reduces the ripple, except at the location of NBI ports where they cannot be fully uh, applied. Then we include the TBMs, and you can see the three different toroidal locations with two TBMs producing, again, a local ripple of in excess of 1%. And then if we start applying the ELM control coils, you can say that one cannot really talk about axisymmetry. So what are the implications to our simulations? 
No analytical model can be used, but rather we need to tabulate the field and interpolate. This immediately means an enormous increase in memory and the final goodbye kiss to the field aligned flux coordinates. And we have to keep a keen eye not to have numerical divergence in the field or numerical drifts. Furthermore, all these fine structures in the field have to be seen and obeyed by the fast ions, and this leads to reducing the time step. These requirements for realistic fusion devices uh, led to the developing the next two versions of the ASCOT, the ASCOT 3 and ASCOT 4. But that is not enough. In the future, fusion devices, there will be a very large number of fast ions, for instance, in ether. The fast ions account for about one third of the total pressure. And we have to worry about the power loads of the first wall, beyond the plasma, that is. Both the peak power load evaluations and synthetic lost ion diagnostics, synthetic ones, yes, require a high fidelity first wall. Furthermore, since we want to have well-confined plasmas, very few fast ions escape, and therefore we need a very large particle ensemble to yield reasonable statistics at the wall. Therefore, it is clear that no cosmetic changes in, on the code is enough, but we have to adopt very sophisticated techniques. We have to start using vectorizations, paralyzations at different levels, adopt even GPUs, and this is why ASCOT 5 was born. Uh, last but not least, all these simulations I have discussed so far only include neoclassical physics, while real plasmas have much more character, turbulence, NTMs, TAs, you name it. And it is clear that including any additional physics always has a computational cost, either in CPU time or memory consumption, or what is more common, both. So now I give the podium to Ant. Thank you. So let's go to the more technical part of this presentation. I will shortly introduce the key aspects of the numerical model and then some, some typical runs that we do with ASCOT and then give a glimpse of what is the newest new in our development and also say a few words about the code development that we are very proud of. Uh, so ASCOT is a Monte Carlo orbit foreign code and as such it scales almost ideally and this is something that can be tested also in, in, in reality. So on the uh, top right, you will see the scalability test. And indeed, the code is almost ideally scaling. This is very good result for us. Uh, the code can be used for minority species like fast ions that we discuss in this presentation, but it could be also used for the impurity ions. The main aspect is that the uh, markers that we follow in the code cannot have interactions with themselves, so the self-interactions are not included. We have the Coulomb collisions, of course, and, and the, the, this really nice uh, parallelization is obtain, obtained using MPI and OpenMP. On the bottom right corner, you see three layers of parallelism that we apply in, in ASCOT 5. So the MPI takes care of the marker population. It splits to the uh, the marker population to different nodes and then within the node we use open mp and it, uh, the, that allows to sub uh, sample the marker population in, in threads and then indeed we use this vectorization using the simt structures this means that at the same time we are actually repeating not one but eight computations at the same time so if we take a typical example from Marconi, we take 10 nodes, and then in each node we have 48 cores, and in Marconi we have this vectorization for eight different uh, computations that can be simultaneously done. This means that we simulate roughly 4,000 markers at the same time. Uh, one uh, important aspect of the of the computation time is the Kaiji center approximation that we often adopt in, 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 in our modeling. So in the figure right, you see uh, three different particle orbits. The blue one is that the one that follows the full gyro motion. 
So it um, really integrates the Lorentz force instead of more simplified equations. The, the simplified equation solver you can see in, in, in the green one, this is the famous guiding center approximation that works almost always, but also can fail. And then we have the hybrid team that you can see uh, shown in, in red. So this is following the green line until you are very close to the wall. And then we switch to gyro motion. The difference between the gyro motion and the guiding center simulation depends on the case, but it's roughly 30 to 100 times in terms of CPU cost. So how expensive typical runs are? Taina explained that, uh, yes, in some cases we can approximate the tokamak plasmas uh, using axisymmetric uh, uh, fields, and those are quite cheap actually. So saying, uh, let's give an example, that you run 100,000 markers, then this would be roughly 30 core hours. And immediately when you switch to 3D field that we need to interpolate in now one additional dimension, this brings a additional cost of, of the order of, of factor of 10. So we already see that this going from 2D to 3D is a significant factor. Additional considerations, yes, indeed, if we add more physics, like, for example, alpha and eigenmodes, these are basically 1D splines that we are interpolating at each time step. So one, one uh, D spline interpolation is quite cheap, but if you increase the number of modes, then this can be even a factor of 10 or 50 in the CPU cost. We also have a Monte Carlo operator to accelerate uh, ions, uh, caused by the ion cyclotron resonance heating. And this can also be an additional cost. I saw a few words later on about that. So now going to typical runs, I saw three different cases. First, I saw how complex 3D geometries we can actually model and maybe convince that also the model reproduce at least, at least some aspects of reality. And then I discussed the IC operator a little bit more. And at the, the last, I, I will. So what, what is the intrinsic Monte Carlo statistics problem in our simulations? So the Wendestein 7X, this can be simulated with ASCOT. So on the left-hand side, you see the synthetic view. So this is a simulation of neutral beam ions in the Wendestein 7X, and you can see the estimated heat flux into the wall in megawatts per square meter. In the middle core, um, column, you see an infrared camera frame of the same plane, and this is now a measurement. And since we can build a synthetic infrared, infrared image in, in using the ASCOT machinery, on the right, you have something that you can compare to the middle column. So this is a synthetic infrared camera frame, and if you pay attention to the details, it actually turns out that pretty much all aspects of of, of, the, uh, of the actual experiment are seen also in the simulations. We can go even a little bit uh, more in depth. So during running these simulations, it was observed that the beam ions got lost uh, to a location here in the wall. You can see, see it here highlighted. This is a vacuum window uh, that is quite fragile. And Ascot predicted that there will be excessive beam ion power loads. And based on those simulations, the, the Venus 7X team decided to put a protective color uh, that you can see in this image now. And once the, once the actual experiments were run with the neutral beam injection, we actually could measure that these colors receive uh, power loads that are definitely uh, capable of destroying the window. So this is a nice example that uh, our predictive simulations can impact the design and can mitigate some issues. The details can you can see in the link below. And this simulation, yes, these simulations, you see the results here. We need to use up to one million, 
100 million markers to get the converged peak heat load. We include roughly 4 million triangles. They are ranging in size. This simulation was part of the Marconi commissioning. And unfortunately, I don't have the exact CPU hours, but we did some estimations. And one such simulation would be roughly 300,000 CPU hours. The RF OF code you can see here, the typical images. So what we do is that we heat both the NPI and the minor ions. And there is an operator, Monte Carlo operator, that gives energy based on the on the electric field of, of the of the wave. And we mainly um, uh, have these kind of trapped ions that will uh, get energy in the in the resonance layer. This can be simulated. And in the ASCOT simulation, we do two-stage simulation process. So we first run the steady state distribution function using this operator. And then once we have this steady state distribution function, we can sample markers from that to obtain a synthetic uh, past ion loss detector. Um, here in this picture, I saw how this um, method or two-stage method can improve the, the statistics. So on the left-hand side, you see the direct simulation where we obtain the steady state distribution function. This is a synthetic image of the fast ion losses. We hardly have some hits there. And in the center and on the right column, you see uh, identi identical pictures, but now sampling the markers from the distribution. And you can see that we have a lot more markers on the on the center and, and the right mo most column. In the right mo most column, we also include MSD. Um, the, here you see the actual synthetic images, and there are still some uh, discrepancies. The, the, the top row is the measured ones. And then we have two simulations, one for the hydrogen and one for the deuterium. So what you can immediately observe that the hydrogen seems to uh, be simulated higher in the in the energy or in gyro radius, and this we believe is a wrong assumption in the initial hydrogen population. But this is work in progress. Uh, in these simulations, we roughly used of the order fifty kilo CPU hours for heating simulations. But then, as I told you. Uh, the, using this marker sampling, we only needed to use 3,000 uh, CPU hours, so a factor of 10 or even more or less. And the fact is that in the sampling simulations, we can, opt we can actually define how many hits we want to have in the synthetic loss detector. Um, and we defined here that we have, want to have 3,000 hits, and this actually translates to running 40 million markers in the simulation. Curiosity here, the MHD cost factor is here 2.5. So when we included the MHD simulation in the simulation, they were a factor of 2.5 more expensive. Then the data field simulation. So uh, on, the, on the bottom right, you see a detector. It's a cylinder that will be st sticked in, in, the, in, the, in the wall of the, of the machine. So the, the, the whole wall is roughly 600 uh, cubic meters, uh, square meters. The field head itself is only 400 uh, square centimeters. And the pinhole where the particles actually hit go inside the measurement volume, this is only um, square centimeter. So doing dummy math, the likelihood to hit the pinhole is one out of 10 million. So we indeed have a problem. Here. So the solution that we have currently used is basically brute force. So running the maximum number of markers that we can. And this is um, quite uh, CPU uh, costly. So we need to select what scenarios we want to run. So the question is, can we do better? And yes, th those are synthetic images for either. Uh, yes, we can do better. So we have been developing this backwards Monte Carlo tool. So this allows us to turn the puzzle another way around. So instead of solving the forward Monte Carlo problem, we are solving the backward problem. Uh, namely, we want to calculate what is the probability that markers from any part of the phase space will hit the pinhole. 
and it's identical to this um, um, puzzle that you see on the top right where we say that we want to add up at z equals two and then we know the likelihood going forward in time and we want to calculate the likelihood backwards in time now uh, <clears throat> this can save the cpu time by a factor of 10 to 100 as shown in the, on the bottom right uh, corner these are examples so uh, we have selected an astex upgrade scenario and you can see that the our target in the in, in the wall where we have been running the forward Monte Carlo simulation and the backward Monte Carlo simulation. And it turns out that we can reproduce the results and use to save a lot of computing time. This is done now with 2D geometry uh, of the wall and 3D wall seems to be a bit of a nightmare, but we are working on that at the moment. You heard already about ASCOT GPU, so I just want to emphasize that ASCOT was originally developed for John Phi, and it allows us to utilize these different layers of, of parallelization. And as uh, as you saw already, we have some nice initial results on, on the scaling. So the next steps for this is basically the work trying to go towards um, production level runs. And I think we can do it quite soon. Sends us very quickly. So <clears throat> ASCOT has been brought to Git. We operate now with the open source license. Um, there's a lot of nice features about this. The code is a little bit more than the, just the standard physics packets. We are adopting automatic testing processes and, and provide tutorials and documentation. Just quick glimpse here. These tutorials are actually Jupyter Notebooks, as you can see here. So they are very easy to follow along. I mean, in principle, running those tutorials, you know very well how to run the code already. There's also quite a extensive documentation within the GitHub as well. Uh, uh, we are trying to build a user community. So there have been now two training camps. The last one was actually the previous week. Ask this a global project we have a lot of people from Europe, China, and 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 also now from Mexico participating in this. We have casual discussions using Slack and weekly meetings via Zoom. And this is an example how we build the user community from last week. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chat is getting busy, I see, with the questions. Um, let me try to see here the first one. It's quite a long, <laughs> long, long question. Um, so if if I understand correctly, the marker population is distributed among processes, and markers are always in the same process. If correct, is the domain, um, the vessel wall smash, distributed among domains or is it cloned? Is there communication among nodes? How do you address not to hurt the performance of GPU implementation due to the waiting time to get the data? Yeah, so in the ASCOT, uh, the memory is at the moment completely shared. So all the markers have the same input data, access to the same input data. And there's no cross communication between the different nodes. So it, it is really embarrassingly parallel code. The particles don't discuss with, with each other. And we are happy in the in the sense that we have enough memory that we can store all the input in the in the same memory. So it's it's a it, it's a little bit embarrassing to say that yeah, this is the situation, but we are we are really almost ideally scaling because of these factors. Thank you. Next question. Since ASCOT is a code which has been written, pre-written many times, and the experience that comes with that, um, let me ask how a hypothetical ASCOT 6 might look and how different it is from ASCOT first to five. <laughs> yeah, this is always a good question. The main motivation to uh, the rewrite the code it's a huge task of course the main motivation is that we build both physics and we also uh, then 
the hardware where we run these calls that also developed. So it's one of the two. So ASCOT 5 already has pretty much all the physics that we at the moment foresee in the in the planning phase. So there's there shouldn't be any re reason to rewrite ASCOT 5 because we have included more physics that was not part of the designing state of, of, of the code. However, ASCOT 5 was built for Geon Fice, and it's not really ideally ideally suited for GPUs. It it works quite well, but maybe if we see a um, big change in the computing infrastructure, then that could launch the reason why we need to rewrite ASCOT 5 to ASCOT 6. But basically, the going from 3 to 4 to 5, all these were included new physics or modi modifications in the hardware where, where we are running the code. Okay, and then there's one more question. Let's take that. Uh, related to the previous question, are there any aspects of fast eye motion that is um, that are ne neglected in ASCOT five? And not really. The user can can go to well. We have fast eye motion itself in the in the given electromagnetic field. This is modeled either either using this full Lorentz force or with the guiding center approximation. So that part is included but then the question might be that if there is some other physical process that um, affects the particle motion and yes you can of course imagine all kind of different phenomena not only mhd that can affect these uh, these particles and we don't have model for all processes but we think that we cover the most important ones and if there is something that we don't cover, then of course we can try to build that new model in. I, I don't see any further questions in the chat. So let's see whether there is nobody nobody has raised the hand. I, I have one question uh, that I want to ask. So we saw in the first uh, presentation today, so the rough estimate, how the computing time needed to model different devices might scale up with the volume size. So my, I was just wondering with ASCOT, you have modeled so many different devices. So can you say whether you see further, further increase of the, of the computing time that is on top of this uh, increase in the volume? Yeah, that, that is a good question. So it, it depends largely how how you want to apply ask ask to to your physics question. So if you are interested in the local heat loading in some component or you want to run synthetic field simulations, then increasing the size of the machine will of course make it more difficult to to obtain relevant statistics. But if you are I, I say only but it's also very important to do such simulations. But if you if you want to run simulations where you want to obtain what is the coupled power to the plasma, how much de heat uh, is deposited to the plasma, then there's not much of a additional need to increase the statistics if the size of the machine is increased. Okay, interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the speakers of this session. It was really interesting. Uh, now we have a small break and come back at at eleven twenty um, Madrid time or Central European time. So um, enjoy your break. Okay. So now the time to the second session, the Agile Kinetics. So my name is Yasuhiro Suzuki from Hiroshima University, Japan. So. Next speaker is uh, Fabian Windmill. The title is the Towards the Self-Consistent Caring Mode Evolution and Microturbulence Interaction in Dial Kinetics. Please go ahead. Okay. So. Okay. so you should see the slide. Um... And full screen, yes? Yep. Very good. So 
Good morning, everyone. And I would first thank to thank the organizer for giving me the chance to, to show my work at this workshop, which I found very interesting up to now. So as uh, explained before, my talk will be um, around magnetic reconnection and the evolution of the Turing mode in uh, gyrokinetics for Tokamak. Um, I'm a guest researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, and I'm employed by the National Institute of Natural Sciences uh, in Japan. So let's go briefly um, over the um, table of content. I will have an introduction, then speak about the numerical tools. Then I will go for the simulation and the physics and some summary and outlooks of my work. So first introduction, what is magnetic reconnection? Briefly, um, on the right, you can see the representation of what is magnetic reconnection. Initially, field lines which are oppositely directed are brought toward each other under some reasons. And when they come to a very small region, they generate a very really strong current, which uh, due to some diffusivity of the magnetic line, field lines, makes that the field line originally connecting A to B is then connecting A to C. And under the strong tension, which is now generated uh, on this newly connected field lines, you have ejection of materials. You can see on the left uh, what could be the, um, the outcome of magnetic reconnection on the sun, for instance where uh, once magnetic connection happens, you have a strong release of uh, stored magnetic energy into kinetic energy um, and, and heat and plasma ejection from the sun. In fusion, of course, uh, magnetic reconnection also happens, and most of us probably have heard of magnetic islands and the deleterious effect they might have on the, on the confinement. As once magnetic reconnection sets up, we have the generation of magnetic islands. For instance, here you have a representation of what is called a 3-2 magnetic islands. And the initial pressure profile, which is what is what is wanted, is flattened here due to the presence of the magnetic islands. You might have other phenomena due to, to magnetic reconnection, like SOTUS instability or edge localized mode. So magnetic reconnection is um, a physics um, a phenomena in physics which is really important to understand, uh, not only in fusion, but uh, in different areas, like in solar physics and also in other astrophysical environments. So now briefly, um, I showed before that in 2D, this idea of magnetic connection of oppositely directed magnetic lines. So how does that happen when we are dealing with toroidal geometry? So when one is looking at the slab geometry, it's very easy to implement um, initial condition for magnetic reconnection. One implements what is called the current sheet, which basically is an hyperbolic tangent with a certain half width, which due to this um, initial condition have magnetic field, which is um, oppositely directed uh, around the center of the current sheet. This is not the case in tokamak and in toroidal geometry because, as you know, the toroidal field is externally created and the poloidal field is not changing sign across um, a resonant surface. And usually it, it does not change um, sign over the tokamak's radius, I would say. So what is the part of the magnetic field which takes part um, to reconnection, well, it's the total helical magnetic field, uh, which has the possibility to change signs across um, a specific resonance surface. And so one has to take into account this uh, helical field and not the, and the background field for the investigation of magnetic reconnection. This leads to some uh, difference between the slab geometry and um, the cylindrical geometry. And this is quite um, interesting because in the slab geometry one can really go analytically and investigate when uh, the tearing mode which is the mode uh, responsible for the, the reconnection process um, is unstable so when you go through all the calculation you obtain what is called the tearing parameter here delta prime and once this delta prime is positive you you have a growth of your mode here you have the radial uh, structure of the vector the electro vector potential. And this is when an, you have an unstable mode or when you have a stable mode. Basically, if you have this delta prime parameter, which depends on the radial derivative of the logarithm of A parallel, you have a growth of your mode. In cylindrical geometry, this is a bit different and a bit more difficult because you cannot really go analytically to, to find this delta prime parameter. 
um, but you have to resort on the Turing equation, which now uh, depends on the um, on the Likel field. So you have to re to resolve to resolve this equation numerically, and what it gives is a current profile. For instance, for a certain current profile, as shown here, when you resolve this equation, um, you can find a delta prime parameter for the profile of a parallel, which is shown here. So for this current profile, I have a certain profile for a parallel, radial profile for a parallel, and then integrating this equation, um, you, you can obtain some value of the delta prime. So this is the shape usually of an unstable Turing mode, and this is the shape of a stable Turing mode, for instance. So it's quite, it's not easy to see, but one, the best way to see is when we have here a durational surface shown here by this uh, dashed line, when we don't have a change of sign, um, when you take the first radial derivative, then normally it should be unstable. So I, I showed this because uh, this is one way for me to check whether uh, I have a Turing mode in my simulations or not by looking at the radial profile of a parallel. Okay. Um, being that said, um, I would like now to briefly explain the numerical tools and the geokinetic models uh, I'm using. So I'm, I, I try to to change a bit my, my, my usual way of, of presenting work by including a bit more of, uh, of numerical um, description of the tools I'm using. So first of all, I'm using the Lagrangian Gerokinetic Peak Code OP5, which um, solved the um, Gerokinetic um, Vlasov-Maxwell system of equation. So this is a peak code, but it also has um, it has also solved the gyrokinetic equation. So it has two fundamental kernels, one peak engine and one gyrokinetic engine. And so the difference with the usual peak code that one might know is that usually in a peak code, you have um, first to deposit numerical particles called markers on a grid, which is uh, made of several cells. And then you solve for the electromagnetic uh, fields by interpolating the value on um, the, the field on the position on the particles. Then once you got this field, you can advance um, your particle by solving the, um, um, the equation. And then you're gonna get, you do again this loop. And this is how normally a peak code works. But now, since we are dealing with gyrokinetics, uh, we have finite Lamour radius effects that has to be taken into account. And for this, uh, we need to we need to to have additional um, steps in this in this routine. So what we have in addition is um, the computational of the gyro average um, of, your, of the gyrokinetic uh, description. So a particle has a, a Lama ring. So for instance, in blue, you can look at this ring here, um, has a, a guiding center in the middle and um, a ring around that. And gyrokinetic basically average um, this fast particle of the motion on this ring. So what is done here is you have um, markers on this ring and so you you can average on this ring and here what is done in in this step um, there is a data structure called Lama ring which is created which basically stores um, in real space the position of the Lama markers and um, weighted gyro centers and by doing that you are able to um, to decouple the peak process from the gyrokinetic process. And in that way, this is really nice because you can apply directly and straightforward all the usual optimization one has for gyrokinetic uh, for uh, peak code without gyrokinetic approximation. And this increases basically the modularity and the efficiency of the code. So now um, I just want to, to give some, some brief uh, assumption of gyrokinetics. Um, probably most of us might have some uh, some ideas about that, but the, mo the most important assumptions, I would say, is this time scale separation between the collective fluctuation and the fast geromation, geromotion of a particle in a strongly magnetized plasma. Um, the message here is basically what we are doing since we are strong magneti magnetized plasma, we can say that the, um, everything which is fast and below the, um, the Lama radius is of can can be basically um, uh, averaged. And this, by this averaging, we are removing the fast cyclotron timescales, 
but also we are considering that then all the fluctuations that are allowed to vary are on the scales of the gyro radius only and in the in direction perpendicular to the field, which then leads to keeper pro rho of the order of one. This is quite interesting because of this approximation. Uh, we then we know then have the possibility to to resolve from micro scale perturbation to a few row size, uh, few row i size that characterize MHD modes. And this is really interesting for me because now I want to enter to investigate the interaction between micro instability and anterior modes. So gyrokinetic is, is a nice approximation for that. Now briefly, how uh, OP5 deals with the equation. So as I mentioned before, it solves the gyrokinetic uh, system of equation for the Maxwell uh, Blasov system of equation. And what it does is splitting uh, the distribution function of a species between a background variate of knots and a time-dependent variation of it. This background, um, by this background um, distribution function is chosen as a Maxwellian, and the deviation from it, which is time-dependent spaces, dependent is found by solving the gyrokinetic plus of uh, equation as shown here. Now, how do I um, how do I initialize a tiering modes in OP5 with the toroidal geometry? As mentioned before, I can relay, uh, rely on um, setting a current sheet because now I'm dealing with the toroidal geometry. So what we, we use is the fact that in, in OP5, we can use a shifted Maxwellian distribution for the electrons. Then analytically, there is um, a current profile that can be found which gives, uh, which is described here for this parameter zeta, which is now case one, where X is the, um, the radial, uh, normalized radial direction, which leads to a certain Q, uh, Q profile that I shown here and that I show here on this graph. Using this um, current profile and Q and safety factor profile, we have here um, an, um, a theory instability that could develop at the Q equal to rational surface here. You can see on the right a plot showing the time evolution for a linear simulation in OP5 of the electrostatic potential and the electromagnetic potential. So here I only have the toroidal, the toroidal mode n equal one in this simulation and um, a certain number of the poloidal modes m. And what it shows in this is that indeed we have the toroidal and the a parallel mode two one, which is dominating the growth, and it has um, this. A radial structure that I showed before, uh, as uh, expected for for toroidal geometry. So this uh, initialization with a current profile and the, the the shifting of the Maxwell distribution for the electrons leads um, to the destabilization of a Turing mode at the rational surface Q equal two. Now to be sure that indeed we have a Turing mode, uh, we can rely on. Um, um, theoretical estimation of the growth rates. So this is a kinetic estimation of the growth rates, uh, which says basically that the growth of your tiering mode should be proportional to some parameters like the mass ratio uh, and the temperature and um, the plasma beta value. So our first thing that could be done is that we have done is a scan in the plasma beta. And you can see in, in, in red here, uh, the growth rates of the tiering mode at the rational surface Q equal to, and in blue it's frequency. In green, in dashed line, is the theoretical scaling of one over beta. So as you can see, indeed, increasing the plasma beta, we have the growth rate of the 2-1 mode, which is decreasing uh, following um, the theoretical estimation. We also have performed um, um, a benchmark with um, the gene code. We can see here a plot for the plasma beta scan for a certain value of the mass ratio. And you can see that Gene also obtained this uh, scaling with one over beta. And in um, for us, the OP5 simulations are the circle blue dots, while the Gene simulations uh, in the collision estimate as us is are the, the squared. So this is good encouraging, saying that we obtain the same thing. Similarly, the other scan, and this is something a bit more important for this workshop, is um, the, the mass ratio scan. Here you can see that due to the mass ratio, if, if you go towards more realistic mass ratio, the growth weight should decrease. Uh, again, a comparison with the simulation from um, with Gene shows the same decrease. 
here in this plot, um, I have one point which is going uh, to smaller uh, ME over MI compared to this one, because I wanted to show that when we are going to more realistic uh, value of the mass ratio, we start to have some issues with the theoretical scaling. Here, it's not really the problem that we are deviating from the scaling, but it's more that uh, we need more resolution and more computational cost to be more close to the theoretical estimation. So speaking of the theoretical cost, uh, let me describe a little bit how much um, it might cost on a CPU. So when we are dealing with linear simulations, we are not um, in need of turbulence. So we need only, well, I said a few markers, um, but uh, the number of markers are not so critical for the for this linear simulation. What is critical is that for resolving the, the, the Turing mode, we need to resolve what is called the skin depth, which basically is the width over which reconnection uh, will initially take place. And this um, half width is proportional to the square root, as you can see, of the mass ratio and um, one over the plasma beta. So this is... Um, a first issue, because when one scan the plasma beta, for instance, um, we have then uh, a decrease of this size as we increase the plasma beta. Similarly, when we want to go to more realistic mass ratio, we'll have a decrease of this DE. What does that mean? It means that in the radial direction, we have to increase the resolution. So who is the resolution uh, in OP5 um, performed? We have uh, three different we have a grid made of the radial direction s we have the toroidal direction and the toroidal, toroidal direction grid this toroidal resolution has to be set such that uh, it should be at least four times um, the maximum uh, toroidal mode that we are using in the simulation and the poloidal resolution is also should be at least four times um, the maximum toroidal mode number that I have times the maximum value of the, the, the safety factor profile plus um, the value of the filter we apply on the poloidal modes. So basically, here I, do, I have this um, small table showing you um, how much grid I might need um, for just changing the mass ratio for going from um, this value of an realistic mass ratio to a more realistic mass ratio. Already for a linear simulation, um, and for this um, plasma horizontal size, I need for this small mass ratio here, oh, sorry, unrealistic mass ratio, a uh, number of radial grid points, which is about 307. This with this value, I resolve I sufficiently resolve um, the electron skip depth. Here I have only one toroidal mode and seven poloidal modes, which, due to these constraints here, leads to about 384 um, CPUs at least. So the point is um, the value given to phi and chi should be integral multiple of the number of process used by, the, by uh, when we want to, to perform the simulation. So for instance, here for only one toroidal mode and, and the seven poloidal mode associated, um, we will have to use about 348 CPUs um, per day. And for this kind of simulation, I only need one restart to have uh, sufficiently uh, converged in time simulation. While already for linear simulation, when increasing to a more realistic mass ratio, the, ion, the electron skin depths will reduce uh, in normalized units by about a factor of three. And so I have to increase, of course, by about a factor of three, the radial radius, uh, the, the, sorry, the radial uh, grid, which for, since the number of CPUs, it's only associated to the number of uh, grid points in the poloidal and toroidal direction is not changing, but the number of restarts is increasing. So already for linear simulation, going to a more, more realistic mass ratio might be um, already some, some issues in terms of the numerical costs. Five minutes left. Okay, so it was uh, longer than I thought. Okay, so I will be a bit faster. So here it's the same idea, but now dealing with nonlinear simulation. With nonlinear simulation, of course, 
uh, we're including more modes from zero to 30 modes, for instance. And the same idea would be that we increase then the number of polyvinyl modes. So basically, we need to have about, in order to be in the phi and chi to be the, the integer of the number of CPUs, uh, we have for not too much, 1,536, we need 20 restarts, for instance, for a simulation, a nonlinear simulation with this mass ratio I presented before. And this is quite important because here in this plot, uh, we will focus only on the green line and the blue line here. The difference between the green and the blue line is the mass ratio. This is the unrealistic mass ratio and this is the realistic mass ratio. What is shown here is the time evolution of the electrostatic potential um, and the Q equal to rational surface. So basically the Turing mode, how it crosses. So you can see there is a strong difference between the, the, and the Turing mode growth rates first. It is really well decreased. And also you can observe that there is some behavior here where when the growth rate, when the, the Turing model reach a nonlinear saturation, there is an island which is generated, which decreases in size. While here, you don't have such an overshoot. So let me briefly go through this overshoot uh, story. So this is the time evolution of phi of the electrostatic potential and the electromagnetic potential for all the toroidal modes from zero to 30 and um, which are summed over the polyvinyl modes. So the Turing mode is growing initially and all the other modes are, grown, are, are growing from the noise uh, due to the, this instability here. And we are reaching saturation here at some point, and then there is a strong decrease of the this value. And this means that the island size is decreasing. So let's have a movie of this. It will be more clear. Um, you can see on the left the electrostatic potential and on the right the electromagnetic potential for this nonlinear simulation. As the time is evolving, and the island is growing in size, and then some we have turbulence which are um, developing at its edge here. And due to this turbulence, the, which are developing on, on the island separatrices, we have some uh, nonlinear effects, which leads ultimately to the decrease of this magnetic island. And this behavior is seen be only in the case where the, um, the mass ratio is, is unrealistic. So this is the reason for this um, decay here. And this is an issue because, for instance, already for the simulation, it's quite, it could be quite costly. So at least 20 restarts from this number of CPUs per day. Um, while for this simulation here, with the more realistic mass ratio, we're already more than 30 restarts. And so this is an issue because having unrealistic mass ratio can lead to really different interpretation of what could happen to the, to the tiering mode in, in the island. So here I, I can mention briefly that um, there, this is the time evolution of, of the electromagnetic potential. Its radial structure is first derivative, which is proportional to the delta prime parameter, which basically show that at these different times, we have a tiering mode. And why do we have this um, decrease in the size is because the island becomes so large and due to turbulence generated around it, we have a modification of the safety factor. So here you have the current profile, which is shown. And what is happening is as the island becomes very large, we have a flattening of the pressure profile here in blue compared to the red, which is the initial uh, time. We have a flattening of the pressure profile. And since our islands are destabilized by the current only, then this stabilizes the island at the Q equal to, which reduces its size. But in the same time, you have a perturbation of the current, which shifts, it, which shifts the Q equal to rational surface closer to the core. And because of this, um, you have this, this um, strange, unrealistic behavior of this large island growing and then decreasing in size. And this is, um, I might skip this, uh, might skip this slide. Uh, and this is quite, uh, quite annoying. And especially uh, it might lead to, to some issues with the, with the island's uh, velocity. So maybe briefly here, what is shown, I will just discuss uh, this graph here. Um, basically, when you have unrealistic mass ratio, this will be this graph here, when you see that the island polyoidal frequency is almost close to zero, but suddenly have a strong frequency and strong rotation here due to this uh, overshoot that I shown before. 
while here a comparison with a more realistic mass ratio will be this orange curve so this is the orange curve you can see that the yeah, the Turing mode is not having this overshoot is not over um, rotating so there's a big difference between uh, realistic and unrealistic mass ratio and this is related to turbulence and there's no flow generation around it i'm not sure i have time to discuss this um unfortunately but basically what happens is that uh, you have that due to the turbulence the island sorry the island initially be very big is decreased in size and due to the turbulence which is now generated the island is uh, localized in a strong um, zonal flow direction which provides um, the direction of rotation of the island and this is again uh, unrealistic Okay, so sorry, I've been a bit uh, too long maybe in the introduction, but basically what is uh, important for the point of view of the HPC is that if we want to really investigate properly the interaction of micro turbulence and the growth of the Turing mode, we rely basically on the resolution on the initial electron skin depth. And this electron skin depth, unfortunately, is proportional to the mass ratio and the plasma beta. And of course, uh, as I showed before, if we are not going towards realistic mass ratio or larger values of the plasma beta, because the plasma beta, the plasma beta that I used was quite small compared to, um, to what can be achieved in, in recent machines, um, we have this unrealistic um, behavior of the island. So the main message here is that we need strong HPC and in good um, code optimized on this, on this machine such that we can go towards more realistic um, behavior of the island. It's quite, it could have quite different interpretation of what is happening due to this mass ratio. Okay, sorry, I'm done. And sorry for being a bit uh, late on the, on the schedule. So thank you very much, uh, Fabian. So very interesting talk. So now open for discussion for the, this talk. So if you have a question, please raise a hand or the write a question in chat. Okay, so I have a couple of the questions. So, yeah, so I'm developing the PIC code for the edge plasma physics. So then, uh, so in my experience, so tuning of the PIC code, so especially the scaling is uh, very difficult. So you discuss the cost of the, you know, the, this uh, turbulence calculation. So I wonder the, how much is the scaling of the CPU number for the simulation? You mean, for instance, here? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, that's a, that's a good, it scales very well until, it, it depends, of course, on, on, on the resolution you use, but for, um this kind of resolution for this bottom line here for instance uh, oh. it scales very well until um 256 cpus after that it it's it's start to deviate a little bit from the idle scaling so it could scale mm -hmm. very well i see that's great and uh, okay, so question from chat so could you give the more detail on the how the tearing instability generate the turbulence under the zonal flow? Yes. Um, so, let me, uh, so, uh, let me, how the tearing generates turbulence and zonal flow. Yes. Um, sorry, I have to reread the question. So, first of all, uh, I want to show, to express that the turbulence is electrostatic and not electromagnetic, as we can see on this plot here. The electromagnetic potential um, is evolving into a zonal component, strong current component here. So it's mostly electrostatic turbulence which are developed. So basically what is happening is as the tearing uh, reached the nonlinear phase, we have the generation of a magnetic island and the magnetic islands suddenly become very large. And when, because it becomes so large, we have here at the sides local gradients. 
which are generated. And these local, local gradients here on the sides of this island generates micro instabilities. And due to this micro instabilities generation, um, we have that the, um, because of the micro, sorry, micro instability here at the sides of the, sorry, of the, of the islands, we have basically can show on this one here because this would be a proxy for the current. Uh, let's go to the same time. Um, we have a modification from due to the turbulence around the island to the island size. We have a modification of the island size. This leads to a strong zonal current. And basically, what is happening is as turbulence is growing, we have a flattening of this uh, current profile. So this I explained already. Now the generation um, to the zonal flows, uh, let me go to this slide, is the following. So here, there is two things to distinguish. The zonal flows, which is the zero, zero components of um, the first derivative, it's E cross B flow. So it can be, a proxy can be used as a zero, zero components of the um, electrostatic potential, the first derivative of it. But there is also something else which is generated, is the flows generated around the island itself. So this is quite important because as the island grows in size, we have uh, some, some, some zonal flows here which are generated to the, the micro instabilities. But what is really strongly generated are this quadrupolar structure of the flows for the N equal one. It has a two one uh, structures here which basically grows because you have the generation of the micro instability at the island edge. And they try um, basically to, to shear the turbulence. But since the turbulence which is generated around the island is at, um, at TEM, uh, trapped electron mode, instabili instability, the, the, the zonal flows have difficulties to quench this turbulence. So it, it, it ends. Um, as the shrinking of the island. And due to the shrinking of the island, the turbulence initially at the edge, at the separatrix of the island, can now, can now uh, spread over different uh, radial direction, different radial positions. Due to the spreading of this turbulence here, we have the generation of the zonal flow, which are seeded by this turbulence, which now spreads. And this zonal component now is uh, sort of uh, reduced and, and not uh, strong anymore because we don't have strong turbulence around the, the island anymore. So trying to, to summarize that, we have a very large island to the small mass to the realistic mass ratio. You have turbulence, local turbulence are generated at the island separatrices. Um, this flattens the current profiles, which leads to a, a stabilization of the tearing mode. You have a, and then destabilization of another island due to the move of the safety of the, the rational surface closer to the core. And at the same time, when the island is really big and you have this turbulence around it, you have this, this zonal flows generated by the island themselves, island generated flows, I should say, which try to quench the turbulence. But once the island reduces in size, then it's the zo normal zonal flows which uh, takes over. Um, because the turbulence is now spreading everywhere in, around the island and the turbulence around the island is not existing anymore. And so these flows are not existing anymore. So it's quite complicated interplay, um, but uh, I hope it was clear, this explanation. But at least this is uh, something that could be investigated uh, with this low mass ratio. So there is some, some, some utilities in having this kind of simulation. I hope it's clear. Yeah, so thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Fabian. Uh, so I want to move the next talk. So I want to invite the next speaker, uh, Jaya Kumar from India. So title of the, his talk, The Neural Network Assisted the Electrostatic Global Giant Kinetic Toroidal Code Using the Cylindrical Coordinate. So please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jay Kumar uh, from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, uh, in India. 
and uh, I should start by uh, thanking the organizers for giving us this opportunity to present our code, uh, the development part of the code in this workshop. Um, so uh, I am at the Indian Institute of Science along with uh, Joydeep and uh, Animesh Kule, who are part of the plasma theory group uh, over here. And uh, we have uh, two more collaborators, Sarveshwar and Ab Abhijit Sen from the Institute of Plasma Research uh, and Homi Baba National Institute. Uh, so today what uh, what we are going to look at is the code that we have developed uh, in our group, uh, which we call as G2C3, which stands for the Global Chirokinetic uh, Code Using Cylindrical Coordinates. So uh, as the title mentions, uh, we make use of neural networks to perform uh, some of this simulation in the uh, cylindrical coordinates. So we'll get into the details as we go along. To start with, uh, maybe I'll, I should uh, thank the uh, funding agencies. So these three are the uh, government funding agencies. And uh, the last one, basically, the Infosys uh, Foundation is a IT company based uh, uh, funding that we get from, uh, based in Bangalore itself. OK, so to start start off, uh, what's, uh, what are we trying to achieve? What's the importance and objective uh, that we have? So uh, if you look at this particular schematic over here, uh, this is a typical cross section of a tokamak and uh, uh, you can categorize these regions into the core region and the edge region which are basically separated by the separate rig surface over here which ends up forming a x point and this is important for our discussion so we'll find we'll see that uh, a typical gyrokinetic code uh, pick code that is used in tokamak simulation they basically work in the core region uh, to name a few gtc gene or five and other codes that we have uh, heard about uh, today uh, and they uh, they make use of this flux coordinates to simplify the computation and this flux coordinate fails uh, uh, you'll you'll encounter problems when you reach the x point or the uh, separate rig surface and uh, that leads to problem in combining the simulation between the core and the edge and our goal is going to be how do we resolve this problem how do we make sure that uh, we can perform this global simulation and we are going to make use of cylindrical coordinates so that's where in the g2c3 comes in uh, just to point out that there are other codes as well which are, which are under developments trying to uh, build towards the edge region and uh, just as an illustrative example, I have a few snapshots from uh, different uh, uh, codes, XGC, Trimeg, and uh, uh, GNX, which seem to perform uh, towards the uh, edge region as well and capture uh, the mode structures. They all have different assumptions, uh, different implementations. Uh, we won't get into the details of those right now. We'll look at uh, what we have to offer in some, some sense. Uh, okay. So uh, to uh, to start off, uh, this is a code which is being developed from scratch at the Indian Institute of Science. And uh, this is a, a first principal particle in cell code in cylindrical coordinates. And uh, we make use of the MHD equilibria, which is obtained using either EFIT or, or the uh, IPREQ, the Indian uh, Tokamak-based uh, uh, equilibrium data. Uh, to initialize the simulation. And uh, we also have uh, both gyrokinetic as well as fully kinetic particle integrator. Uh, we have uh, these interpolation schemes with field aligned particle grid. Uh, we have implemented the MPA uh, version of this uh, code. And uh, we make use of PETC for the poison solver, which is the finite element based uh, method. And uh, crucially, we make use of a uh, neural network to uh, locate the particle and gather, uh, perform gathering scattering operations. This is what we'll look at in more detail. Uh, but as a demonstration, we make use of this to perform uh, a gyrokinetic uh, simulation, uh, gyrokinetic thermal, uh, thermal ion simulation with adiabatic electron. So we'll get into more details as we go along. But before going ahead, I should point out that uh, machine learning has been used uh, in the community uh, as of now uh, with a lot of applications, especially some of these uh, like 
prediction of uh, disruptions in uh, tokamax or uh, shaping the plasma like the droplet shape and so on as in this particular figure over here and uh, even to pr predict the profile uh, in, in terms of measurement uh, can you perform some kind of measurement and infer something uh, using machine learning but one thing to note is that all of these uh, examples that i state over here are experimental data driven which is basically you need to run the uh, uh, run the tokamak and uh, uh, get uh, data and analyze them. For example, this particular uh, prediction, disruption prediction makes use of LSTM, which is a time series uh, prediction algorithm. Over here, they, for shape control, they make use of uh, reinforcement learning based approach and so on. Um, compare that to the one in which you make use of simulation data driven. For example, you can have uh, a few of these cases wherein people have managed to model these collision operators using machine learning, wherein the data itself is generated in the simulation and used to uh, uh, learn uh, certain things. Uh, these basically are uh, what are termed as a reduced model or surrogate model. They tend to speed up the calculation and so on. Uh, similarly, uh, there have been applications of uh, machine learning in uh, uh, trying to predict uh, electric field given the uh, uh, the density uh, fu function itself. So th these are uh, more like simulation based and this is what we will tend to uh, do. Our goal is going to be to replace a few of the modules, the standard uh, PIC modules with the machine learning approach so that we can optimize it and uh, perform better. So to start off with, the, uh, what we have is a cylindrical coordinate over here, R zeta z, which forms a right-handed uh, coordinate system. And correspondingly, you, you need to rewrite the uh, magnetic field, the uh, pusher uh, subroutine for the particle dynamics and so on. Uh, to, and uh, what we do is uh, schematically for the peak code, we need to look at uh, this toroidal domain with the uh, grids which are uh, which are which form these poloidal uh, planes and uh, then basically we need to look at um, how does the uh, a particle move more in this domain so to start with we need to uh, take this poloidal plane and try uh, and build a mesh so the mesh that we look at is a triangular mesh uh, again uh, it's partially uh, order uh, 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 structured uh, in the sense that we follow the flux uh, flux lines to generate these uh, mesh because we can encode the experimental data, the equilibrium data better by uh, using this. But then uh, you will see that uh, uh, this leads to uh, problems. For, for example, if you look at, uh, uh, if you give me an unstructured mesh, uh, trying to locate a particle, say for example, I look, put a particle over here in R, RZ plane, uh, trying to figure out what is the triangle that it belongs to is computationally expensive. So here, basically, we uh, you you could do a brute force search, which is going to be time consuming. Whereas uh, what we uh, uh, what we managed to do is build a simple neural network, a two layer neural network, which maps the coordinates r comma z to the label of the triangle. So uh, what we do over here is uh, this is a supervised uh, neural network, uh, supervised learning, basically, wherein uh, you feed in the, uh, you train it with the, uh, in, with the data. Uh, say, for example, in this particular case, you can take a triangle and take the centroid of it and use that as a training data so that you know both the coordinates as well as the triangle and try to train the neural network and then try to see how well does it predict. And in terms of prediction, if you see, it turns out that uh, as shown in these illustrative examples, uh, it tends to predict uh, well in the sense that the triangle that it predicts tends to fall within a few triangles in, in the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, you, uh, okay, before going to that, in terms of time performance, of course, uh, this prediction method works way better than the brute force method because it's a, a single step prediction. The training takes longer time, but that is done before the main loop in the simulation starts. So that should not uh, be a problem. 
Um, but to exactly locate the triangle, right? Uh, we we make use of this area coordinate method, wherein if you look at this uh, particular case over here, the given a point within the triangle, we can build uh, three triangles out of it and find the signed area. Now this signed area has uh, way more information. For example, in this particular case, if you look at a um, uh, point which is lying outside the triangle that we are interested in, then by looking at the areas, the signs of the areas, we can determine on which side of the uh, triangle relative does the point lie. And then we can readjust and find out the exact uh, location of the triangle. So in some sense, if you put these two, uh, the neural network and, the, uh, and this iterative method together, you can locate the triangle exactly. Uh, moving on, I, uh, next one would be to uh, perform the gathering of uh, gathering scattering operation. Again, uh, we make use of this uh, area coordinate method, uh, which basically helps us perform uh, linear interpolation in 2D itself, given a triangle, uh, given the values at uh, these three grid points, you can estimate what is the value at the uh, at the particle location using the area coordinates. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, 3D interpolation or uh, movement of the particle, uh, we need to move move the particle or project the particle along the field line. This is because the, uh, of the anisotropy that is uh, obtained because of the high magnetic field in the system. Mm -hmm. And we need to project this, uh, uh, this particle or this point onto the poloidal planes. Now, uh, to uh, perform this, basically uh, one approach would be to look at how the uh, this particular flux surface and the field line look like, right? So if you open up this uh, torus and look at the field line, it will it'll look curved. Say, for example, uh, we look at uh, one particular case from uh, D3D, D3D shot over here, you'll find that these field lines are curved. So typically, uh, if you look at the um, uh, most of the codes which work in the core region, you go, in, you transform this uh, coordinate such that these field lines become straight line uh, after transformation. Once it's a straight line, you can easily move along this uh, straight line so that uh, any projection or any kind of interpolation can be performed easily, computationally, uh, much more simpler. Uh, but the problem is this transformation, which, which is basically the Boozer coordinate uh, transformation, uh, encounters problems at this X point, right? It fails to uh, perform, uh, perform this transform. We fail to perform this transformation around the X point, and we need to replace this. So the way we went about this was, uh, again, uh, take the help of a neural network. Uh, what we do is, uh, this projection operation going from the particle to the uh, to the poloidal plane, we basically take the coordinates of the particle and find uh, find out what is the projection of these particles onto the poloidal plane. Now, how is this uh, this calculation performed? This is a new by numerical integration. This is an expensive process, so we basically perform multiple uh, step uh, iterative. Uh, integration to uh, to find out where does the particle fall onto the uh, poloidal plane. And once you have that data, we can use that to train the neural network. Once again, we have used a simple two-layer neural network, which acts as a universal approximator, a function approximator. And um, uh, with the, uh, basically, we have uh, two activation functions over here. We have a nonlinear sigmoid and a linear output uh, activation function. And uh, we basically try to see how well does this perform. To our surpri surprise, it turns out that um, uh, for this particular calculation, uh, we find that uh, this is uh, very accurate. So the in terms of for comparison purpose, like a typical machine learning uh, uh, problem, uh, we plot the expected value versus the estimated value uh, over here, so that a 45 degree line over here will indicate a perfect match. So you see that uh, in all the three estimation of uh, R, Z, and S, uh, S, by the way, uh, refers to the arc length along the uh, field line itself. And we find that the estimation is uh, very good and it's within uh, accuracy of 2%. 
So the, this is the uh, this is what so this is how we use the neural network to move the point from a uh, particle position and share data to the colloidal plane and uh, back. Now moving on, uh, we have implemented a, a, a finite element method for uh, solving the uh, the field uh, and the, in the poloidal plane. So we basically uh, make use of first order method wherein uh, we can convert this Poisson equation into a linear uh, Poisson solver. And uh, we basically have end up having a sparse matrix, which, uh, which has to be inverted. And we make use of Petsy in this particular case to perform this operation. Um, for a uh, to test our implementation, we did take an uh, analytic known solution with the circular cross section, and we find that again the um, errors are within uh, two percent in in this particular case. Uh, for, uh, moving on uh, to find out the electric field, uh, we make use of which is nothing but the gradient of the potential. Um, we could make use of the finite element itself, gradient using finite element, but it turns out that. Uh, since it's a first order, the potential is uh, uh, is linearly interpolated, whereas the gradient becomes discontinuous. So to avoid it, we did the uh, 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 weak formulation for the gradient, and we end up getting a much more smoother uh, electric field. This is important because uh, as a particle moves uh, moves uh, within the domain uh, simulation domain, uh, it would end if we were to use this discontinuous function, uh, it would encounter a noisy whereas uh, this smooth, uh, the weak form basically smoothens out uh, the noises over here. Uh, okay, so these are the different modules that we have implemented and uh, uh, the, the way to test it. So to in our uh, simulations, what we do is uh, uh, as a proof of concept, first we need to prove that um, our uh, implementation works well within the in the core region. Right, so we basically uh, perform uh, simulation with the D3D shot. Uh, this particular shot was used actually to study elms, but in, in our case, we use this to simulate the um, ITG mode, which is ion temperature gradient mode. And uh, we have uh, uh, we look at a linear adiabatic electron, uh, gyrokinetic ion, and electrostatic case. And uh, this is the kind of profile that we make use of to uh, build this um, uh, ITG mode. And uh, we basically look at only the core region that we, we simulate an annular region as we know uh, approximately the region in which uh, we expect the ITG mode to occur. So given this, we basically find that um, when we run our uh, simulations, um, we find that uh, 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 we, uh, we are able to extract the modes, uh, the ITG modes, uh, and over here, this is the 2D poloidal plane that uh, that we are seeing, and the corresponding 3D structure over here. Um, this particular plot shows shows you the uh, the potential in the outer mid plane in this region, and uh, what you see is the uh, the peak occurs around. Uh, uh, this is the location of the peak, and we find that uh, that is a resonant surface, and we could extract the uh, uh, Q, Q value, the safety factor around that region, and verify that that's uh, that's a resonant region, uh, resonant flux surface. And uh, if you look at the theta uh, dependence of the uh, potential as we go along on this maximum uh, peak. Uh, flux surface, we find this kind of structure, which basically is a, a proper ITG mode. And uh, just for a, a demonstration purpose, you will see that as it evolves, we see a growth, uh, a steady growth in the potential. And uh, we have extracted this growth rate and uh, cross verified. So uh, in some sense, this is still a verification. So we have cross verified this with the uh, GTC simulation. And we find that um, um, uh, our uh, results are within the acceptable uh, uh, regimes. Uh, further, if you look at the uh, the 3D structure, so th this basically is uh, um, you you see that um, as we go traverse along the toroidal direction, there is a, a twisting of this uh, mode structure, and that is what uh, 
what is shown over here as a 3D uh, 3D view. And uh, this again, uh, very, uh, we are able to confirm with the GTC code. Um, and further, we, we go on to analyze the uh, these mode structures, uh, try to extract the M and uh, N mode, the toroidal and colloidal uh, mode numbers over here. And uh, we find that, uh, so in this particular case, what you see is the again a, a colloidal structure and we basically are going to traverse along different uh, flux surfaces and uh, we look at how the field looks like on each flux surface over here. This is the toroidal direction, this is the colloidal angle and uh, we can extract the uh, again the, in the outer along the outer mid plane how does the uh, potential looks like uh, the RMS value. Okay, fine. I'm almost done. Uh, and uh, we basically do a FFT of uh, the uh, the field in the uh, in the flux surface to extract the uh, mode numbers. So if you look at how it does evolve uh, for different flux surfaces, you find that um, as we move along different flux surfaces, we are able to extract these modes and uh, confirm this particular uh, uh, structure and values with the existing GTC code. So this is uh, where we are at right now. And uh, so th as I mentioned, this, is, uh, this, is, this was the goal to start off with and um, we have implemented uh, the uh, uh, adiabatic electron case. And right now, uh, Joydeep is working on implementing the kinetic electron case and we are uh, in the process of uh, testing out and uh, performing convergence studies uh, right now. And once that is done, we plan to move towards the edge region and try to see how, uh, how well can we extract, uh, extend our implementation. I think that's, that's all I have to say. For Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Zaya. So very interesting, uh, excellent talk. So now the open for discussions. We have the question in the chat uh, at first. So is a trained model for particle locator generalizable? Or the, for example, the, do you have to retrain the model if you generate a higher resolution mesh? Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so are you referring? So there are two uh, two places where we have used neural networks. So one is to uh, predict the uh, triangle. This basically crucially depends upon the uh, resolution and the number of uh, triangles and grid points. This yes, you need to retrain retrain this particular case. Uh, whereas uh, in the field. Uh, estimation that is the projection to perform this projection we find that uh, as long as the uh, the, uh, the training is done over uh, over a fine enough uh, resolution to start with uh, even if you increase the number of uh, grid points or if you want to do it with a higher resolution it does up to some extent uh, estimate uh, quite well without retraining does that answer the question? Yeah. So next question is, uh, how much the computation resource is consumed to try the particle locator model? Uh, sorry, how much? How much computational resources? Computational resources. OK, fine. Uh, so uh, in, in this particular case, uh, as I mentioned, we we made use of a simple, a very simple neural network model. We didn't try to uh, go in for more com complex models. We have used uh, just two two layer neural networks with uh, 10, la 10 uh, network nodes in the first layer and three at the output. And this basically is a. a, a, a uh, what do you say? In terms of computation, you could run this calculation even on your laptop. Uh, and uh, again, it's it takes some time. It takes around uh, three thousand uh, epochs to learn the whole structure. But then, uh, as I mentioned, this is being performed before the main loop of the simulation. So that time doesn't count. It's just the estimation prediction time that matters. And that is just. It turns out to be two matrix multiplication with the one uh, tan hyperbolic calculation, which is 
quite fast. So I would say uh, computationally, it's not not a problem, at least for the okay. model that we have. I see. So next question is, uh, can the code be run for the sterilators or the, okay. are there plan to adapt it? Okay. Uh, so uh, over here, the uh, we have made use of the tor uh, toroidal uh, symmetry uh, of the uh, of the tokamak to perform this calculation because uh, we make make use of the same neural network on each poloidal plane. So uh, independent of the poloidal plane, uh, it, uh, we need to perform the same operation because of the toroidal symmetry. Whereas uh, once you want to get into stellarator, we will get end up uh, having to twist, and each poloidal plane is going to have different. Uh, uh, different behavior, but again, I I believe we can uh, you can always train them separately and use different net train network with the same same architecture, but training for each poloidal plane being done differently. That sh it should in principle work, but again, the accuracy and uh, the performance needs to be tested. Uh, over here, uh, the we the way we arrived at. Uh, this particular model again this is the simplest model so uh, that was the starting point but the number of nodes number of layers is still up 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 for optimization whereas we found that we are able to achieve reasonable uh, reasonably good performance with just this simple uh, model so maybe if it is a stellarator with more uh, amount of twist uh, we might need to play around with these hyperparameters, fine tune them. But ideally, in principle, it should be work, uh, working fine. Okay, so next question. So, is the code available in an open source repository? No, not yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we uh, still, uh, as I told you, it's still, uh, we are still testing the convergence and then we'll have to, again, we'll, uh, I suppose a group will have to decide on how to go about uh, the copywriting part. Oh, okay, so that's very great. <laughs> so any other questions? No questions. Yeah, so, okay, so thank you very much. Again, the very interesting talk. Thank you very much, yeah. So, uh, okay, so is any uh, announcement from the organizers? No? So if not, so let's close uh, this session. So please enjoy the lunch. Hello to everyone. Welcome back. So, uh, I am Jeronimo Garcia from CA, and now we are going to go to the session about turbulence and transport. And the first, just for a moment, the first speaker is Jose Manuel Garcia Regaña, who is going to talk about the historical turbulence simulation in Europe, a tour of its latest achievements. So please, uh, Jose Maria, can you share your screen? Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Perfect. Can see the the slides, right? Yes. Please. Go okay. Ahead. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the chance to give this overview of a stellar to run simulation, not exactly in Europe, but within a project, the so-called TSBB thirteen project that is dedicated much into much to this particular topic. So I would like also to thank the members of the TSBB 13 team. And that, as I say, the TSBB 13 is a nickname somehow of this project that is started to tour and simulation. So in this presentation, I'm gonna to try to be very pedagogical and I'm gonna review some basic concept of transport in magnetically confined fusion plasmas. I will then follow where with a motivation about why do we need to focus on stellarator turbulence simulation in particular, or where we, where do we stand in this field? And finally, I will go through the main achievements within this project. 
So let's get started. As you most know, nuclear fusion plasmas are composed of charged particles, the main uh, hydro, the main ions that are typically hydrogen nuclei together with electrons and some impurity ions that enter after the interaction between the plasma and the walls or because we want them to be placed there for various reasons. The main impurity ions typically are atoms of carbon, iron, tungsten, or helium, okay? So if we are in a uniform magnetic field with a straight field line, those particles that are charged because the plasma is at very high temperatures, they follow helices around the magnetic field lines, okay? With a gyro frequency, omega s, where s stands for the different species, and with a different, each species, Larmor radius rho, okay? And these are the basics, the basic principle of magnetic confined fusion. We want to impose a strong magnetic field so that our charged particles basically are tied to follow the magnetic field lines and then we can confine them, okay? So in a strongly magnetized plasma, um, with a strongly magnetized plasma, we refer to the cases where the Larmor radius is much smaller than the length scale for the system size, okay? Particles are automatically confined in the absence of collisions. But when collisions enter, the collisions modify the velocity of the different particles, and consequently, they modify their guiding center position. With guiding center, we refer to the position respect to which particle carries. That in this case, it coincides with the magnetic field line. And then this yield cross field transport of particles hit a momentum that we call classical transport. But in most present day magnetically confined fusion, our devices display toroidal magnetic geometries. Either you are in a tokamak or in a stellarator. A tokamak is simply a axisymmetric a toroidal device where a stellarator has a bit more complicated shape. The magnetic field lines exhibit non-vanishing geodesic curvature and also the strength of the magnetic field along the line is inhomogeneous. And then this provides the position of the particles with a drift that made the guiding center to move across different magnetic field lines. So the curvature of the magnetic field at the inhomogeneity gives rise to this drift that I point out here that is different for electrons and for the ions. So this introduces a splitting or a separation in the charge within the plasma. And then this automatically generates an electric field. When we have an electric field embedded in a magnetic field, the one that confines our plasma, we immediately create another drift, the so-called electrosby drift, that together with Coulomb collisions gives rise to another source of cross field transport of particles, momentum, and energy. This channel of transport is what we call neoclassical transport and is dominant in the stellarators at low collisionality regimes. And that's why in stellarator designs, we typically face the question of how to optimize the neoclassical transport in these devices. And the largest example of optimized stellarators to exhibit reduced neoclassical transport is Venda 7 x And finally, we have another source of losses that is turbulence driven by micro instabilities. So let's imagine that we have a cartoon, a sector of a tokamak plasma in which we have a temperature gradient in the ions that I have depicted here in these schematic profiles and with this color scale. So following the expression that I have shown in the previous slide, the high energetic particles, or let's say the hot particles that have, that have higher energy drift faster than the cold or lower energy particles that I have split it here in two regions, referring to, let's say, where hot means red and cold means uh, are depicted with blue, with blue, with this blue area. Okay. So if we perturb the system, then quasi neutrality breaks because basically in the layer separating the cold and the hot plasma regions, you have particles escaping from this region much faster from the hot region than from the cold region, where particles arrive more slowly. So then this charge separation immediately creates an electric field. And as I've said in previous slide, this electric field embedded 
in, uh, in the confined magnetic field of our device creates an A cross B drift. This A cross B drift, in this case, makes the perturbation to increase, creating what we call a micro instability. So micro instabilities are excited in what we call bad curvature regions. In this scheme, this corresponds to the outboard size on side of this tokamak. If I had plotted this, if I had selected this area in the inboard side, what I would have obtained is an A cross B that put down uh, the instability rather than making it grow. So these instabilities, these micro instabilities are the source of turbulent fluctuations of the electromagnetic field in our devices. And then this gives rise again to cross feed transport of particles, heat and momentum that we call turbulent transport. Turbulent transport has been a source of concern in Tokamaks because it has been the dominant transport channel traditionally and also in, in what we call classical accelerators. But it has gained much more importance now that the you know, classical optimization has worked in the particular case of Vendorsign 7X or HSX. So, uh, I mean, what I have sh just shown it was a cartoon and the picture is more, let's say, it's more complicated than that. There is a theoretical framework to describe appropriately micro turbulence from, from first principle that is gyrokinetic theory. And it targets to solve the Blasov Maxwell system of equation. It does it in a strongly magnetized plasma, which is what I've said before, assuming that you have the Larmor radius of all the species much more than the size of the system. Okay. And it focuses on instabilities with frequencies much smaller than the gyro frequencies of the particles and with characteristic size of the Larmor radius, okay? And it also handles strongly anisotropic turbulence type, which basically tells us that the wavelength or the variation of the instabilities on the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field line is much shorter than the wavelength along the magnetic field line. So the main advantage of this formalism is that it averages out the fast gyro phase dependence of the distribution function, okay? That is in the end, the central quantity that we want to solve for. So basically it turns a problem that is six dimensional into a problem that has only five dimensions. And this supposes a very high enhancement in the efficiency and in the possibility of addressing this problem numerically. But even though it cancels out the gyro phase dependence, it retains the finite gyro radius effect, okay? Another gain in the treatment of the problem in computational terms comes from the fact that typically what we solve is not the full distribution function of the species, but we perform a delta F splitting, okay? Basically, we consider that our distribution function for each species is, a separate, is separated into a Maxwellian that is analytically known and a uh, small part that is what we want to solve for. So the gyro average uh, turbulent distribution function or perturbed turbulent distribution function obeys the Blasov equation that takes this form. So this is the only equation that I'm going to show you in this presentation. And with this, I just want you to remind you that all the ingredients that I have told you before about are present there. You have the particles streaming along the magnetic field line that eventually can find regions of strong magnetic fields and they can become trapped. You are accounting for the drifts related to the curvature and inhomogeneity of the magnetic field. Eventually, you can also modify the velocity of the particles due to a stronger regions in, the, in terms of the electrostatic energy along the particle trajectories. And also you have a non-linear, a non-linearity that is actually responsible for the saturation and the achievement of a, let's say, of a steady state solution and not just an exponential growth of an instability. And finally, you have the across B drift, the turbulent across B drift projected along the gradient of our Maxwellian. So basically, this is our the source of our term that is telling you that where you have turbulent fluctuation of the resistivity potential and gradients of the temperature or the density, for instance, you will have turbulent fluctuation and you will drive transport. You can even go beyond that and also consider 
what I have so, said before, that the turbulence that we are interested in in this theoretical framework has much shorter in the perpendicular direction to the magnetic field than along the parallel direction. And this allows to treat spectrally, to go to Fourier space, in the direction radial and binormal to the magnetic field line that we typically denote by X and Y. So this automatically sets a simulation domain that is quite convenient and also reduces the computational cost of the simulation turbulence in our devices that it basically consists on a box surrounded, surrounding a magnetic field line set of Lamar radii along the X and Y direction. This box that extends along the magnetic field line is what we call a flux tube. And in here, what you have is a typical simulation of what happens in this perpendicular plane that I have depicted here for an ITG uh, turbulence simulation in Bendelstein 7X. What you will find in the middle is the picture in real space, on the left in Fourier space, and on the right, the relevant quantity that we are most interested at, in, that is the ion heat flux of, of the, the ion heat flux that is lost in the, by the system in this flux tube. You will find that initially you will you have like certain bands, what we call sonal bands, and a strong destabilization of modes during what we call the linear phase. As I said before, when the nonlinear terms uh, gain a substantial size within the equation, the Vlasov of equation, then this nonlinear term makes the work to make uh, to such to lead to a saturated state and a steady state uh, value, an average value for the heat losses. But where does turbulence simulation accelerator stand? With this, I would like not to offend anyone. I'm going to try to go through several fields of research very quickly just to uh, give you a flavor where to where this field uh, stands right now. So let's start from my magnetohydrodynamics, OK? So magnetohydrodynamics is the part of the field that basically treats the plasma as if it were a conducting fluid. And it worries about uh, the macroscopic behavior of the plasma. So basically, it looks at long time scale and large spatial scales. So the advent of magnetohydrodynamics had of MHD theory dates back from the 1940s or last year after Hans Alvin predicted the Alvin waves. For accelerator, we have, for instance, very robust examples of ideal MHD codes that are uh, used basically in all accelerator laboratories in the world today, like BMEC, for instance. And at present, there are much more complex problems that are addressed in the context of tokamak research. For instance, stabilities in the edge of tokamaks like ELMS disruption are handled with nonlinear MHD models that count on numerous extensions. If we go to another big block of theory in plasmas, uh, the kinetic theory of plasma way, we already can find a comprehensive description of the propagation, absorption, and other properties of waves in magnetized plasmas in a textbook back in the 1960s of last century. Uh, the application of waves in magnetized plasmas and that this formalism goes beyond just the mere, let's say, application to heating or diagnostic design. It also accounts, for instance, for application as useful as non-inductive currents driven by cyclotron waves, the so-called ECCD, that were formulated or postulated in the 80s. And nowadays, we count on uh, countless applications in our devices that account for wave heating, ECCD, control of MSD instabilities, and tokamaks in both tokamaks and accelerators. Now, if we, if we go to neoclassical theory and transport, that is what I've called you before, that is the transport associated with the grad B drift and collision in toroidal geometry, we can find already in the late 60s with a seminal work that already characterized the transport in tokamaks, the main transport regimes in tokamak and accelerators as a function of the collisionality. Work that was led by Galef and Sekdev. Okay. We have also standard tools that are of daily use in accelerators, like the drift kinetic equation solver since the mid 80s. 
And although we have gone, I mean, with all this, I'm not saying that we don't have uh, problems to solve. I mean, we have come to very sophisticated problems that like the obtention of the complete neoclassical electric field that was necessary for the treatment of the impurity particle transport. And we have even constructed the first large stellarator uh, optimized for neoclassical transport. With all this, I'm not saying that we do not have problems to solve, but that the sophistication uh, with which we address this problem is much more complex than in the field that I'm going to treat now. When we come to gyrokinetic theory and turbulent transport, the formulation of the gyrokinetic equation, the linear and nonlinear, dates back from the late 70s and 80s of last century. Okay. Application of gyrokinetic codes for tokamak turbulence studies were not in the community until the year 2000. Actually, the stellaritos had to wait even for almost a decade more to have the first nonlinear simulation of ITG turbulence for stellaritos that were performed with the code GIM. And another milestone that points out to the importance of turbulence in a stellarator is that the record triple product that was uh, found was achieved in Vendor 7 x very recently in 2021 was actually achieved in reduced turbulence scenarios. If turbulence had not been reduced in Vendor 7 x the neoclassical optimization had not been proven. So as I say, with all this, I want you to have a flavor of what is the state or in what the state is gyrokinetic theory and simulation in in stellarator. So problems in MHD theory, kinetic theory of waves, or the classical theory are approached today within a high degree of sophistication and refining of these theories. But with regard to gyrokinetic theory and simulation, numerical codes are much less mature and has been much less exploited in stellarators. And here is where it enters the theory and simulation in the context of aerofusion. The ETAS framework was a, let's say, a program that, I mean, the acronym stands for Aerofusion Theory and Advanced Simulation Coordination that attempted to identify a series of uh, sort of urgent problems to address from the theory simulation part, okay? Among the 14 projects that were identified, uh, six of them, at least, Consider the development and exploitation of gyrokinetic codes as central attacks, which is related to the fact that I have mentioned before that turbulence is one of the fields that have entered later into the community, and particularly for stellarators. Of course, in the six CSV projects that you, you can find uh, very specific tasks to be addressed, like the Ellis transition and pedestal, the turbulence in a strongly shaped configuration, eventually with negative triangularity, all these in tokamaks, but in stellarators, what we have is something that is much less specific. That's why the TSB 13 has a mere title of stellarator turbulence simulation, because as I'm gonna show in the next slide, we had plenty of work to face for the first time. So if I had to show you or to present the stellarator turbulence simulation project, the TSB 13 project in one slide, this would be that slide. So as I said, the background is that the understanding of turbulence in the stellarator is limited in comparison to tokamaks. There are two limitations that are fundamental in stellarators. The first of them is that the computational cost of handling 3D magnetic geometry is much higher than that in tokamaks, and that the flux tube approach has certain limitations. Basically, if one follows a magnetic field line in a tokamak, uh, or let's say if we follow two magnetic field lines in a tokamak, the magnetic, let's say the geometric properties are the same. In a stellarator, they are not, essentially. And also this has made that some aspects of turbulence remain plastically unexplored in stellarators. In particular, the turbulent impurity transport, the interplay between neoclassical and gyrogenetic physics or electromagnetic simulations were practically inexistent before this project entered into the ITAS program. So we identified a series of milestones and deliverables to cover by 2025 in order to deliver to the community a well-validated set of gyrokinetic code verified against each other and compare against stellarator and 3D tokamak experiments. 
that should be able to address the interaction between the neoclassical and gyrokinetic turbulence. And we should have been capable of assessing the relative weight of neoclassical to turbulent transport in those regions where turbulence does not necessarily dominate. And we should also have time to develop reduced models. So the team is composed by nine leading experts in gyrokinetic theory and simulation that are the main developers and users of the main European accelerator gyrokinetic code. Stella, Gene, Euterpe, Gene3D, and the neoclassical code, Nosos. The members, apart from me, some of them are, will, would be very familiar to you, like Edilberto Sanchez, Jose Luis, Velasco, Michael Barnes, etc. So now going to the last block of this presentation, I'm going to show you nine of examples of what, what, we, have, what we have carried out within the TSVB 13 project going through the different letters of the on acronym. So I'm gonna start with the verification part and what I've included also the code development. As I said before, the, before the TSVB 13 was launched, there was basically essentially two codes that had performed simulations, gyrokinetic simulations for Vendesign 7X and mostly for Stellarator in general. That were, that were Gene and Euterpe. And Euterpe had weight until 2018 to perform even the first non-linear relative global gyrokinetic simulation. But right before the TSVV 13 was launched, Stella, a mixed implicit data gyrokinetic code for general geometry was delivered. So the basic feature of this code is that it employs an operator splitting and treat implicitly the parallel streaming term in the gyrokinetic equation that I've shown you before. The parallel streaming term is a term that is very strong. It weights substantially for kinetic electrons, and then it constrains pretty much the time step that you can afford in the in multi-species simulation. So with this brand new code, the first thing that we attempted following the the Tokama community example that basically performed all the verification across code for the so-called cyclone-based case, the first thing that we wanted to define within the TSV 13 project was a set of cases that could help the community to verify all the accelerator simulations in the same frame, okay? So we performed a benchmark of Stella against Jim, considering different tests, we share all the data, including the configuration details, and it has been adopted quite rapidly by other codes. So far, Gene, Stella, GX, and Aperpa has used some, if not all of these test cases, and other codes are running now simulation for this set of test cases. Another, another new player into the gyrokinetic scene was Gene3D that was delivered in 2020, shortly before the TSV 13 was launched too. It has basically the same feature of the standard gene, but it can run not only in flux tubes, but also it can consider the full flux surface of, uh, of a certain radial position, and it can also simulate re large radial extended uh, global simulations. So the radially global version of this code was benchmarked against the radially global version of gene for tokamak geometry, both linearly and non-linearly, and more recently, this code has also been compared for nonlinear simulations against Euterpe for accelerator geometry. So the agreement between the two codes is excellent. And on the same sheet, also some conclusion about the physics of these turbulent settings were also drawn. Basically, both codes found that there is a weaker turbulence localization than what had been believed before. And also the effect of the neoclassical radioelectric field on the turbulence was found to be rather weak. So with the two codes that I have mentioned before, uh, Gene Euterpe together with the, let's say, new players in the scene, Gene3D and Estella, we perform also a verification of the four codes within the TSVB 13 beyond plastic geometry, and in order to assess what it was the impact of the domain considered in linear simulations. So the comparison of all the gyrokinetic codes with participation in our project, Stella, Gene ran in flux tube and full flux surface domains, Gene3D ran in full flux surface and radially global domains, and Otelbe ran considering the full radial domain too. 
we perform linear simulations of ITG instabilities with adiabatic electrons and tonal, and we also looked at the sonar flow relaxation or the so-called Rosenbluth Hinton test for LHT and Bendelstein 7X accelerators. So we found out that in general, flux steel results converge to each other to each other and to the full flux surface and readily global simulation with increasing flux steel length. Although we found too some uh, slight differences on the on the localization and the growth rate of the most unstable nodes. Going to theory and simulation, one can see just yes, by naked eye that stellators can have very different shape and more importantly, very different geometric properties, okay? This is not the case of tokamaks where you have here above, okay? Tokamaks are essentially axisymmetric donuts, ones with more shaping than, than, than others. But stellators can even belong to different families. For instance, Bendelstein 7X is a helios, LHD is a heliotron, TA2 is a heliac, and NCSX, for instance, is a quasi-symmetric device. So another problem that we attempted and we addressed was a comprehensive process device comparison that characterized and compared all these stellator families with each other, okay? Here I'm plotting the ion heat flux as a function of the density gradient. And what we found is that the vendor sign 7X and CSX accelerators benefit from the increase of the density gradient very particularly. And actually we believe that this is the reason why the injection of pellets in vendor sign 7X has become the source of the access or the access to the high performance plasmas. At present, we are including new optimized accelerators and we are trying to explore some functional forms that tell us by means of linear parameters, um, some prediction of how the nonlinear heat fluxes will, will be. Also, we have studied the impact of the domain choice in nonlinear simulation for three different types of turbulence, also in vendors and 7X, uh, driven by the ion temperature gradient, driven also by the trapped electrons um, in the presence of a density gradient, and in the case of having a turbulence type in between both. We have confirmed that full flux surface simulations have the stabilization for, uh, obtained in linear simulations and in non-linear simulations, but we have also found that there are significant differences eventually between flux tube and full flux surface simulations particularly when the finite electron temperature gradient enter into play. Again, we have shown that turbulence is only weakly localized on the surface. Um, that is something that is in contradiction with previous simulations that have been performed in, by means of flux tube bundles. Finally, we have also addressed for the first time in Vendor Science 7X, how does the magnetic, the plasma pressure modify the electrostatic picture? Basically, when the plasma pressure becomes high, one needs to consider not only the fluctuation, the turbulent fluctuation of the electrostatic potential, but also of the magnetic field. And what we have found is that the heat flux is increases slightly for the first 1% of the scan, but it suffers a very rapid heat flux increase when the magnet, when the plasma pressure becomes above one. This is what you find in this pink curve referred to the right axis. So basically that increase of a factor of five is something that is somewhat worrisome and is something that we should see in the coming campaign as soon as vendor sign 7X increase the plasma pressure. So far beyond that range that is represented here, we have not been able, for instance, to uh, make simulations of this kind, flux tube simulation, electromagnetic flux tube simulations to converge. And this is one of the next things that we want to face. Also, one of the problems that we have looked at for the first time in Vendor Science 7X within the TSUV 13 is the problem of the turbulent impurity transport. Surprisingly, in Vendor Science 7X, in the first campaign, there was practically no impurity accumulation even though the neoclassical theory predicts a very strong accumulation in accelerators in general. The numerical prediction found that the turbulent diffusion was uh, the key player in avoiding the accumulation of impurities. And basically the size and the lack of dependency on the impurity uh, considered 
was also confirmed uh, was in agreement with the experiment. We also investigated the impact of impurities on turbulent transport in Vendasign 7X, and we found something that was quite striking, and is that the impact of impurities on heat fluxes is strongly correlated with the density gradient sign of the, of the impurity. Basically, if you have a hollow impurity density profile, you have a very strong increase in the heat fluxes, and if you have a, a peaked impurity density profile, you have a strong reduction of, of the heat fluxes. And more fundamentally than that, we see that also, depending on the sign of the impurity density gradient, you can have completely different size on the turbulent eddies and, and also on the coupling between the different species. In the case of having hollow impurity density profiles, what one finds basically is a perfect matching, almost a perfect matching of the shape of the turbulent fluctuation of the ions, of the electrons, and of the impurities. If one goes to the case with heat flux reduction, what one observes is that there is a very strong reduction in the turbulent eddies, even though we have not changed anything on the setting of the main ions, but you can see that basically the main ions are completely decoupled from quasi neutrality. Basically, they are having behaving completely different to what electrons and main and impurities are showing. And finally, if we go to the part of validation again, theory, I would like to emphasize two milestones. The first of them is the first principle multi-time scale approach that follows the Tango iterative solver. Basically, Tango is a tool that is capable of iterating the transport equations with information of the fluxes provided by Nosus for the non-classical fluxes and by Gene3D, Gene, or some reduced models for the turbulent fluxes. So this tool has been applied to a standard ECR and design 7X scenarios for different ion heating, which have resulted on a very good reproduction of the experimental observation of the ion temperature clamping that was predicted in this work by Borkin. That basically tells you that no matter how strong you hit your electrons, the transfer of the electrons to the ions and the turbulent heat losses are such that you always converge to the same ion temperature profile. And finally, we have also validated the, our codes looking at the problem of the particle transport in accelerators. Basically, neoclassical dominated plasmas uh, should exhibit very hollow density profiles, basically because the neoclassical transport, the, the neoclassical thermal diffusion near the axis is very, very strong. But, no, but in general, hollow, hollow profiles are not observed. In, in stellarators and in the particular case of Vendorsine 7 x you normally have peak, peak density profiles. So we have started the particle transport combining gyrokinetic stellar simulations, NOSOS neoclassical simulations, and a 1D neutral model. We have found that turbulence driven by finite electron and ion temperature gradient produces a particle pinch, an inward particle flux. And that pinch is responsible for the absence of core density depletion. Basically, this pinch is responsible for having a peak temperature profile. We have explored the parametric dependence of this, uh, of this pinch, and we, we have also looked at this pinch at the, in different devices. And so far we have found that is sort of a universal behavior that can be found in all the devices that I show here, including tokamaks and accelerators. So in summary, I hope that you're convinced that accelerator turbulence simulation is now in an early state of the uh, development and understanding compared to the Tokama counterparts and other fields. So what I've told today about the TSB project is basically the result from the united effort of several codes and, and researchers and that had enhanced the capacity to solve high impact problems in accelerator turbulence. So you have seen that codes are within the TSB 13 in continuous development and cross verification. Now we understand much better the stability properties in accelerators in all their diversity of configurations. The impact of the choice of reduced domain flux tube with respect to full flux surface or radially global simulation is better understood. And we have addressed some problems for the first time in Vendor Science 7X 
in particular, the particle transport problem, not only for the bag, but also for the impurities. We have also uh, carried out the first electromagnetic simulations. Uh, also, there are, I mean, and this part of the world is linked to the work done by the TIBB10. I would like also to point out that. And the computational cost of all this effort so far has been of around 180 million CPU hours so far in the supercomputer Marconi. So that's all. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. That was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. So the session is open uh, for questions and comments. For the moment, I don't see any question, but uh, I have uh, something myself. Um, something that you did not mention uh, during your talk is that um, in Estelaritos, uh, at least it was my understanding from the past that uh, there was a significant impact of neoclassical transport, mm -hmm. that it was clear, and it was optimized for wall distance of an X, for instance. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was also some interplay between neoclassical transport and uh, turbulent transport. Uh, for instance, uh, the radio electric field generated by the neoclassical mm -hmm. transport uh, mm -hmm. could have an impact on reduction of uh, turbulent transport. Can you comment on the interplay between the classical transport and turbulence transport and whether this has been also analyzed in the framework of this TSBB? Well, the, um, the effort, the, there are, let, let's say, two ways to look at this problem or the, this interaction. The first of them is, as you say, including, let's say, in the equations elements that we have, that we know they are there and are predicted by neoclassical transport. For example, the radial electric field is one of them, basically, the turbulent transport is ambipolar, but the neoclassical transport is not in, in a stellarator. So this brings you this radial electric field that is neoclassical in origin. We have put that in the simulations and we have shown that, okay, it makes the heat fluxes to reduce, but not substantially. It's not a key ingredient. It has to be rather strong. In the end, this is more or less what we are saying. We are now dealing with, we are in the era of in a classically optimized accelerator and no classical ingredients do not weight as much as in generic accelerators. But we are still including these elements, for instance, the electric field, the real electric field. But there is a second way also to look at the this question. We know that the neoclassical solution, they say the neoclassical distribution function is it should be the equilibrium distribution function for our jet kinetic simulation. So eventually, a accelerator will have a distribution function, a classical distribution function that departs substantially from the, from the Maxwellian. And we are attempting to do this within the TSB project in the next couple of years, considering not just elements that we plug into the equation just because of that, because they are there, but also we want to consider the splitting, the delta F splitting, not with a Maxwellian, but with a neoclassical distribution function. And this a bit more complex in introducing more terms in the equation. We want to face that too. Okay, thank you. And I have another question actually. Um, you mentioned the cyclone case. Mm -hmm. that, uh, you would like to proceed in a similar way for the comparison of the different codes. One of the issues uh, we had in the past with the cyclone case when it was applied to tokamak plasmas was that mm, when you had an agreement between the different codes in the cyclone case, mm -hmm. everybody gave for granted that the codes were giving the same results in all the cases. Yeah. But it turned out that the cyclone case was a case uh, rather artificial that uh, was hardly a case that you could see in a real plasma. And then the problem was that when you were trying to use these codes in real plasmas and there was some disagreement, people did not understand why that happened when in the cyclone case, everybody was in agreement. So can you please comment on how you will try to avoid this kind of uh, misunderstanding? Yeah, uh, we, we also have had this experience. I mean, where we went, to compare the codes for the first time, it was normally we go to the second base case too, even though we are straight guys. But we go to the second base case, everything works. We go to LHD, which is not too complicated. Let's say you have a very sort of a smooth uh, 
configuration and everything works. And then we move to Vendor Sign 7X. And then you start to need to touch a bit of input parameter to, to find a, a better agreement. Or let's say there are subtleties in some configuration that do not show up in others. But by going to a Vendor Sign 7X case as a, let's say, as a standard for code verification, I think that we are going to a case that is complex enough to guarantee that the simulation are gonna work in other configuration, not in that, that, that not necessarily even the same seven X like configuration. So yeah, we always have, you can always have that doubt, but I think that we are already in a rather complicated case that is Vendor Sign seven X. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I don't... I don't see any other question or comment. So what I propose is that we go to the next call. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Welcome. Then we go to the next one. It's uh, Alberto Mariani. Alberto, are you there? Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. So Alberto will talk about gyrokinetic uh, and quasi-linear simulation of jet plasmas in view of DT operation. Please share your screen. Yes. Okay, I see your screen. I see the full the screen. Slides. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alberto Mariani from Instituto per la Scienza e Tecnologia dei Plasmi CNR Milano, Italy. Uh, this talk is about uh, jar kinetic and quasi linear simulations of jet plasmas in view of DT operation. Indeed, in view of uh, jet DT operation. An extensive uh, modeling effort has been done uh, to increase the predictive capabilities of existing numerical models. We made predictions of heat and particle transport, uh, testing conditions that will be present uh, and that uh, have been also present in DT plasma as well as in future reactors. The focus of this presentation in particular is on numerical, numerical modeling by means of geokinetic simulations. We also compared the jar kinetics with reduced quasi-linear models. Um, we considered uh, several uh, um, key mechanisms that are expected, uh, expected to play a role in uh, reactors. We analyzed the I-beta regime with uh, beta close to the kinetic ballooning mode threshold. Um, modeling the, the linear and non-linear electromagnetic stabilization mechanisms uh, and uh, the effect of fast ions produced by NBI or ICRH on the transport. We analyzed the isotope dependence of the heat and particle transport when changing the main ion from deuterium to tritium and uh, its impact on temperature and density peaking. And finally, the effect of the electron temperature gradient modes, the ETGs, on the electron it transport, which is indeed important for future reactors in conditions of dominant electron heating. Uh, why there is a need of high performance, uh, high performance computing? Uh, since uh, uh, geokinetic simulations uh, are computationally heavy, uh, can be computationally heavy. Uh, geokinetic simulations, uh, uh, model micro turbulence uh, with spatial scales. Uh, of uh, from ion to electron larmor radii, they are based on drug kinetic simulations equations uh, that um, evolve uh, uh, particle distributions and in five dimensional phase space, removing the dependence on the duration of the particles around the magnetic field, and can be expensive. Indeed, they can range from uh, uh, quite cheap, um, very cheap. Uh, linear simulations uh, that uh, uh, cost uh, around one CPU hours uh, to nonlinear multiscale simulations uh, of uh, about 10 to the seventh uh, CPU hours. Um, the simulations that I will uh, show uh, have been performed on the Marconi Cineca cluster in Italy uh, with the gene code. I will present uh, uh, four topics. The first uh, is a benchmark of quasi-linear models against jar kinetic uh, simulations in deuterium and tritium plasmas, uh, considering a jet high beta hybrid uh, high performance discharge. The second is a modeling of a dimensionless isotope mass scaling experiment at jet, where um, 
And this third is uh, the analysis uh, of uh, the multi-scale electron in transport uh, for a jet uh, discharge. Finally, I will show some ongoing work on the geokinetic modeling of the isotope effect on the core ion temperature stiffness. So we made some recent jet discharges in the tritium campaign, and we um, want to compare them with older deuterium ones, uh, uh, evaluating the effect of the changing the isotope. So I start from the first topic. Uh, we consider a high performance high beta jet hybrid pulse with deuterium. These are the main uh, uh, profiles, uh, the electron density, the temperatures, uh, the rotation, uh, the impurities, uh, fast ions from MBI and uh, ICRH, the Q profile and the shape from the end of a jet to predictive simulations. We confronted the results obtained using uh, two models, uh, uh, reduced uh, quasi-linear models, Qualikits and TGLF with gene. And we also artificially changed the mass of the main ion uh, from deuterium to tritium in gene simulations and also in TGLF uh, Qualikits to investigate the effect of changing the isotope. Uh, turning to the numerical simulations, uh, the analysis has, has been done uh, at the two radii, inner one and outer one. Uh, Gene used two different uh, geometries, S-alpha to compare with uh, Qualikits and a uh, more shaped uh, Miller uh, analytical model to compare with TGLF. Collisions have been modeled with a Landau self-engined operator. Uh, the simulations have been repeated in both electrostatic and electromagnetic regime to estimate the effect, uh, stabilizing electromagnetic effects. Uh, the impurities have been considered um, um, beryllium and uh, a heavy uh, impurity uh, where we lumped together nickel and tungsten, conserving neutrality and effective charge. Then fast ions have been retained and uh, the rotation. The fast ion pressure in particular has been tuned within the error bus to stabilize the low K electromagnetic modes that produce the physically large fluxes in nonlinear simulations. And you can see how uh, here I show the growth rate and the frequency um, of uh, the maximum of the electromagnetic uh, mode. A spectrum uh, versus uh, electron beta uh, with reference fast ion pressure, with lowered uh, fast ion pressure that we chose to make uh, the, the nonlinear simulations and then without fast ions. And we see that the destabilization of the fast ion induced uh, electromagnetic modes uh, threshold um, uh, becomes larger with uh, decreasing fast ion pressure. Then I will show just an example of the linear results. This is a gene TGLF uh, comparison, gene in black, gray, and TGLF with colors, with both electromagnetic electrostatic results in deuterium and tritium. It's a lot of uh, uh, data. I will just comment the um, main results. Uh, ITG uh, microstability is found uh, at ion scales and ETG is at electron scales, um, with, uh, uh, which uh, should not contribute to nonlinear fluxes uh, given the uh, rule of thumb uh, gamma over k perp. And uh, we found a strong electromagnetic stabilization at the inner radius due to almost double um, electron beta at uh, the inner radius compared to the outer radius on the bottom with uh, an also more efficient uh, beta stabilization at uh, the inner radius. Then turn into nonlinear quasi-linear heat fluxes. Here we have the electrostatic regime on the top and the electromagnetic regime on the bottom. And we have uh, the inner radius on the left and uh, the outer radius on the right, uh, gene with markers and uh, uh, Qualikits and uh, TGLF with solid and dashed lines. Uh, I will comment the uh, most important outcome. Uh, we found a very strong electromagnetic stabilization at the inner radius 
And even without fast ions, uh, we see that the uh, electromagnetic gene results uh, have almost uh, uh, flat uh, stiffness, uh, uh, flat slope of uh, Q gyro bomb versus R over LTI uh, compared to the outer radius. And uh, where a milder electromagnetic stabilization is seen, we found a negligible anti gyrobomb effect at the inner radius, um, in, uh, increasing with increasing radius, uh, and it is not small at uh, the rotoroidal 0 0.6 uh, for the electromagnetic case. Here you see that the results for tritium defluxes in gyrobomb units uh, are smaller than the ones for deuterium. And we found for all the cases difficulties for quality linear models uh, to reproduce the nonlinear gyrokinetic results. And this is important in view of predicting uh, future plasmas in similar I beta regimes. Uh, then we tried to single out the physics ingredients affecting the anti gyrobomb behavior that uh, Gene uh, sees. And uh, just uh, if you start from the right, that is the reference. Uh, uh, simulation, uh, removing electromagnetic effects, uh, shaping uh, fast ions, then uh, removing impurities, uh, removing uh, uh, rotation, and then removing also removing also the collisions. And we see that the gyrobomb behavior only appears for the ions when removing impurities, collisions, fast ions, rotation, shear, and shaping, everything. So this is consistent, consistent with the recent literature. Uh, here I show this uh, plot from this uh, paper by Geronimo. Uh, also found in this work by Paola Mantica, uh, similar results. Uh, where several physics mechanisms are found to break the gyrobomb scaling, so namely in electromagnetic effects, uh, rotation, collisionality, kinetic electrons, uh, uh, non-pure ITG turbulence and zona float, et cetera. I turn to the second topic, that is the modeling of uh, uh, dimensionless isotope mass scaling experiment. What is that? Uh, we It's a dimensionless isotope mass scaling experiment uh, where we um, compared pure deuterium and tritium L-mode plasmas at the JET in recent uh, campaigns. Uh, these are L-modes with dominant electron heating um, conditions. Uh, and we matched between the uh, two discharges, uh, uh, dimensionless quantities like Rostar, Nustar, Beta N, Q, and T over Ti. It is found uh, that uh, there is a 28% higher scaled energy confinement time in favor of the tritium plasmas. And we try to understand why there is a, this better behavior for tritium compared to deuterium, if it could be explained by um, anti-gyrobomb uh, behavior of the turbulent fluxes. So we performed gyrokinetic uh, simulations uh, close to mid radius at rotoroidal 0.6. These are the main parameters of the gene runs for the deuterium and tritium pulses. Uh, we also uh, considered a third numerical case, uh, considering all the parameters of the deuterium pulse and just changing the isotope mass in gene to tritium, and we call it TN tritium numerical. Here I show uh, the linear eigenvalues for the three cases, deuterium, tritium, and tritium numerical. Also adding uh, uh, to the growth rate plot uh, the um, spectra of the uh, electronic flux uh, to uh, show which modes uh, con contribute, uh, linear modes uh, mostly contribute to the nonlinear fluxes. Uh, we find that microstability regime is ITG at uh, ion scales and ETG at electron scales so with ETGs that could potentially impact the nonlinear flux is based on the, the gamma over K pair quasi linear rule, but we couldn't uh, analyze the, the electron, uh, electron uh, contribution to the transport due to uh, uh, insufficient uh, computational resources for this case. Uh, we found a small but non negligible di direct isotope effect. Um, uh, so, going from deuterium to tritium numerical um, with a beneficial effect, so anti gyrobomb. 
and a larger indirect isotope effect due to other different parameters that are not perfectly matched between the two pulses. So going from tritium numerical to tritium. And QE shows the same trend. Uh, this is also found in the nonlinear fluxes, the heat fluxes on the left, the particle fluxes on the right. The main outcome on, of the nonlinear analysis is that is it is possible to match the experiment by reducing uh, the um, logarithmic gradient of the ion temperature within uh, minus 20% uh, error bars. Um, we found a direct uh, anti gyrobomb effect on the heat fluxes, so going from D to Tn, uh, that corresponds uh, to having the same fluxes in physical units. And we found that uh, the density peaking decreases with increasing isotope mass, which is expected in collisional ITG dominant turbulence according to this work by Clement and John. We also computed with Gene the transport coefficients for the three cases. We found that uh, going from deuterium to tritium, there is a reduction of the transport coefficients uh, consistent with uh, a better uh, performance uh, uh, of the tritium uh, discharge with uh, isotope scaling with smaller transport in tritium partially, partially coming directly by changing the mass in gene simulations and partly coming from small differences between uh, the other uh, dimensionless uh, parameters, Ma namely uh, the R over L and R over LT, uh, the collisionality, uh, the electron beta and the shear. We try to uh, single out which parameter makes uh, the most important contribution in this uh, beneficial effect of tritium. So we repeated the deuterium runs, uh, changing one by one uh, the key parameters, uh, uh, taking them from tritium, so the beta E, nu I, etc. And we found that there is not a single parameter that explains the lower transport levels in tritium. So it's a, a multidimensional problem in the parameter space. Then third topic, uh, this is the most computationally expensive one, uh, the gyrokinetic simulations of multi-scale electronic transport in uh, jet pulse. We started from uh, an experimental uh, um, uh, analysis made at JET uh, in recent campaigns, uh, where L modes and H modes uh, with these uh, values of uh, B0 and uh, plasma current uh, have been obtained with a heat flux scan varying ICRH power, uh, mainly uh, to heat uh, electrons. Um, so to obtain uh, different uh, points in the uh, QE gyrobomb versus R over LT um, uh, plane. We also varied the ICRH, uh, um, but we uh, it was only steady. So without modulation, we couldn't perform a radio frequency perturbative analysis to uh, estimate the local stiffness, uh, T stiffness for each uh, pulse. Um, sorry, I didn't mention the fact that uh, uh, what I will show is at uh, mid radius. And then we also varied the NBI deposition uh, to cover a T over TI range. So also to check if the ETGs uh, could make uh, could make a larger effect when T uh, is of order TI as the theory would predict. So we have only studied, just looking to the steady state, we see that there is a stiffness that is not so uh, the slope of a QE gyrobomb versus R over LT is not so steep uh, to indicate uh, ETG compatible stiffness, but it is a TEM compatible stiffness. But if we uh, restrict to the points with T over uh, equal to TI and a larger uh, QE gyrobomb, uh, we can infer a larger stiffness compatible with ETG that uh, we can call an ETG wall that uh, clamps uh, the temperature peaking. Uh, so we wanted to test the presence of uh, an ETG wall uh, simulating uh, with multi-scale simulation the uh, point in our database with uh, largest QE gyrobomb. 
We perform gene simulations, flux tube at mid radius, no linear ion scale and no linear multi scale. These were very costly just to simulate a single pulse, a single radius, single time. We needed uh, about 20 million CPU hours. We kept the real uh, electron ion mass uh, uh, ratio, uh, also in nonlinear multi scale runs, uh, realistic geometries uh, with, from AFIT, uh, collisions, uh, electromagnetic effects, and the impurities. But we had to lump the impurities in a single effective species for computational uh, reasons. I started showing the ion scale simulations uh, um, here with uh, uh, colors. Gene uh, has been compared with experiment, uh, testing the sensitivity to both R over LTI and R over LNE. We see that the ions are very stiff. Here in small plot is QI gyrobomb versus R over LTI. So this is the stiffness uh, due to ITG uh, turbulence. Um, that also influences uh, the absolute value of QE due to the fraction of the electronic flux carried by ITGs. Uh, but uh, this uh, does not change the stiffness of the electronic transport. Uh, so it is possible to match the experimental QE gyrobomb uh, by changing R over LTI within the experimental error bars, but not the stiffness uh, if we trust the stiffness of the higher um, it flux points. Then we turned to nonlinear multiscale simulation here in red, compared with the ion scale simulation in blue. On the right, you see also the uh, corresponding uh, um, spectra for the extreme uh, cases in R over LT. We see that the impact of ETGs on QE is negligible at the experimental R over LT, but becomes moderate just at a very larger uh, R over L values of the logarithmic gradient of the electron temperature. Uh, in addition, the stiffness that can be inferred from the multi-scale simulations here in red is moderate and still does not explain uh, the stiffness that uh, uh, the experimental points uh, could uh, show. So there is uh, uh, work to do to improve uh, the description, uh, the numerical description of these experiments. Finally, I will show briefly the, some work that is ongoing, um, uh, simulating the isotope effect uh, uh, when changing the isotope from deuterium to tritium in uh, uh, jet uh, plasmas. I summarize first uh, the work that has been done by Nicola Bonanomi comparing deuterium to hydrogen, just to introduce what we are doing now. Uh, in the past, uh, we obtained hydrogen and deuterium jet modes at a lower MBI power compared with uh, some uh, uh, discharges with higher MBI power. At a lower NBI power, it is impossible to detect a isotope effect, so difference in the stiffness from the deuterium uh, squares and uh, circles and hydrogen uh, stars uh, pulses within error bars, but at higher NBA power, um, hydrogen, uh, um, sorry, deuterium pulses have uh, uh, lower stiffness than hydrogen ones. Uh, this, is a, this has been explained by Jean, uh, since uh, for deuterium pulses, uh, it was found that there was a larger effect of nonlinear fast ion stabilization due to lower fast ion pressure in hydrogen uh, compared to deuterium. We want to test if the same holds comparing uh, the new pulses in tritium that we obtained in the latest campaigns uh, with the oldest one in deuterium. Uh, we want to repeat this, uh, this experiment. So we have this uh, comparing deuterium to tritium. It is a different at lower MBI power. This time, uh, we find that the tritium has a, a lower stiffness uh, compared to deuterium uh, outside experimental certainties. So it is possible to see a beneficial isotope effect of increasing the mass of the main isotope, main ion, sorry. 
and uh, the picture for the IMBI power pulses is similar to the to when comparing hydrogen to deuterium we find uh, a beneficial uh, isotope effect with uh, almost flat uh, flattish uh, um, stiffness uh, plot for the tritium we also performed some uh, very preliminary linear simulations for the uh, tritium pulse uh, for a tritium pulse uh, for the INBI power uh, cluster of data to see if uh, a fast ion can play a role for this case too. We found a large electromagnetic stabilization of ITGs uh, and also large fast ion electros both electrostatic and electromagnetic stabilizing effect. On ATGs. Therefore, there is a room for a possible role of fast ions um, in explaining the lower stiffness in tritium compared with deuterium. And the work is really ongoing now. I draw conclusions. Uh, an extensive modeling work has been performed in JET in view of DT operation and also in view of testing condition of interest for fusion uh, reactors. Uh, we modeled the particle and it transport, uh, interpreting the jet pulses, uh, uh, learning physics ingredients that will be important towards uh, reactor relevant conditions. In particular, uh, we considered I beta um, discharges and we found that it's, impo it's important accounting for electromagnetic stabilization of micro turbulence, uh, correct, including the contribution of the fast ions uh, uh, that are produced uh, by the radio frequency heating and uh, neutral beam injection. And we need them uh, to uh, uh, reproduce experimental flux levels. The isotope effect uh, to model the anti gyrobomb possible uh, beneficial anti gyrobomb effect uh, is uh, it's, uh, uh, key to include all the uh, meaningful. Uh, uh, physics ingredient in the simulation, otherwise uh, you could miss it. And uh, considering the ion electron multi scale transport, uh, I think that the main uh, um, important thing to do now is uh, um, de developing a broader database of nonlinear geokinetic multi scale simulations uh, in order to uh, better get insights in the uh, physics uh, mechanisms uh, underlying this uh, transport. And all these mechanisms are sometimes only partially included or even completely missing in, in the actual quasi-linear models that are used to predict uh, the profiles of future plasmas. Therefore, a massive work is needed to fill this gap. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. That was a very impressive amount of work. So. We go to the comments and questions. So if you have any question, please uh, raise your hand or, or write your question in the chat. For the moment, I will ask uh, something myself. I am very impressed by that figure in which you show that the stiffness in pure uh, tritium is non-existent. In a word? Uh, the last one, I think it was the last one. Uh, yes, uh, here, I, I think that uh, Okay, this, uh, uh, this is ongoing work. We, we have uh, the uh, discharges that we already uh, included in the plot seem to have uh, almost vanishing stiffness. It is possible that we couldn't have a larger uh, um, R over LTI uh, pulses that we had in the previous analysis that could point uh, to a little bit larger stiffness, but uh, uh, we have to start from here. And then with the nonlinear linear kinetic simulation, we try to guess what is uh, what is uh, happening. Okay. Yeah, because even for the deuterium, you see they are very flat yes. the trend, except the very last point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here you, you have uh, more points in uh, with larger R over LTI for the tritium. For the duty, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I have uh, another question because uh, you have uh, shown uh, several effects that can play a role on the isotope effect. So, and again, for the audience, uh, the clarification on the isotope effect, we refer to the fact that the heat transport decreases with increasing ion mass rather than the other way around as expected. 
So my question to you is uh, whether you think we, that we have absolutely understood the isotope effect in any conditions or still we might find surprises. Oh, th th this is difficult to answer. <laughs> um, I think that the, the simulation that uh, we performed seem uh, to, uh, all the simulation that uh, I performed for uh, uh, JET, um, um, H modes and L modes in the core um, with uh, non-extreme uh, conditions uh, tend to point to the presence of a mild uh, uh, anti gerbom effect with fluxes that are almost equal in uh, um, in uh, physical units uh, coming from uh, a, a mix of these uh, uh, effects. Uh, so, so the, my perception is that uh, we, we probably, and it, it is possible to reproduce the experimental uh, fluxes in all the cases that uh, I analyzed. So the, my intuition could be that for these cases in the core, we probably, we are probably able to predict also similar future discharges in similar parameter conditions. I never um, simulated uh, uh, plasmas uh, very close to the edge, so maybe there could be some uh, some um, new mechanisms to to learn. But but there are there are papers that are piling up in the literature about uh, the isotope effect uh, in the edge. So it's it's just uh, I think. Uh, uh, a less uh, known uh, piece of uh, physics that uh, is being uh, analyzed now. So. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, in this list of effects, uh, something that is not here, but uh, you were talking after that, was the multi-scale. Do you think multi-scale effects could have an impact on the acid effect? Uh, this this is tricky. Maybe yes. Uh, but uh, uh, it could uh, okay direct multi-scale effects on the isotope effect could come from uh, uh, backwards uh, uh, like inverse uh, cascade effects of um, of electron scales to ion scales. Th this could be possible. I I, I don't know. It it, uh, it would need really uh, maybe to be understood. Uh, to first implement uh, in a better way um, multi-scale effects in uh, reduced models, uh, since uh, it would be uh, difficult to do this uh, kind of analysis uh, uh, with multi-scale nonlinear simulation, if impossible, because you have uh, to single out uh, effects of a single physics um, uh, ingredients with a simulation that costs you 10 million CPU hours. So probably we need uh, really a work uh, of um, expanding our uh, reduced modeling knowledge of uh, multi-scale effects first. Okay. And uh, the last question is, uh, since we are in a conference a workshop about HPC, do you think that the models that we have now for general creative simulations, or even if you want reduced models, they are mature enough to uh, predict the physics, or at least the core physics that we could have in ITER? Mm, okay, this is even more, more difficult to... Uh, I think that in most of the conditions, uh, yes. The only... Uh, uh, th there could be some caveats. There could be some caveats uh, that... Uh, okay, for example, uh, from the ether will be electron heated. So uh, from uh, principle, first principles, uh, from uh, what is implemented in the actual codes, for example, uh, drug kinetic uh, codes, they account for uh, um, just restricting to multi-scale to start uh, effects. But uh, it is uh, impossible to uh, model an entire uh, ether discharge with multi-scale flux-driven simulation. So uh, the physics is there, but uh, you cannot uh, use it uh, to model uh, real discharges. 
So th this is from the multi-scale point of view uh, um, uh, topic, sorry. Then uh, there, one, some... yeah, there is a question on the chat that is linked to this, for instance, because uh, Alexei Michenko is asking, fast titles can interact with Albany modes, which we could expect in ITA, for instance, from the alpha particles. So is that important in your simulation? Is, is this interaction between the fast ions and alvenin modes important in your simulations, which is a physics that we will need for ITER it predictions? Yes. yes, I think that this is a, an, an another topic uh, that is uh, very important to study and also going towards uh, uh, DT operation for the, in, in ITER, there is a lot of physics that uh, has to be tested in, uh, for example, uh, I think that the analysis of the JET DT experiments that will uh, go on uh, during these years will um, allow us to learn a lot of physics that will be needed to uh, predict uh, ITER discharges. The effect of uh, interaction of fast ions uh, induced uh, um, uh, modes um, with uh, alvenic uh, 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 modes and uh, zonal flows uh, uh, is uh, being studied uh, and uh, it, it is being modeled uh, confronting uh, with uh, actual experiments but there are uh, a lot of um, things to improve uh, also mm -hmm. regarding uh, for example uh, high energy fast ions uh, um, I don't think that for uh, Cases where fast uh, where uh, alvenic eigenmodes are radially uh, uh, elongated, uh, th th there is uh, still uh, room to improve our understanding. But uh, uh, the most uh, uh, okay, also including uh, um, mesoscale uh, um, structures uh, uh, that could be uh, only captured by flex driven approaches uh, with full f uh, uh, full f uh, uh, distribution functions so yes there are things that could uh, could be important if uh, in cases like in ether that are close to marginal stability of course so also these uh, multi scale uh, ion scale to uh, equilibrium um, uh, effects could be important and we have to study them. Okay, just uh, from my side, answering specifically the question by Alexei, asking whether the, the interaction between the fast ions and alvenin modes is important in these simulations. I think that in this, uh, in the plasmas you analyze, there are no specific alvenin modes uh, to consider. I mean, there were not plasmas in jet developed to have other modes in most of these plasmas. Okay, so that is all. Thank you very much, Alberto. That was very nice. And I think that uh, since I don't see any more questions or comments, we can close it this session. Thank you to Thank all you. of you. And uh, see you in the next session. So yeah, for those who are staying here, I will introduce the next speaker, who is Alvaro Lopez Cazalilla from the University of Helsinki. So, hi, Alvaro. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, so the floor is yours. Okay, let me share the screen and hopefully everything goes fine. Uh, can you see the full screen mode? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thanks a lot for, for accepting my abstract and, and let me present a part of our result here in, in this nice conference. Uh, well, the title of the presentation is Mechanisms of Bubble Growth and Blistering on Metals Exposed to, to Hydrogen. And this is a work done in collaboration with, with CERN. Um, I will uh, start uh, with a brief introduction to the topic, give a bit of context of what we are doing here, uh, focusing on the dislocation behavior and the influence of, of, of the surface uh, orientation in the in the blistering uh, effect then i will move how on, on how we approach this problem in our lab uh focusing of course in the in the role of 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 of, of the surfaces and also introducing uh, a newly developed uh, machine learning interatomic potential um well 
uh, as probably most of you know, blistering is is a quite detrimental effect in metals when they are exposed to light species. Uh, this happens to many of them in many conditions, for example, in aluminium, iron, or steel. But also it's observed in, in, in niobium. Uh, okay, probably someone is with uh, open mic, but yeah. So it also happens in, in, in niobium. Uh, also in some conditions, titan titanium has shown a good behavior uh when uh, when it's exposed to, to hydrogen fluence of course this is happening as well in in, in tungsten uh when it, it's exposed to hydrogen or, or helium and it's one of the of the bottlenecks of of the future nuclear power plants this happens with be, besides of uh, despite of 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 its superior properties as uh, as you probably as you probably know and also it's happening in copper, which is uh, a main candidate for, for uh, accelerator devices, uh, which is the, the field that my, my well, in our group uh, are focusing. Um, you can guess that uh, the solubility is, is crucial in, in this phenomenon, as, as it is the temperature or the fluence, the conditions of, of, of the exposure of, of the metal. Um, but uh, what is observed experimentally, uh, this is how how we when we took uh, the sample and we cut it and observed it under uh, microscopy, is, is is how it looks. Uh, for example, here uh, we can see a big blister, which is quite noticeable here. But we also see some small ones and some initiation sites. And what we we see is that uh, this deformed region. Uh, between these bubbles and the surface affect the mechanical response of the material. Well, uh, we use some co uh, computational approaches to 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 address this uh, this issue. Uh, just to um, acknowledge some work done in the past, uh, there, there there were some recently some well, recently two years ago uh, some some work in copper as well, uh, where they observe the emission of these small prismatic loops uh, using tiny bubbles of helium. Uh, we went further on this. Uh, we use, of course, we, we use hydrogen, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning. Um, we observe the emission of uh, these prismatic loops uh, at different uh, uh, hydrogen concentrations. Uh, as you can see here in the in the corner in the bottom corner uh, left, uh, we identify different uh, regimes uh, as a function of of the number of hydrogen per vacancy in the bubble. Uh, up to two point five, more or less hydrogen per vacancy, we observe an elastic response of the material. But when we overcome this this number, the the the, the regime is not is not plastic anymore, and we observe the emission of these shear loops around the bubble. Uh, here in the blue line, you you observe the the in the the hydrogen density inside the bubble, uh, while the this red line represents the the, ra the radius of this spheric bubble, and you see the change how how the slope change the slope changes with uh, increasing the the concentration of hydrogen, uh, but only at the end of this uh, uh, of this graph we observe the the, the prismatic uh, loop punching. Uh, how this happens? Well, initially some shear loops uh, uh, appear surrounding the bubble, and they they join together to create this this prismatic loop that uh, you can identify the different the different prismatic loop uh, uh, shear loops. Uh, forming it. Then, uh, when we look at the at the at the experiments, we see that these blisters and the productions that are forming the surface uh, are different uh, depending on the orientation of, of of the grain. So, to model that, we use molecular dynamics and um, and well, here are some computational details of the simulations that. Uh, uh, that we used, we have a, a quite robust potential for copper, uh, which predicts the the mechanical properties uh, of of copper quite quite accurately. Uh, and also, we extract this hydrogen, the hydrogen part of 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 other EM potential, 
uh, used for metals, but uh, due to the lack of, of a good uh, interatomic potential for hydrogen and copper, we use partly repulsive, which in, in, in the next slides, I, I will cover this topic a bit, a, a bit more. Uh, we know the, the, the limitations of molecular dynamics, so we need to find a way to, to simulate this, uh, fulfilling these conditions. So what we did is introduce uh, a, with a low pace, basically a di uh, directly some, some amount of hydrogen and see the response of the material, extracting information about the stress, um, of course, uh, uh, following the dislocations and, uh, and the pressure inside of, of the bubble. Uh, in different conditions, and based on the experiment, on the experiments, we simulated two types of of bubbles. As you can see here in the uh, in this image, we use uh, one uh, one disc or cylindrical shape uh, bubble, and also one hemispherical. And we also open the surface of of these of these cells in one o o one 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 and one one o direction. Uh, so after about 100 picoseconds, when the system is already relaxed after inserting this this amount of hydrogen, uh, we we check the cell, and what we observe is that the uh, different protrusions are uh, are created at the surface. Uh, for this 100 uh, surface, we we observe these squared shapes. Uh, in the 111, uh, the Mostly a triangular shape is observed in the in the surface, but in in one one o we clearly observe the, this rhomboidal shape. Uh, we also see that uh, this uh, the effect of of this flat uh, surface of the bubble in the in the surface the, the productions are are clearer, and um, we can go uh, and compare directly uh, to the experiments. Of course, uh, even. The projection of the bubbles in our simulations uh, in the surface are large. We cannot directly compare uh, with with the blisters of, of uh, experimentally. There are order of magnitudes uh, of difference, but we can learn something out of that. Uh, we can even see some features, for example, for example, in this one one o that uh, surface that they have almost rhomboidal shape quite quite clearly. In one o o the shapes are uh, sort of square. Of course, we, we see some coalescence of, of blisters here. Uh, it's not that clear in the 111 surface, but uh, but uh, still we get information on how the, the surface is affected with our simulations. Uh, in our MD simulations, we see that uh, 110 surface is the first uh, yielding. Uh, uh, as the effect of the bubble, but experimentally is not what it what happens. Uh, we took the sample uh, at the out of of, of the chamber, uh, some at different fluences, and we observed that the at relatively low fluences, only the one or o surface is is the the one that is blistered. Uh, so we need to find other uh, other reason uh, or, or other method to explore why why this is happening. Uh, that that's why we we use MD range. MD range is an MD approach that uh, that is specifically designed uh, for these high energy interactions. Uh, typically, uh, Monte Carlo or BCA methods are, are used for that, but uh, conventional codes do do not consider the crystallographic direction uh, itself. Uh, so uh, I, I know that there are some nowadays that that, that do that, but but uh, we, we use MD range for this. I'm trying to find an explanation for, for this uh, retardation of blistering in, in, in the other two grains. Uh, when we look at the uh, hydrogen range uh, in the different uh, crystallographic directions, we see that hydrogen accumulates quite similarly in 100 and 111 uh, directions, but there's a, there's a Bragg peak here for 110 which basically is observed as well uh, at low fluences uh, experimentally that here, for example, you see this 111 grain and 100, uh, here is the grain boundary. 
and they are sort of we observe these initiation sites at the same depth here is not that clear but uh, but uh, if one carefully look at the scale of this you see that they are deeper in the surface um well uh we compare with uh, our in-house uh, bca code and we notice that uh, the distribution of recoils and vacancies uh, uh in uh, at when, when we use this 45 kilo electron volt uh, hydrogen in copper, uh, the distribution is almost similar. Uh, there are a, a small shift be, between them. Uh, unfortunately, in MD range, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, obtain the, the vacancy distribution, but we can uh, indeed uh, calculate the recoil formation. Uh, and we did the follow, uh, what, what you see here. Uh, Considering our results, we uh, filter those th those recoils that uh, uh, have uh, we 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 took out those those recoils with uh, energy lower than forty eV, which is approximately uh, the the energy needed to create a vacancy. And we observe uh, when we plot together the the hydrogen depth profile and the number of re of recoils as a function of of depth. That for the one o o grains uh, uh, orientation, uh, uh, these peaks are relatively close. Uh, but uh, when we look at, for example, one one one, these blue uh, blue markers and blue lines, we see that the 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 vacancies or or the recoils are created quite uh, quite close to the surface. But uh, the hydro hydrogen accumulates uh, deeper in the bulk. And this difference is is uh, is even larger for for one one o. We see that again uh, the vacancies are created closer to the surface compared to one o o. But uh, as I mentioned before, the hydrogen accumulates deeper in the in the in the bulk. So basically, this explains that uh, wh why exists this this. Uh, this delay in the blister formation in these two grains compared to one OO, it, it takes more fluence or time to to for, for the hydrogen to to get into these vacancies that eventually creates these these big blisters. Uh, as you may notice, uh, that there are some gaps uh, in the process from from the beginning, uh, from the initial irradiation and the creation of these small defects. Uh, to the final uh, to the to the formation of the final blisters uh, so what what we what 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 we propose here uh, is is a a new machine learn interatomic potential that we have uh, recently developed uh, the need for this is that the partly repulsive interaction uh, will not allow us to to observe much of the interaction between of hydrogen with the dislocations, for example. Um, and as well, there are other uh, potential available for, for, for this, but uh, but it has uh, a, a quite highly attractive part of hydrogen in respect to copper. So it's not uh, it will not provide uh, a, a realistic result for this bubble growth. So uh, we choose uh, this Gaussian approximation potential formalism in the tabulated form, which was developed by Jesper Bigmaster Big at the at our lab, uh, which allows a faster uh, per performance of the potential with almost a DFT uh, precision. Um, just to mention that we work on a on a copper potential that wa that was developed using this formalism in the lab by by Aslak Feldman. Uh, let me give you some some details of how this work. So we create different uh, uh, different stru uh, structures for the data set, and we put them to to DFT. We use BASP, and we obtain energy forces and burials of of this. Of course, one needs to to be careful with with this. Uh, for example, in, in in hydrogen, for the hydrogen copper interaction, we of course start with one hydrogen in the cell. Uh, we locate it at different uh, positions. We rattle the cell as well, just to mimic the effect of the temperature, uh, and also for for the code to 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 be more precise in the in the prediction of or, or, or 
better said in the in the performance of, of the potential and we start step by step adding hydrogen of course in the meantime as you see here this almost 70 percent of the structures are uh, minimize adjust structures that means that you create a potential you minimize the structure if this structure is not well predicted so also this this uh, this algorithm this uh, machine learning code would will just learn from uh, from its mistakes so we do that and after that uh, we... so, sorry Edward, you have a couple of minutes yes yes i'm, I'm just finishing uh, we did some performance tests, uh, just sanity checks for for seeing that that the copper is not uh, the the copper part of or, or the copper properties are not affected by inserting hydrogen, and we see that the the stacking the stacking fall energy is is comparable to DFT. Also, the the barrier of of uh, the hydrogen atom uh, moving from a tetrahedral position to a tetrahedral position is is well predicted. Uh, even uh, much better than the the all the this bond order potential that is the only one that is so far available for for this study <laughs> and most importantly this absorption energy uh this absorption energy uh well uh, we see that our potential predicts it uh quite close to dft uh and this is is important because dft says that no more uh, is not energetically favorable that more than six uh, hydrogen uh, atoms are uh, yeah. fit in a in a vacancy. So you see here how this uh, absorption energy changes if you look at the blue symbols, changes from from negative to positive. Here, of course, there are some uh, some fluctuations here, but uh, but the trends are are good for this and. This is just a result that, and a couple of days ago, well, it, it, actually the simulation is still running, but uh, basically here we create a, a vacancy cluster and we start to introduce uh, hydrogen inside, and we can follow how the pressure increase with this, and we are just uh, working on that. This is a fast simulation that I wanted to include in the presentation for that. Um, and yeah, that that uh, was all. These these are the conclusions of, of the presentation. That uh, our simulations, uh, we clearly see that the atomistic uh, mechanisms of of bubble and blister growth are, are under hydrostatic uh, internal hydrogen pressure uh, uh, are dependent on the surface orientation, as you saw in the in the first set of results that I presented. Um, and we found an explanation for this delay in the formation of blisters in some grains, uh, in some grain orientations. Uh, and yeah, and this ma machine learning potential uh, will help us to understand some of the processes that are not available experimentally and we could uh, easily check with, uh, with, uh, with it. So uh, well, these are the references, but but uh, thanks so much for for your attention. Okay, so thanks, Alvaro, for the talk. The room is open for for questions. If you have any, use the chat or raise your hand. Okay, we we have one popping up. So thank you, Alvaro, for any simulation with open boundaries. Mm -hmm. That works very well. However, I wonder if your simulation for copper with bubbles can handle some lack of surface formation that is needed for the description of the of the interface between the vacuum and the material. Mm. Yeah, uh, we haven't tried that, but uh, probably it's a good idea to to try and check how how it uh, how it behaves. Of course, we, we introduced we used uh, uh, different surfaces for. Uh, or of course, if if, if we have a bubble, uh, we we need to consider uh, the 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 different surfaces of of of, of copper. Uh, I haven't tried, but uh, of course that's a that's a good idea to try and see if it works. Of course, if not, we can take the structure and train a new potential for that. So, so thanks thanks a lot for for the question. Okay, so actually I have a question in that line. So are you training the, the potential on the fly? Because you say that you check 
the new structure with the potential and depending how good it is, you retrain with DFT, right? So do you have like any kind of extrapolation factor or something like that? Or how does it work? Uh, well, basically is uh, the process is 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 like that. This, uh, well, machine learning is good interpolating, but not uh, not really good at extrapolating. So that that's why we need to go really really high on on the on the data set for this because uh, well, according to my experience, how the process went here, uh, just uh, for example, this absorption energy it, it uh, that that I presented here, uh, considering only up to six hydrogen uh, in the data set in different configuration, of course, rattling the cell and so on. Uh, it was not entirely correct. Only when we went up to nine, uh, it, it started to, to behave uh, more or less correct. Uh, then other thing that uh, that we we also may, that we had a problem with was that inserting hydrogen at some point uh, the, the the elastic properties of copper went a bit crazy so we need we needed also to uh, in this energy volume curves uh, we need to overfit some regions to fix that so basically we, uh, yes it's learning on, on the fly as, as 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 we are learning too so uh, i don't know if this answer your your question or, or... yeah yeah Okay, so very good. Thank you very much yeah. Alvaro, for this nice talk. I think it's time to move on. We are a bit yeah. over time. Yes. So we go to the last talk of today, which is given by Anthony Sheen from General Atomics. Yes, uh, let me unshare because I don't see where can I unshare. So it should be like on the bottom, yes. you should have yes. some I'm sure, yeah. Okay, sorry. So all right, thank you. I'll share my screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak on my work uh, on leveraging this computing to support DCD operations through uh, profile analysis and kinetic equilibrium reconstruction. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging all my co-authors. Uh, this is a uh, collaboration between us at General Atomics and several other institutions, including Columbia University, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. <clears throat> For this, um, for this talk, I will start by giving uh, everyone some background and context on the super facility concept and also the workflow, kinetic equilibrium workflow that we're implementing. Uh, and then I'll move on to talk about the process of moving uh, this workflow to nurse computers and the profiling and optimization works that we did. And then finally, I'll present some preliminary results and performances uh, about this code. Uh, <clears throat> workflow that we have implemented on supercomputing, uh, on supercomputers at NERSC. Okay, so the NERSC DCD super facility was established to provide timely analysis for decision-making uh, in the control room. The super facility concept aimed to combine the experimental devices to cutting edge HPC facilities. Uh, our, project in, our project in particular links the DCD National Fusion Facility in San Diego to the NERSC Computing Center at um, <clears throat> at Berkeley, California. It also seeks to demonstrate the fe feasibility of super facility for future devices and different uh, supercomputing centers. Uh, we have some uh, previous experiments from HPC projects that guided our efforts. There was a um, effort several years ago to run a code called SurfMN at the Argonne Leadership National uh, Argonne Leadership Computing Facility in 2017. So FMN is analysis for 3D perturbation, magnetic perturbations, and island width calculation that was used for ELM and ELM suppression experiments. It was run uh, for about 200 plasma shots with potential to inform in sh between shot coil decision for these ELM suppression experiments. The experimental scheduling was found to be a concern and computing needed to pre be pre-reserved 
which influenced our decisions to um, use the inert real-time queue, which, which was very uh, available and can be used whenever uh, at request, essentially. <clears throat> So uh, a little bit about kinetic equilibria. It is essentially a foundational step to many fusion uh, analysis workflows, especially in the tokamak world. Uh, kinetic equilibria is a uh, magnetic equilibrium that is enhanced by internal constraints based on uh, profile measurements and uh, <clears throat> current, uh, uh, for example, pedestal current modeling. It is a basis for a variety of first analysis, such as MHD stability analysis, uh, transform models, and geodic kinetic simulations. <clears throat> At DCD, we have a pre-existing workflow the, uh, called CAKE that generates automatically kinetic equilibria, uh, equilibriums implemented in a framework called ONFA in Python. It <clears throat> essentially takes the data and the initial uh, equilibria, which is does not have uh, internal kinetic constraints. We take that, uh, we filter the data, we map it to profiles, we generate kinetic constraints, and we generate the EFIP. And then we optimize for better uh, error convergence, and then this process is repeated again so that it could be mapped onto a kinetic uh, equilibria for the profiles, and this ties together various codes such as 1, 2, and EFIP for the final uh, result. <clears throat> Uh, this will work fairly reliably and was available at DCD for about three years previous to right now. However, it is fairly slow and uh, generally was uh, only a after experiment sort of uh, tool. And uh, in our projects uh, right now uh, for NERSC, our goal was to make it much faster so that you can uh, inform control room sort of um, concerns. But before uh, that, we, what we did, we, another thing we did was to make adjustment to the cake uh, profile fitting to make it uh, applicable to a um, broader range of applications. One of the key things that we looked at was that uh, the interest to calculate ER, so radio E field in the tokamak uh, from our profile fitting. So we made additional adjustment in the fitting method using a smooth smoothing spline method that has incorporates a sort of a, a, a cost function on the curvature of the fit, which made it more robust uh, when applied to the rotation profile fitting. And we were able to get a fairly good uh, set of ER calculations, especially the a consistent ER well location for the plasma shot that we're, we were quite pleased about. And then I'll talk about uh, our effort to move all this workflow to the nurse computers and make it faster. Um, so the cake workflow has been adopted to nurse computing. Uh, and part of that is the automatic triggering system where the DCD system automatically triggers the workflow when the data is available after each shot. Cake itself primarily runs on nurse computers via what's called the real-time queue to ensure uh, we have available computing whenever we request it. Uh, <clears throat> Cake and OFA will uh, fetch data from DCD's MDS Plus database, as well as run data packaging routines on DCD computers that will return package data files to uh, the Cake workflow. And the results are automatically uploaded to the same uh, DCD MDS Plus database upon completion. <clears throat> So we did all, uh, once we moved it over to Nest Computing, we started doing a lot of work to uh, uh, <clears throat> optimize and parallelize the workflow to, for it to um, shorten the runtime. As you can see in the plot on the left-hand side, we started with a benchmark runtime of about 50, <clears throat> 53 minutes for a reference shot. And, um, decrease that to about 11 minutes for the same reference uh, shot over the course of this year's work. And that was um, uh, due to a lot of work in parallelization and streamlining logic. In particular, uh, we started by removing redundant data fetching and preparation routines within the uh, workflow. Uh, and then we move on to some initial, uh, initial parallelization effort. Um, <clears throat> Some of the speed gains were lost when we moved over to Perlmutter, which is a different computing cluster at the same computing center uh, due to the previous computer being retired, Corey, that is. Um, 
the pro and but that was mostly recovered by uh, using pro market specific adjustment to the Q behavior to account for the Q behavior. From there, we expanded on the parallelization and then move on to the reduce re, reduce the dependence on slurm calls and parallelized fi file loading, which improve our uh, performance further. A lot of this <clears throat> this work uh, in optimization were done correspond to various profiling effort to essentially identify the bottlenecks in the code execution. And that was <clears throat> a very useful experience for any future work that we're looking to do with the sort of uh, optimization. From there, we also develop a new visualization tool to supplement existing tools. We have uh, our data in the uh, MDS Plus database can be visualized use pre-existing tools such as Review Plus and EPIV Viewer, but we also develop these new tools to be more forward-looking, to have a modern interface, and to be uh, IMAX compatible if in the future we were to use same similar tools to uh, look at other machines that's not DCD specific. Finally, I will present some uh, of the preliminary results and performances of this routine. The Cape workflow was run for the previous DCD campaign you know, on an automatic basis between shot. Uh, the last DCD for the last DCD campaign, about 550 shots were completed successfully. Of, uh, of approximately 20,000 time slices uh, completed <clears throat> that was produced, approximately half of them were able to reach a convergence error, numerical error of lower than 10 to the negative eight, which is typically desirable for MHD stability analysis if they use this as uh, as the input. The results are stored in MDS Plus and can be used for follow-on workflows both at nurse computing facilities and at DCD local clusters. We anticipate due to being able to reach the between shot timing for the upcoming campaign uh, that is uh, starting next year around April or May currently. So uh, the cake results were uh, compared to some of the <clears throat> previously available sort of equilibria. For example, when we benchmarked against the EFIT O2 outputs in MPJ stability calculation. So EFIT O2 is essentially an equilibria that is generated from magnetic constraint and MSC measurements only without internal profile measurements. Uh, so the cake results show that the global uh, stability, MHD stability has not changed significantly, but the local tearing drive changed from destabilizing to stabilizing, reflecting the actual plasma behavior for the shot, which was stable and did not uh, disrupt or generate uh, MHD, MHD instabilities. Further, we move on to using TGLF to examine a database uh, of 1,650 manually, uh, manually made kinetic equilibria made by various scientists at DCD and compare them to the cake automatic results for the same shots and times. So the TGLF uh, mode identification routine found that the, the database of cake and manually made uh, kinetic equilibria have very similar breakdowns of modes. Um, <clears throat> which make us uh, fairly optimistic about the, its performance relative to uh, the sort of the database applications. <clears throat> Some of the cake results has already contributed and, <clears throat> and be, been featured in, in uh, publications. The cake batch results, for example, show preliminary MTM identification in plasma jogging experiments, which was confirmed later was uh, more uh, hands-on analysis and refined. Uh, and this was published in 2011 by Nelson et al. Uh, more recently, for the last negative, last campaign on DCD, where there was a lot of focus on negative triangularity, the blue uh, uh, stability modeling with kick results finds that the infinite end ballooning stability mode uh, prevents the elms in negative triangularity plasmas. So on the plot in the right, for example, each dot represents a different time slice that was produced by cake on a sort of database scale. Uh, so this was also published by Nelson et al. this year in PRL. So uh, for future work, uh, we are looking to continue to streamline the cake workflow to improve on its speed and performance. We're looking to automate the follow-on workflow so that uh, you don't have you don't need scientists to uh, manually initiate those anymore. So we can run those on a, a database sort of uh, basis as well automatically. 
uh, <clears throat> we want to take advantage of the Department of Energy Integrated Research Infrastructure Initiative to diversify our uh, HP centers where we uh, can run on, essentially to put our workflows and our codes onto Oak Ridge and also Argonne National Lab also. Uh, we are looking to incorporate other devices and workflows. For example, we are in discussion with KSTAR to possibly uh, have some sort of collaboration to uh, process their, um, their results also. And we're interested in hearing from the community as far as what else that they would like to um, accelerate and take advantage of the high performance computing centers that uh, the DOE operates. And that is my presentation. I would like to acknowledge the Department of Energy and Office of Science, Office of Fusion Energy Sciences for their support as well as the Office of Advanced Computing research and I'm uh, open to questions and comments, please. Thank you. Okay, so thank you Sichuan, for the talk. The floor is open for discussion. You can write on the chat or raise your hand as usual. If not, I have I have a question. Yes. You, you say in the end that's okay, all these workflows, they are designed to minimize the amount of, you know, human or handwork that you have to put yes. in space, no? But how, how resilient is your workflow manager? I mean, for example, if something, if one node in the cluster crashes or dies, mm -hmm. is smart enough to, to know what happened or if a job runs out of memory, is it possible to resubmit with you know, more nodes or if, I so mean, how currently, So currently the code is not very resilient to sort of uh, computing um, issues, uh, let's say. So the first uh, on the first level, we have been focusing to its robustness to sort of physics differences and data quality, for example. And a lot of the next step of work that we plan is to look at the sort of robustness to compute, um, you know, availability, for example. A lot of the integrated uh, research initiative, infrastructure initiative works that we plan for the future has to do with robustness of failovers to other computing facilities, for example. So right now that each shot is essentially an individual job. So essentially, if there was a failure of a particular compute node or something like that, it will basically kill that particular shot's analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, we look to uh, in, you know improve the robustness of this. And um, do you have any checkpointing or if, the job dies, you have to start from the from the beginning. No, we do not have checkpoint at this point. Mm -hmm. That okay. is also that is also something that we're looking to do in the future. Okay. And then I also imagine that okay, when you make these workflow managers, they are designed as a lightweight tool to handle expensive simulations, right? Could you imagine a scenario in which you're running on a big mm -hmm. X scale computer? And mm -hmm. you are submitting so many jobs that the workflow manager could even become a, a bottleneck, right? So can you imagine any, have you reached that limit so far or can you see where, where it can arrive more or less? Right, right, yes. So uh, essentially we're envisioning largely two modes of operation. For example, when we run a joint experiment, for example, when DCD is taking shots, we're automatically triggering this analysis workflow, but because of DCD shot timing, typically requiring 15 minutes between shots, we we typically just only have one to two jobs live on the queue at, a, at any given time when we're running in this way. So we don't really ever run into that sort of problem. However, there is also an effort to um, to establish this different mode of operation where we go back into the DCD database for past data and we reprocess all that past data in sort of a, for database studies. And those can potentially run into this problem that you're describing. Uh, that is, uh, so we're actually right now considering strategies to deal with that mostly, but mostly have to do with that. Um, we're trying to essentially reduce when we're running in that mode, the, the specific timing uh, and speed of operation becomes less critical. 
So we're we are ma essentially making adjustments so that when we run it that way, we are much less dependent on the queue. So that each shot essentially is just one job. Once you submit it, it does not interact with the queue anymore. It just runs on its own node. So um, that's the direction we're going with for that um, application. Okay, and do you run the manager on your laptop or are you run it directly on the cluster? Um, so the automatic triggering is just handled by the DCD data taking system itself. So when DCD digitizes all the data from the diagnostic, after it's done, it will automatically trigger the a workflow. So there's no management needed from the scientists in particular. However, the database runs that, uh, that I was describing would be managed from a, a laptop or, or any computer that's connected to the network, really. Okay, very good. So I don't see any questions in the chat and I think we are already over time. So I think it's time to finish for today. Thank you Shichuan, for the nice talk and thanks to all the speakers of the session and of the day actually, and to all of you for being around. And we are starting tomorrow again at 9 a.m. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening or afternoon, wherever thank you, you are and see you tomorrow. Thanks. Good evening, bye. Okay. Um, yeah, I will just start right away. I hope you can hear me. Hear me. Um, so I will present to you the um, topic of the comparison of the numerical flow iteration to the Lagrangian and semi-Lagrangian schemes for the Vlasov system. And here are the numerical, numerical flow iteration is the solver that we are using. Um, and uh, oh, sorry. I will start by going over the Vlasov Poisson equation. Uh, then I will um, go over the problems that arise um, and therefore motivate the solver that we are using, Luffy. I will introduce you to the numerical experiments that we did and um, then wrap up my presentation with a conclusion. Um, so, yeah, let's start with the Vlasov Poisson equation. So, it is a simplified model for the evolution of plasmas in their collisionless limit, um, as for example, used in uh, nuclear fusion devices. And so what you can see here is the, um, the model with uh, F being our electron or ion distribution functions. Um, and we are accounting for the relativistic terms. We will neglect the magnetic fields, but of course account for the electric fields um, neglect the collisions and the equations below cover the field, the char uh, charge density and the potential to our distribution functions where here F ion and F electron only differ by the temperature on mass and mass used for the computation. Um, so the main issues when uh, trying to solve this equation numerically is um, of course, first of all, the curse of dimensionality. So if we um, are in a three-dimensional space, we will um, have a seven-dimensional partial differential equation. And although this is possible with high-performance computers, um, it's not really what we want to achieve and from both the computation time, but especially a memory usage point of view, this um, becomes really expensive. And so even if that would not be the issue, um, as you can see here, this is our distribution function F, uh, we have filaments de uh, developing in the solution over time, and they manifest themselves as these oscillations. So th this is for T equals to 30 and T equals to uh, 100. And as you can see, we get this really steep gradients in our solutions, and they are practically uh, impossible to resolve with conventional methods. And these conventional methods will then also violate the conversation properties, which is not what we, um, yeah, what we want. And so this motivates the implementation of NUFI, the numerical flow iteration. And the main idea is that the distribution function F at uh, time step T can be represented as the initial distribution function. 
evaluated um, for the flow starting at time step zero, um, computed at time step t. And to obtain this numerical flow, we can pull it apart basically using the chain rule, um, meaning that we propagate back in time to compute our flow starting at uh, time step zero, um, going to time step t. And uh, this is basically visualized here that when we are at a time step t, we traverse all the, bay, all the way back to um, t equals zero uh, or t equals t zero, and from there obtain a solution. And to do this um, traveling back in time, we uh, use a symplectic Euler, where well, here we again can find the relativistic terms. And this is basically all you need to compute your, um, your flow. Um, and as you can see that the electric field is only computed once. So for each um, time step, we only need one evaluation of the electric field. And um, this allows for a really easy parallelization as well as efficient uh, computational effort to compute our um, numerical flow. And our, um, our field E is uh, computed using the phi with numerical quadrature. And um, this potential um, and our potential, uh, sorry, using raw use, uh, compute, sorry, uh, our field E is um, computed via the raw. Uh, using numerical quadrature, and from that we can also obtain our phi, and this is done via finite differences, as this is a smooth Poisson problem, and um, this phi is uh, represented in a B-spline basis, where we can also immediately incorporate our Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is something that we wanted to achieve for several use cases. Um, and this idea of traveling back in time um, means that we do not have to store um, or save our F. We only need the F zeros and the different fields. And this means that we uh, drastically decrease the memory consumption that we need. So if you think about it on a grid, we would have the dimensions in X and V direction or um, in space and velocity dimension. And uh, on our solver, we now only account for the time steps. This is a linear growth and the dimension in X direction. And if you compare the memory we needed, uh, we need for a dimension of three, as you can see, there's a large factor uh, as difference when we look at how we can um, store our yeah, unknown F or how much memory we need to store the F, yeah. Uh, the next thing I want to discuss is the conversation properties of NUFI and also compare it to a semi-Lagrangian discretized Galerkin. And when we look at the electric energy, we can see that um, the NUFI solver is better for small resolutions and for large resolutions, both of them do really well. Um, when we look at the total energy, we can see that again, both of them are doing pretty well. Um, and here for our NUFI solver, we get this uh, relative error of 10 to the power of minus four. And this can be explained using because we are using the quadrature rule, which has an error of 10 to the power of minus four. And now for the other two, we can see that for the entropy and the L2 norm, while the semi-Lagrange uh, semi um, scheme is um, not that accurate, especially for small discretizations, uh, we can conserve exactly for any discretization, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve. Now let's go over the uh, numerical experience, experiments that we did. And um, so the functions that we wanted to test out was one where we could incorporate our Dirichlet boundary conditions, and we, as we already got great results for the periodic boundary conditions. And our distribution function is uh, this ion acoustics, um, this ion acoustics function right here. And this is excited by an intense laser interacting with an overdense plasma. And this can also be 
extended to the relativistic case. Um, however, there we have not been able to quite represent the results, but still um, we are able to incorporate the reflective boundaries for F. We are able to incorporate the Dirichlet boundary conditions for phi, which is not really possible with the semi-Lagrangian um, option that we tested. And what you can see here is the ion movement, which also makes a lot of sense um, going in this flow direction, how the velocity evolves. Um, yes. So if we um, compare the errors for a periodic case, as we were not able to compare them to the Dirichlet case, um, we can see that uh, the relative error for our function f is much better for our NUFI function if we increase the um, resolution and even for E it is better in this test case. Um, you can still argue which one of the two is better. Can we compute with the semi-Lagrangian which is already um, pretty well known. And so the thing is that at one point the semi-Lagrangian will be a faster method because um, our computations in time will add up because we always have to travel back to our T0. But for the experience with experiments that we did, this is really competitive. Um, and we also tested out the computational um, needs or the computational efforts needed after 481 time steps. And as you can see, as uh, so until for one dimension, until we fill up the, um, the spare execution units in the GPU, we get almost constant computation time. Then what we did here is on the GPU, we have basically linear growth. And here we have a small increase, which we um, thought was due to caching effects. Um, for the two-dimensional case, which is of course even more interesting, we also have linear growth, which we wanted to, uh, so linear growth in the quadrature points. And um, we can even show here blue is the um, optimal strong scaling that we are really close to the strong, uh, strong scaling um, to optimal scaling with our method. So to um, conclude the Evaluation of the distribution function with the flow can be run fully in parallel. Um, we have a very low memory usage because we never have to save F, we just have to save our initial distribution function F0. Um, but of course we get higher complexity for uh, a higher number of time steps. Um, with our method, we achieved exact conversation of the um, different yeah, conversation properties and another huge deal where we want to um, continue working on is the incorporation of Dirichlet boundary conditions or basically any boundary conditions. And with that, the next steps would be to um, analyze this on um, relativistic cases and try to reproduce the results they obtained in the paper and from there, um, yeah, follow up and yeah. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, are there questions? Dian, uh, uh, I think there's one of the questions. I have to yes, um, yes. quickly yes, I can see it. Uh, read it. Okay. Um, uh, the question uh, from <clears throat> Yun Chang Chu. Uh, I apologize if I have missed the explanation on how uh, new fee works. You mentioned marching the step backwards, does it mean that one has to describe the end state of the simulation and then march backwards to the time point we are interested in? No, the, um, so first of all, thank you for the question. Um, the idea is still that we um, go forward in time, but at each, so maybe I can uh, open the slide again, where I try to visualize that. So the idea still is that we move forward in time, but if you imagine that we started an initial time point T0, um, to compute the um, time step or to compute our unknowns at the time step T1, we will then go from T1 back to T0. And this is then done with the flow. And so 
From there, we can then again compute all of the necessary fields. And with this information, then again, without having to compute the uh, distribution function f, we can then go, let's say, to time step um, t2. And t2 is then computed with the information on the fields of um, t1 and t0. Um, and this way, we move forward in time, but at each time step, we propagate backwards without the need to save our function f, if this explains the question. Thank you for, for this answer. Uh, okay, I don't see for the questions so far. Uh, a question on my side. <clears throat> the um, numerical procedure you have described reminds um, a lot uh, the so-called semi-Lagrangian approach. Uh, can you comment on, on this, maybe? Yeah, so um, when we... So for the semi-Lagrangian approach, I think we travel back in time only one step. And what we do here is that we travel back in time all the way to the beginning of our um, function. Uh, but yeah, these are two similar approaches. And this is also what our approach was based on. Um, yes. OK, thanks. Thanks. And maybe another question uh, uh, for uh, this numerical uh, Method. Which kind of applications uh, you see in the future? What what would you like to do with this? With uh, your code? Yeah. So um, I think mainly any like um, predictions on the some uh, plasma properties in the sense of this plus of Poisson equation. So um, any field where the plus of Poisson equation. Um, can be used to describe uh, describe the conditionless um, yeah properties. I think this is where we might uh, that the, this is uh, these are problems that we can tackle with the uh, with our new fee solvers. So basically, field um, models where we want to um, analyze the evolution of plasmas uh, for some collisionless um, scenario. Yeah, but you don't have any concrete plans, like uh, maybe looking in space plasmas or laser, yeah, whatever, uh, fusion. Yeah, um, I don't have any uh, like concrete plans, I must say, uh, where this uh, will be used. Yeah, but um, yeah, not me in particular, no. Thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, let's move on with next uh, talk. By yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, yeah, please uh, go, go on. Sure. Uh... So I hope you can hear, uh, see everything in full screen. It is not full screen yet. Maybe no? it can't. No, no, it's not full screen. <laughs> Sorry. Just a sec. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So now yeah. it should be on your screen. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of the workshop and have the opportunity to present uh, part of my ongoing PhD work uh, at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of uh, Dr. Milmore and Professor Nikiforakis and in collaboration with Tokamak Energy. So my PhD research is focused around whole system simulations for fusion reactors. And the overall objective of my work is to account for all the regions of the reactor, including the plasma, the scrape of layer, and the first uh, vacuum, uh, the first vessel wall within the same simulation. So we are able to do that by taking advantage of state-of-the-art sharp and or diffuse material interface methodologies, which facilitate the communication between the different materials in our uh, computational domain. We also make use of hierarchical adaptive mesh refinement both in space and time, which ensures that we have enough resolution to capture any interesting physics. And we do that by using an uh, existing framework known as AMREX, which was developed by Lawrence Berkeley, Berkeley Laboratory. So the end goal of uh, our project is to be able to use this model to investigate highly unstable events 
uh, because the solvers that we use are very good at modeling fast events and also capturing discontinuous solutions, which might be present in events such as vertical displacement events. What you can see on the right is a snapshot from a simulation that I ran on some of the preliminary work I have done on modeling VDDs. These results are not yet validated, but they do qualitatively show the correct behavior. So we have an unperturbed equilibrium, which loses vertical stability and hits the wall. And you can see all the different components that we can include in the simulation, including the plasma, uh, the different coils, which we model as perfect conductors, as well as a wall of finite thickness, which we model as a resistive wall. And we also have the scrape of layer. In this presentation, I will specifically focus on how we choose to represent the scrape of layer. So there are different approximations you can make. Uh, one, uh, one of those approximations is to use a true vacuum approximation to model that, or a low density free force plasma uh, to model that region. And although both approximations can be valid descriptions uh, under certain regimes, they do have very different implications, especially when it comes to stability analysis. So in this presentation, I will specifically talk about the numerical techniques that we use to capture the interaction at the plasma vacuum interface. And then I will go on to demonstrate that the two different approximations invoke different physics. Uh, so in this slide, you can see the formulation that underlies the simulations that will follow. So for the plasma, we simply solve the ideal image equations uh, in their conservative form using a finite volume approach. And we use exact NR approximate Riemann solvers to compute fluxes. We like solving the equations in this form because that allows us to respect the mathematical properties of the system under consideration. And although this is a very simplified system of equations, uh, given the intricate dynamics of fusion plasmas, it does allow us to validate um, our simulations. And uh, the framework that we use is actually agnostic of the system of equations being solved, which means that we can actually add more physics as we go along by introducing appropriate sources. And in fact, there's another student uh, in our lab which who is working on a more complete system of equations. And I believe he's giving a presentation tomorrow. Uh, and as I have mentioned in this presentation, I will be talking about capturing the plasma vacuum, the interaction on the plasma vacuum interface. And for that, I'm using a flux modified approach, which I will talk more about uh, later on in this presentation. So going back to the very basics for uh, for a second, it is very important to us to make sure that our underlying solvers are capable of capturing the correct physics and all the waves that are present in our solution. Uh, so when it comes to an ideal MHD problem, the solution to the Riemann problem consists of seven waves, which can either be shocks or rarefaction fans, and those waves propagate at different speeds, which correspond to the eigenvalues of the system. Any hyperbolic system, including the ideal image the equations, can therefore be solved by computing the solution to a series of local Riemann problems at each cell interface. And we can do that either by using an exact Riemann solver or an approximate Riemann solver. Exact solvers are great because they resolve every single wave exactly, uh, which means that we have all the waves that we need, uh, but they are very expensive. And they're actually impractical to use when it comes to multidimensional scenarios, so TDB or 3D. And uh, approximate solvers are much better because they are a lot faster and they actually perform very well, which I'm going to show uh, later on. So although exact solvers are very expensive, they are very useful for validation purposes. So I did have to develop uh, an exact solver uh, to make sure that uh, my numerical approach works. So basically when it comes, as I already said, the ideal image, the equations, the solution to that Riemann problem consists of seven waves. So we would expect to have a seven by seven non-dimensional system with seven unknowns. And we can map uh, each of those unknowns to each wave. So we call those unknowns path variables and they're used to describe an attribute of each wave. So for example, for the rarefactions, uh, the path variable would describe the strength of the rarefaction. For the shock, it would describe the, um, the speed at, the, at which the shock is propagating. And for the Alvin waves, would have the rotational angle of the Alvin wave. Uh, if we look uh, at the system more carefully, we can actually uh, decrease the dimensions of the system to a 5 by 5 from 7 by 7. Uh, because, for example, if we look at the Alvin wave, we know the total rotational angle from the initial conditions. And we also know that the only waves which change the orientation of the magnetic field are the two Alvin waves. So we only need to know the rotational angle of one of the two waves to be able to reduce the rotational angle of the second wave, which reduces uh, our system to a six by six system. 
And then also we realized that we can consider the left moving waves to the right moving waves separately. Then we can also reduce it by another uh, by another variable. So we end up with a five by five system that we need to solve using a multi-dimensional Newton Raphson procedure. And in case that fails, we fall back to a Broidens method. So in this slide, you can see the solution for a standard image German problem. We show results for density and the Y component of the magnetic field. And you can see the initial conditions on the table. So the exact solution is shown in black, and this was produced using the exact solver that I developed and I just described. And on top of that, we add the numerical solution that was produced using an approximate HLC Riemann solver to demonstrate that even the approximate solver is capable of capture, capturing all the different waves that are present in, in the solution. So going from left to right, we can see a faster refraction, an oven wave, a slow refraction, a contact discontinuity, a slow shock, a second oven wave, and a fast shock. And we can see how the numerical, the approximate solver is actually capable of capturing all those waves very accurately, and even the discontinuities very sharply, which is a very desirable feature of uh, the underlying, underlying solvers that we use in our simulations. When it comes to the vacuum moment problem, since I mentioned that I'm trying to capture the interaction at the plasma vacuum interface, uh, that means that we actually need to solve a plasma vacuum moment problem, and that's a special case moment problem, which is uh, very difficult to solve numerically because of the presence of a very strong rarefaction. Uh, and a lot of solvers actually uh, struggle to capture that behavior because there is a big disparity between the low densities that are present in the plasma vacuum around the vicinity of the plasma vacuum interface and the very fast speeds uh, at which the vacuum front propagates at. Uh, so an important part of my work was to actually modify the system of equations and make sure we can actually model this a behavior in the presence of magnetic fields. And again, the first step was to be able to produce the exact solution for a plasma vacuum moment problem to be able to use uh, as a validation for our numerical approach. So this is what you can see in this slide. These are the exact solutions for a plasma vacuum moment problem for different strengths of magnetic field. So we have plots for density Y component of the magnetic field and uh, the two velocities in the two different directions. Uh, the exact solution is comprised of two rarefactions, a fast and a slow one, and the different lines in each plot correspond to a different magnetic field strength. Uh, so now that we have the exact solver, and as I already said, exact solvers are not very practical to use, we have to develop uh, our numerical approach to be able to solve uh, the problem in a discrete space. So in order to do that, we implement a novel diffuse interface methodology, which was developed by Tim Wallace, who is also a member in our lab. And his method is based on flux modifiers and interface setting routines and has shown that it's very good at modeling regions of true vacuum. So the method involves the introduction of a new variable, which is known as the void volume fraction variable. And it basically tracks the amount of uh, vacuum that there is in each cell. And that quantity gets affected in space and time. I'm not going to go into the details of how the method works uh, in the interest of time. And in the next slide, I have... Uh, more information on how the algorithm works. I'm happy to come back to this if people are interested, but I will just uh, move on to results. So here is a validation test case. Uh, we have a free expansion test case. So we have some plasma expanding into vacuum. The exact solution is shown in black and it was produced using the exact sol solver that I talked about. And then we have the numerical solution that uh, we produced using the method that I just talked about uh, for different resolutions. So we have plots for density, the Y component of the magnetic field, the velocity and the pressure. And then we also show, sorry, we show zoomed in uh, plots for the density and the Y component of the magnetic field around the plasma vacuum interface. Uh, to demonstrate that for an increasing resolution, the method does converge to the exact solution. So the different colored lines correspond to different resolutions. And you can see that as we move from red to purple, we, uh, we match very closely to the black exact solution. Uh, if we look at the X velocity, we can observe a discrepancy uh, between the numerical solution and the exact. Uh, and this shows that the method uh, struggles to actually capture the correct location of the vacuum front and the correct speed of the vacuum front, uh, but based on what we've seen in the literature, a lot of the methods that are, um, which already exist, uh, suffer from this same characteristic. And it all comes down to the severity of the initial conditions and how difficult this test is to actually numerically solve. Uh, but overall, the method behaves very well and uh, it's very comparable to what other people do uh, already. 
So this slide is very important because it goes back to one of the first statements that I made in the presentation. And it's the statement about me trying to demonstrate to people that a low density approximation will have uh, will invoke different physics compared to true vacuum approximation. So this is exactly what is shown in the slide. We have uh, the exact solution for free expansion, which involves a fluid expanding into vacuum shown in black. And then on top of that, we have exact solutions and numerical solutions for various low density approximations. So going from red to green to blue, we reduce the density and the pressure by a factor of 10 every time. And uh, we show the solution for that. So we have a plot for density, then zoomed in density, we have X velocity and temperature. And if we look at the third plot, we can very clearly see that in the low density approximation cases, there is an extra shock being captured, which is not present in the free expansion. And uh, that's one thing that we need to take away from this slide. And the second thing that we need to take away from this slide is that as we go to lower density regimes, our numerical method starts to struggle when it comes to capturing the correct uh, shock location and shock speed, because you can see uh, the discrepancy between the blue solid line and the blue dotted line. Uh, and again, that comes down to the severity of the initial conditions and how steep the gradient of the initial discontinuity is. So there's two things that we need to be aware. Uh, there's different physics, if we choose a vacuum approximation or a low density approximation. And depending on how low our low density approximation is, uh, there's like limitations that our solvers might face. Uh, the same point is demonstrated in a more interesting test case. So in this case, we are uh, modeling a plasma accelerator. So here you can see the initial configuration. We have some high density fluid in the red bit of the, of the figure, and that is allowed to expand uh, inside this void region in the blue region which we either model as a true vacuum or a low density approximation. And then we have these rigid bodies to direct the flow. So here are the results for the two different cases. On the left, we have the true vacuum simulation and now we observe this smooth expansion of the plasma into the, into the background vacuum state. Whereas on the right-hand side where we have a low density background state, we have this abrupt shock propagating into that space. And of course, the two are very different. And uh, from what I've seen in the literature, these kinds of uh, tests uh, have been used to, to reproduce uh, the conditions for edge localized modes. So it is important to be aware of the differences depending on how you choose to model uh, that background state. Uh, a final test case is to demonstrate that our model is capable of dealing with uh, geometries of any shape. Uh, so here we place a high density plasma in the middle of the ST40 confinement vessel, which is the fusion reactor that uh, Tokamak Energy uses for its operations. And we allow that to expand into void. Again, we model that as a low density approximation or a true vacuum, and then we see what happens. So here are the results in the true vacuum simulation. Again, we observe this mode expansion into vacuum. Whereas in the low density approximation, we have that additional shock which gets reflected of the different features of our geometry creating these very intricate patterns. So to conclude very quickly, uh, in this uh, presentation and in this part of my work, we are considering different ways to model the scrape of layer, uh, either using a low density approximation or a true vacuum approximation. And we demonstrate that depending on what we choose, we will end up with a different wave pattern, which will in turn interact with any surrounding matter in very different ways. So it is important to make that distinction between the two uh, methods. But of course, there's a lot of a lot more things to be done. Uh, we need to take into account more physics. We need to consider a more complete set of equations. Um, we also need to take into account certain uh, properties of uh, the materials that are present in the simulation. So for example, the wall, uh, I've already talked about uh, taking into account the electromagnetic properties of the wall and modeling that as a resistive wall. You can also take into consideration some of the elastoplastic properties. And finally, we need to uh, validate uh, our, our work against uh, experimental results and other numerical results uh, if we want to be able to study um, unstable events such as ARMS and BDs. Thank you everyone for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, just, just write in the chat or raise your hand.
Uh, okay. In the meantime, uh, maybe uh, I, I can ask you a question. Um, you're considering um, plasma expansion into vacuum as a lot of uh, points. Uh, in this process, um, the mobility of uh, electrons and ions can be quite different. Well, electrons are much lighter than, than the ions. Uh, and this can be of uh, importance for for this uh, for this uh, expansion, uh, making it a pretty much kinetic process. Can you include this uh, point in your model somehow? And uh, yeah, could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. So basically, up until this point, we're only considering single fluid equations in my work. And uh, we are aware that as you move into the scrape of layer, there is other important physics that come into the picture. Uh, there's like partialized, partially ionized plasmas and kinetic effects uh, becoming more important. Um, so yeah, there is scope to actually uh, include those. Um, but yeah, it's all a work in progress, basically. At a, as a starting point, we choose to make this approximation, model that as a perfect vacuum or a low density plasma and see what that gives us. But of course, as we keep building on our model, we want to add more realistic scenarios and improve. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, still no questions, which is probably because of Time. People are tired, mm -hmm. presumably. Uh, uh, another question on my side. Uh, I can see tokamak energy uh, on the bottom of the slide. Uh, yeah. Could you give me uh, some details on 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 this? Uh, uh, yeah. On on the tokamak energy and how exactly your work will fit into the program of, of this of this uh, yeah institution. So tokamak energy. There are industrial collaborators. They are sponsoring our project. Uh, along with myself, there is uh, other PhD students in the lab and postdocs who work on this project. Uh, our proposition is that we uh, eventually deliver uh, a model that can perform whole system simulations. Because uh, we're aware that in the, in the community, uh, people have traditionally chosen to separate physics, separate the scales and use co simulation a lot of the times uh, to kind of integrate everything back together. Um, what we want to do is to be able to put everything together to make sure that we capture all the nonlinearities, which are very important. And as I said, there are several of us who work on the project. Uh, we each focus on like a very specific aspect of it. So as I said, my job was to model the scrape of layer, incorporate the wall. Someone else is working on uh, the grad Shafranov solver. Uh, on semi implicit solvers, uh, two people are going to talk tomorrow about their 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 part uh, in this project, and then the idea is that all the different components will come together to produce this code that can hopefully do magic <laughs> and uh, simulate a, a fusion from start to end. So yeah, this is the thing that we're offering to Tokamak Energy, and that's what their col collaboration is based on. Good, good. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this for this presentation. And uh, yeah, let's close the session. I would say. Sure. Let's... Thank you, everyone.